morning to all of you. I welcome you all to the international workshop and CME on the fertility preservation in childhood cancers, life beyond cancer. A CME on a very pertinent and thought provoking topic in present context has been designed and organized by the Division of Reproductive Medicine, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi under the aegis of Fertility Preservation Society of India and IVF Research Society. With all the stakeholders from pediatric oncologists, social scientists and counselors, all the thoughts converging at the same point to make life of childhood cancer survivors worth enjoying. Na asti matri samashaya, na asti matri sam gati, na asti matri sam thana, na asti matri sam prapa. Motherhood or parenthood is designated in many cultures, including ours, as an indicator of completeness and divinity. The increasing cure rate of childhood cancers had led to a vast population of survivors having to face the late adverse effects of oncological treatments and with fertility impairment being one of the most The CME will throw light on the common status of fertility preservation measures for pediatric patients undergoing gonadotropic treatment and focusing specially on the challenges that remain to be solved in order to implement this fundamental service. So we begin this academic feast with the first session. For the first session, I invite the esteemed panel of chairpersons. Professor Nita Singh, ma'am. Ma'am is the professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Sabita Gupta, ma'am. Ma'am is the head of Gynae Oncology Division, Medanta. She is the first gynecologist in India to perform robotic gynecological mm -hmm. surgery for cancerous and non-cancerous gynecological conditions. Ma'am's numerous specializations include gynae oncology, colposcopy, mm -hmm. advanced gynae laparoscopy, robotic surgery, mm -hmm. and hysteroscopy. Mm -hmm. She is the president of Aogen India, a prestigious organization, and she has numerous contribution and accolades in the field of gynae oncology. Over to you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Nilajfali, for the kind introduction. And uh, let me begin with thanking. Let me begin with thanking uh, Dr. Nita and the organizing team for having me here for this very important and prestigious CME on uh, fertility preservation in childhood and adolescent cancers. While, while dealing with the adolescent and childhood cancers, the focus and uh, the stress was more so on you know, improving the survival. Now we know that we have attained good survival rate and we can see the curve flattening. Now there's a sharp focus on uh, improving the safety of the treatment and the quality of life. When it comes to the quality of life, fertility forms a very, very important aspect. And uh, so here we are all gathered to listen to our stalwarts and know what all we can do in this field. To get the ball rolling, I'll invite Dr. Rachna Seth, and uh, she is Professor and Chief Division of Pediatric Oncology, AIMS. She chairs Indian Pediatric Oncology Group Late Effects Committee, PHO Chapter, Indian Academy of Pediatrics. Her area of interest is mainly acute leukemias, histiocytic disorders, retinoblastomas, and late effects and survivorship. Currently, she is chairing the first national multicenter survivorship registry in India. And she'll be speaking on the first, please. Can we come to the, yeah. Overview of incidents, survival and fertility risks in childhood and adolescent cancers. Over to you, Dr. Rachna. Okay, uh, good morning, everybody. At the outset, outset I thank the organizers for uh, arranging this uh, CME on a very, very important and much needed topic for particularly for us pediatric oncologists. And also I thank you for inviting me to deliver this talk. So, as you all know, the global burden of cancer shows that cancer incidence rates continue to increase worldwide, which is also true for pediatric cancers. It is also true that advances in treatment strategies for childhood cancers 
has resulted in a growing population of childhood cancer survivors. Also is the fact that almost 70% of these patients are going to emerge as childhood cancer or adolescent cancer survivors. What is important and more important for us and related to the topic that we are going to deal today is that one in 10 cancer patients is going to experience a fertility or a reproduction related concern. This is attributed to the neurotoxic effects, maybe of surgery, chemotherapy or radiation. Or al and also to compound this, there is a component of sexual dysfunction which is related to the cancer itself. And also combined with this is a large component of social and psychosocial issues and physical issues that combine the gonadotoxic effect of surgery, chemotherapy, as well as radiation. So, I think you all would know this better, that fertility preservation has established as a new field in reproductive medicine. But for us, pediatric oncologists, because child and adolescent cancers, it is still developing also in the developed world. And for us in India, we are far behind. So my overview of presentation today is going to flow as I'll be dealing with the spectrum incidence of childhood adolescent cancers, some basic so aspects of survivorship, what is the price of cure that we give to our survivors, and then of course, the some aspects of fertility risks. The global incidence of disease for our patients in the age group of 0 to 19 years is estimated to be about 400 new 400,000 new patients. 400,000 new patients, new patients are seen annually. The reported incidence in the high income countries continues to be very high as compared to that in the low and middle income countries. But what is also important is that there is an under-reporting in the low and middle income countries. Under reporting of the, the, uh, the registries. As I was telling you, that the reported incidence in the high income countries is very high as compared to the low and middle income countries. And approximately 80% of the global burden of childhood and adolescent cancer is shared by low middle income countries. And there is some still inaccuracy in the data. The reasons being that the cancer registries do not cover the entire population. They are ill-maintained and not, uh, there is not a complete representation of the burden of childhood and adolescent cancers. Many patients go undiagnosed. There are competing causes of death, where particularly pertaining to the national priority as regards diseases are concerned. There is often a malfunctioning of the healthcare systems. There is lack of resources for diagnosis and treatment. And also there is a component of misdiagnosis, which actually underestimates the reporting of childhood and adolescent cancers in low and middle income countries. <laughs> The spectrum and incidence. It's just not moving actually. Slides are not moving. It's we're not going by this one. No? I don't want to go back. No? So you want to go back. Yeah, and so what is this? Yes. Okay. It's not moving actually, you're not going ahead. Sorry for this technical glitch. So the estimated 
uh, this is just to show the representation that most most of the reported incidence of childhood cancers is seen in the high income countries and there is under reporting in the low middle income countries so if you see the distribution of childhood cancers in the two major age groups that we will be dealing so if you see the red, the red bars which indicate that the uh, age group from 0 to 15 years and predominant cancer load that occurs in the age group from 0 to 14 years is shared by acute lymphoblastic leukemia and followed by CNS tumors. Whereas if you see the gray bars, that denotes the childhood cancer incidence in the age group between 15 to 19 years. So besides leukemia and lymphomas and CNS tumors, the greater burden of cancers in the adolescent group is shared by lymphoma and also germ cell tumors. So it is important for us to know that why the spectrum of diseases in the various age groups is important because the treatment modalities are going to be different, the biology of disease is going to be different, the counseling content, particularly with reference to the reproductive counseling is going to be different, also the prognosis is going to be different. So we need to be aware of the spectrum of childhood as well as adolescent cancer that typify the particular age groups. So there is also ethnic variation in the childhood cancers. So this is a busy slide, but what I need to actually emphasize is that in the Asia Oceania group and the South America group, there are the predominance of leukemia and GCT, which are common tumors. But if you go into the African, the sub-African nations, it is predominantly the lymphoma group. We all know that Burkitt lymphoma is very, very typical of the African countries. So besides the Burkitt lymphoma, soft tissue sarcomas and the renal tumors also become predominant cancers in the African countries in the age group of zero to 14 years. Also, similar patterns have been noted in Africa in the adolescent group in the age group of 15 to 19 years where soft tissue sarcoma, renal tumors become a predominant age group. What is the Indian scenario? We, it is every country has some typical presentations of as regards uh, cancers is concerned. The burden as shared by Indian uh, childhood and can, uh, adolescent cancers is that we have approximately 1 million new cancer patients that are diagnosed annually. 3% of these are shared by pediatric cancers. And these translate to about 50,000 new pediatric cancer patients annually. In a recent survey done in India, which was published just in 2021, it was shown that five states in India, which include Uttar Pradesh, Bihar, Maharashtra, West Bengal, and Madhya Pradesh are taking the major burden of pediatric cancers, meaning thereby that as you saw in the Western countries, so also even within one country, there are regional variations in the tumor burden that is shared by various states. We comprise almost 20% of the pediatric cancer burden globally. It is dismal to see that 60% of the newly diagnosed cancers succumbed to the disease in India versus only 10% as seen in the developing countries. So just to tell you, how do we fare? How does our spectrum change from the other countries? So this is the bars that you see is a just a replication of what I just discussed, that common pediatric tumors, conventional teaching is that it is predominantly ALL followed by CNS tumors followed by lymphoma and then the other solid tumors take a toll. But if you look at our center, this is our reflection, our major cancer types are leukemias, ALL, AML, closely followed by retinoblastoma, then the lymphoma, and then the other solid tumors. Then again, there is a component of referral bias. So these are all very important factors as to what type of cancer cancers a center is going to see. Ours being a referral center, tertiary center for cancers and for retinoblastoma, we see one of the, center, one of the major burden of retinoblastoma patients. Coming to the next aspect of what are the causes of mortality in children and adolescents as far as cancers are concerned. So if you look at this group, the first bar, which is the 0 to 14 groups, it is predominantly the CNS tumors, which comprises almost one third. Although they are the commonest tumors, but then the mortality also is shared major by these tumors. CNS tumors closely followed by leukemia that comprise almost 25% of the overall mortality. Similar data is there for even the adolescent age group where leukemias take about 25%, but bone tumors become another important and also the CNS tumors. So we need to be aware where, which tumors need. So all these actually help us realize as to which tumors need focus, where, what is the trend of survivorship, what is the trend of mortality. And these data form important references. 
So this is the global estimate of mortality just recently published in the zero to 19 years. So mortality is lower in the high income countries, as you can see the light, uh, the orange bars. And of course, the major toll of mortality is shared by the middle and low income countries. Uh, recent WHO had, uh, has just published in 2021, the data, as you can see the trajectory of mortality of this is pertaining to both the zero to uh, the entire zero to 19 years group how you can see in the developed country there is a pers persistent fall and we are fa faring far better as compared to the developing countries and there is a slight increase also but then this can be interpreted as an increase uh, sort of incidence with better modes of detection of childhood and adolescent cancers Coming to the last and the most important aspects as regards the epidemiology before we move to the reproductive aspects is the survival. This is something that interests all of us. The overall survival of childhood and adolescent cancer is increasing and this is really, really satisfying. And five years survival of childhood cancers has increased over the time. And in the high income countries, it is to the tune of almost 80% with middle income countries touching 55 and low income, it's low to about 40%. But I wish to say, share this very recent WHO data, which is almost 2021, very recent, and it is just quoting a figure of 15 to 45%. But mind that this is actually the overall data. Individual centers are doing far better. Survival is also different by the type of cancer that we deal with. So it's far better for the lymphoma and leukemia group. For example, in the five-year survival for uh, leukemia lymphoma in the high income country would be to the tune of 80 and 90 percent, whereas for the low income country, it falls drastically to 36 to 55. For other difficult to treat tumors, CNS tumors, although being the second commonest cancer, both in the adolescent and the pediatric age group, the uh, mortality is far higher and the overall survival is very, very dismal with, uh, you know, comparison, comparing if you look at the high income and the low income, it is almost 71 to 27 percent. So these are the trends. Uh, so these are the, uh, this is data of the SEER that is uh, one of the major important, most authentic uh, epidemiology groups of the US, the National Cancer Institute. This is surveillance epidemiology end result uh, program, which actually shows the five year survival uh, data of two age groups separately. So if you see uh, these graphs, the red ones, the maroon ones rep uh, represent the zero to 14 and the blue ones are the adolescent age group. So by and large, they are comparable. The disease wise, there is comparison of the mortality, but with certain diseases like ALL, Ewing sarcoma and rhabdomyosarcoma, the adolescent fare less as compared to the pediatric population. This is the estimated childhood uh, five-year net survival country-wise. And you can see in the high-income countries, survival is almost approaching 80% versus 30%, uh, 50 to 30% in the low-middle-income countries. And India is at the, where it, uh, the overall survival in India is almost to the tune of 25 to 50% with in variations seen in individual centers. So with improved survival, where are we dealing with? We, there is a price of this cure that we actually need to face. So what we need to realize is that with overall advancements in diagnostics, therapeutics, and management, the overall survival is increasing. It is almost touching 80% of overall for all tumors in the developing world and individual centers, even in the developing countries are doing very well and touching these figures. But, and also we are having a growing population of survivors, but at the cost of that, what we need to realize that almost 70% of these cancers are actually around 20 years and one in 530, one per 530 young adult in the age group of 29 to 20 to 39 years is actually going to be a childhood cancer survivor. But these survivors are at a very high risk of reporting chronic health conditions. And there is a spectrum of health conditions which these survivors are likely to have. They could vary from post-traumatic stress disorders. It is a premature imaging that is uh, premature aging. The survivors are known to age faster as compared to their age matched uh, uh, no normal population. There are galaxy of psychosocial issues that accompany survivorship, then the most important aspect is the late effect, which all is pertinent to the reproductive aspects that we are to discuss throughout the day. So what are late effects? Late effects are unrecognized toxicities that are absent or subclinical at the end of therapy. 
they become manifest months or years later and they will persist beyond five years or even later from the diagnosis. So this is one aspect which every pediatric oncologist has to be aware of when you decide on treatment for a patient. And almost two thirds of our survivors will experience one late effect and one third of these is going to be life threatening or life altering. What is relevant for today's discussion is that one in 10 of these patients are going to have a fertility or a reproduction related issue concern, which is important and it is particularly going to be pertinent to the ovarian or testicular function. If you look at the spectrum of late effects, it could be impairment in growth and development. There could be a battery of organ dysfunctions, be it cardiac, endocrine, hepatic, musculoskeletal. There could be a wide range of psychosocial issues. There could be cancer related where the primary tumor could come back or there could be a second neoplasm that could come up or there could be this broad group of fertility and reproduction uh, late effects, which encompass the spectrum of fertility issues, health of offspring, disorders of sexual function. But of course, today, mostly we will be dealing with fertility issues. What is the genesis of these late effects? So one needs to, we need to understand why these late effects are occurring so that we can plan the treatment of these children far better. It could be either a result of direct therapy which the patient has received either be it surgery, chemotherapy, radiation, or any other uh, direct effect of the tumor per se, or the injury that, that has occurred in the patient, it could be uh, subclinical at the onset, and it becomes overt with any failure of the compensatory mechanism. There could be some lifestyle changes, which could occur at the adolescent or in the older uh, age group. A big component is being shared by the genetic predisposition. And of course, a lot of unexplored causes are being projected, uh, are being thought of, which still are going to unveil as time unfolds. So there's a big need of awareness and sensitization towards occurrence of late effects. Coming to the reproductive outcomes, there are two major aspects. One is the impaired hormonal responses and the other would be infertility. So the variables that seem to be most important would be the diagnosis per se, the malignancy that the child or the adolescent has, what is the patient's age at diagnosis, the cancer treatment that has been given, the type of chemotherapy, the drugs that we use, the doses that we use, the radiation dose, field, the fractions that we use. This forms one of the most important factors that are responsible for the reproductive outcomes, be it infertility or other, other uh, dysfunction. Cancer per se also is known to reduce the fertility because it has some acute as well as chronic effects on the, on the host. Fertility also is affected by some other aspects which are inherent, which are not dependent on the cancer per se, and which you as a gynecologist would uh, understand this better. These are ovulation problems, endometriosis, polycystic ovary disease. These compound the treatment that we give to a patient. And of course, there is a component of genetic predisposition. Infertility actually, second to the neurocognitive deficits, remains one of the most important life-altering treatment effects that is faced by a childhood or adolescent cancer survivor. The modalities such as surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy would actually affect the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis, and this would ultimately result in compromising the reproductive outcomes. If you combine these modalities, your gonadotoxic exposure, the effects are compounded. So whatever effect one modality of therapy is going to result into, it gets far compounded when the modalities get combined, as you will see in the presentation. Just to give you one example of surgery, so I'll be just giving you talking about surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy subsequently. So if surgery, where you just take an example of germ cell tumors, where you would do a surgery on a gonad, so surgery, if you see, it would reduce the germ cell numbers. You give chemotherapy and radiation, it compounds the, the number of germ cells secondary or compounding or associated with the surgery. There could be nerve damage, there could be vascular injury, and a component of sexual dysfunction would come into, all would compound your effects of gonadotropic toxicity to, in these children. Wilms tumor patients are known to have hydrocele, CNS tumors have secondary hypogonadism, and also many of these following surgeries would have impotence and retrograde ejaculation. Coming to the chemotherapy, if you focus on the males, the test is, the, the chemotherapy would particularly be the alkylating agent. It's a big list. I'll be sharing it shortly, but I think there are uh, sessions dedicated to that uh, later. 
but all commonly used drugs which you all are familiar with cyclophosphamide ifosfamide thiotipa platinum based procarbazine all these drugs are very commonly used drugs for our childhood and adolescent cancers they cause actually damage to the dna and induce apoptosis the two target areas in the testes would be the germ cells and the leydig cells and what is seen is that the germinal epithelium is more sensitive to the radiation and chemotherapy effect as compared to the leydig cells that is the reason that often the uh, the spermatogenesis gets affected far more earlier as compared to the sexual maturation and we really need to be aware of this aspect because uh, while planning our chemotherapy or radiation one function may get affected and the other function may be still be preserved this is a dose dependent gonadotoxicity as far as, as the chemotherapy is related and it is you know immaterial regarding the, pre -pub uh, pub uh, the pubertal status so any dose beyond 7.5 gram per meter square of cyclophosphamide or equivalent will result in prolonged or permanent azospermia any dose less than 7.5 gram will result in gonadal injury which will be reversible after a few years of therapy free that have elapsed from the time that the chemotherapy was given and this this would be in majority of the patients doses less than 4 gram per meter square or equivalent which actually result in a reversible azospermia and normospermia would be the rule for most of the patients so how we see that uh, doses are so important as to when you plan chemotherapy for your patients and this gets compounded so subsequently after 7.5 gram per meter square as the doses get escalated maybe for by 1 gram per meter square the risk of azospermia increases by almost 10 by to 25 percent so this was the regarding the testes coming to the females so chemotherapy the same agents would actually cause depletion of follicles two major forms of the deficits that would occur in the females would be acute ovarian failure and premature menopause you would know these definitions much better but of course ovarian functions get affected in the for us in acute ovarian failure and there's a premature menopause by 40 years in uh, when we say that it is a non-surgical or a, a premature menopause as regards doses what we saw was 7.5 gram for uh, in females doses are higher at least to the tune of 11 gram per meter square once you use those doses be it for a solid tumor in any patient it is it is most likely that the uh, uh, outcome for reproduction at the level of offspring is going to be affected coming to the third aspect of radiation it generally would affect somewhere in the hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis so if you focus in the cranial artery so once you use doses of about 18 to 24 grays, which were used to either treat or prevent CNS leukemia, what was seen was there was altered pubertal timing. This was the rule earlier, but currently with advancement and understanding of these concepts, most protocols currently have given up cranial RT as a prophylactic measure. Only therapeutic RT is given uh, for patients who have CNS disease, which is positive. But this was the earlier, uh, we are still facing the brunt of this because many of our survivors who are coming have received prophylactic cranial RT earlier. And some have also received 18 grays as prophylactic cranial RT. <coughs> Also, the other thing that we need to realize is that for CNS tumors, our radiation doses are much higher, exceeding even 30 grays. So here, delayed puberty is going to be the rule. And what I need to really tell you is for CNS tumors, it is multimodal. Here, radiation is one, surgery would be other, you would be using chemotherapy, temozolomide, etc. All these would compound and the deficits on reproductive function, on infertility are really, really tremendous. So coming to the radiation, what we just talked was for CNS, which was one important organ, then coming to the testis. So any radiation to the uh, pelvis, to the testicular area, or the, to the lumbar sacral spine is going to uh, uh, impose some radiation hazard to the testis. So this will cause a germinal loss, ultimately resulting in testicular volume and sperm production reduction. And this would translate into azospermia. So this is also a dose-dependent phenomena, as you saw with chemotherapy. So with doses of one to three grays, azospermia is going to be reversible. With three to six grays, it may persist for a few years, but then it's likely to reverse as we saw with cyclophosphamide doses. With doses of six to eight gray exceeding these, it is going to cause an irreversible injury to our gonads. 
the other hormone function the other function of the testes as i told you was regarding testosterone production and sexual maturation the leydig cells are far more resilient and they would tolerate higher doses before this gets compromised so for just to give you an example if you use 20 gray of radiation then it is going to compromise uh, both your uh, uh, reproductive as well as your uh, reproductive function as well uh, the uh, propensity to produce spermatozoa <clears throat> as well as your sexual maturation is going to be affected ovaries are uh, extremely uh, sensitive to radiation and the two uh, hazards or the uh, effects that we saw are almost similar to what we saw in chemotherapy it's acute ovarian failure and uh, premature menopause but mind that the doses are really really different we need to be aware that if we are using lower doses we are more likely to cause a premature menopause versus when we use very high doses it is likely to cause acute ovarian failure for these patients and combined modality is going to be it's going to exacerbate the gonadotoxicity so essentially virtually all therapeutic radiotherapy that you use for our patients which is directed to the abdomen or pelvis is going to be gonadotoxic for the patients so just to share a few studies this is a important childhood cancer survivorship cohort which is a us based cohort and it is actually following survivors for three decades or more and it is one of the most authentic uh, uh, bodies which is providing data on survivorship and these evaluated almost 3300 eligible women for reproductive outcomes so 6.3 reported ovarian failure at 5 years from diagnosis and the risk factors were almost similar what i just discussed was high dose of radiation and chemotherapy like procarbazine and cyclophosphamide commonly used for our solid tumors other component that was seen was uh, the non surgical menopause or premature menopause was seen in almost 8% of eligible women and risk factors were older age primary diagnosis of hodgkin lymphoma and when we were using a combination of chemotherapy and abdominal pelvic radiation another important study group is the st jude lifetime cohort you would have heard of the st jude's uh, cancer hospital a real uh, a pioneer in uh, putting forth a lot of research for um, acutely leukemia particularly so these have actually evaluated dose related decline in sperm concentration and also the concept of increasing dose that compounds the toxicity as regards spermatogenesis is concerned and there's also a concept of that there is no safe dose so even although we talk of these doses but one must realize that even a minuscule dose of these gonadotoxic chemotherapy that is being given to these children these children would uh, require a surveillance as regards toxicity is concerned because there are a lot of genetic factors so in essentially there is no safe dose of these alkylators another important graph which i need like to share with you was because i have been talking of combined gonadotoxic effect so this is the first graph that you see with respect to uh, the uh, uh, premature menopause where only you use a is for alkylating agents and pr uh, ap rt is for abnormal pelvic rt so in this first graph where you use only alkylators and you don't give rt the next graph is where you use rt and you don't give alkylators but when you combine the two you just see how important the combination uh, becomes and almost you achieve almost 30% of the cohort had gonadotropic uh, toxicity in the form of pre uh, premature menopause indian data is scarce as regards uh, reproductive function and infertility we are really really behind but lot of interest has been generated and in the times to come more meaningful data should emerge a small study was uh, you know conducted by uh, dr puneet uh, on only a, it's a small population of 21 uh, childhood cancer survivors with a median age of 18 years and dr uh, recha rachna yeah yeah the organizers are you know requesting that if you could hurry through. okay so i'll just quickly hurry through so uh, yeah just give me i think 5 minutes i would sure, take sure, to mind up yeah please So this was seen in about three patients, uh, and only fourteen percent had uh, reproductive dysfunction. In another study from South India, which was done conducted in Adyar, he they also found that in their cohort the late effects were evaluated, and where they found almost twenty five percent of their patients had gonadal dysfunction. And major drawbacks that were seen or comorbidities that were seen was oligospermia or azospermia in the males and uh, gonadal dysfunction, amenorrhea, etc. in the females 
we also conducted a, a study on 300 survivors, but this was more tuned to finding the overall incidence of late effects and gonadal function was assessed in 22 patients. These patients were of Hodgkin's lymphoma and ALL, and we found was FSH and LH was high in about nine patients. Five of them had testosterone levels which were low, suggestive of hypogonadism, and isospermia was actually seen in one of the two tests, the high incidence, and this child and who's actually an adult was treated with chemotherapy that caused a permanent irreversible uh, sterility. Coming to the hematopoietic aspect of reproduction, it would be, can I just complete the thing for in five minutes? Okay. So here, uh, I'll just go quickly. So in the, uh, as regards the transplantation is concerned, so our conditioning uh, treatment becomes important, whether it is TBI or it is uh, the total body radiation, it affects more the germ cell function as compared to the, uh, the testosterone production function. It is true for both, whether it is TBI or it is the uh, chemotherapy where you use cyclophosphamide or other alkylators. Pregnancy outcomes again become a concern particularly with respect to that uh, you, uh, it's the radiation that affects uh, the outcome far more and uh, it causes uh, the impairment in uterine growth development and blood flow. And we see uh, manifestations like hypertension, fetal malposition, fetal loss, abortions, preterm labor and low birth weight, which are uh, seen in our, uh, uh, you know, preg as pregnancy outcomes. And this is more attributed to the abdominal pelvic radiation that we see. And it is also seen particularly in our Wilms tumor survivors. So I'll just skip this in the interest of time, because uh, even in the, uh, as regards the hematopoietic stem cell uh, transplantation survivors also, the pregnancy outcomes were quite dismal and they had a high proportion of spontaneous abortion, preterm delivery, particularly low births and very low birth weight babies. Chemotherapy doesn't affect much the outcome of the uh, offsprings. Um, and that is, uh, and uh, yeah, so I think I'll just... Uh, finish with this. There is one component of genetic predisposition syndrome, which is important. And I think this would be discussed in the subsequent uh, lectures. So the tumors, I just uh, mentioned the tumors, which are important as regards the fertility risks are concerned. These are acute leukemia, relapses, lymphoma, bone tumors, soft tissue sarcomas, renal tumors, CNS tumor, and transplant patients. So there's a big list of tumors that actually result in gonadal and, uh, dysfunction and uh, the associated risk of fertility. A list of chemotherapy that has already been discussed is responsible. These are all our patients who have been treated and actually have one or the hazard and they have one or the deficits of reproductive dysfunction. And I think I'll skip this, but I've already discussed this, uh, these uh, issues with both sexes, with females, where you find uh, impairment of puberty, uh, various ovarian and uh, failures, premature menopause, uh, deficits of uterine insufficiency, uh, uh, vaginal fibrosis, sexual dysfunctions, uh, issues with our uh, uh, newborns, and also esospermia, etc., and sexual dysfunction in the males. And the surveillance needs to be very strict with our survivors so as to improve their quality of life. So to just summarize, our survival of childhood and adolescent cancer is increasing, resulting in a growing population of childhood and adolescent cancer survivors. Late effects are a concern and treatment protocols need to be selected with great care. Also, the adverse effects of cancer treatment on reproductive outcomes should be anticipated to address the and reduce the late effects. There's a tremendous need for sensitization and awareness and wherever possible, fertility preservation techniques should be resorted to after detail counseling. And these need fertility uh, preservation techniques actually need to be accessible and affordable. And there's a need for long-term surveillance and follow up at the after treatment clinics. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rachna Seth, for the wonderful lecture. And you have primed everyone for the, you know, for the importance of this uh, today's CME. I think uh, we have our chief guest here in a short while. He'll be here. So we'll take the questions later on, if at all. Or maybe you can put them in the chat box. Thank you, esteemed chairpersons and the speaker for this enlightening session. Uh, we'll shortly move on to the inauguration ceremony.
We now begin the inauguration ceremony. For this, I invite the esteemed panel of guests to the dais. First and foremost, I invite Honorable Professor V.K. Paul, sir, member of Niti Aayog and our chief guest today. Welcome, sir. Professor Randeep Guleria, sir, Director Ames New Delhi and our guest of honor today. Welcome, sir. Uh, Professor K.K. Roy, sir. Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi. Dr. Nalini Mahajan, ma'am. President, Fertility Society of India. Dr. Kavita Rajasekhar, Senior Scientist at Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Professor Nita Singh, ma'am, Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi, and the organizing chairperson of the CME. Thank you, esteemed dignitaries. I now request Dr. Garima to extend floral welcome to Professor V.K. Paul, sir. Dr. Ankita to present to Professor Randeep Guleria, sir. Dr. Priyanka to present to Professor K.K. Roy, sir. Dr. Nimisha to present to Dr. Nalini Mahajan, ma'am. Dr. Dipali to present to Dr. Kavita Rajeshekhar, ma'am. Uh, and Dr. Shivangi to present to Professor Nita Singh, ma'am. Dr. Dipali, you can present to Professor Nita Singh, ma'am. This program is the brainchild of Professor Nita Singh, the organizing chair today. She is the professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Ames, New Delhi. Madam is the pioneer in reproductive medicine at government health sector. She is the ICMR DHR fellow at UG UCL London. She did fellowship in IVF from Lübeck, Germany and New York University. She is the recipient of the Foxy Young Scientist Award 2001, WHO Fellowship in Reproductive Health 2005, and Commonwealth Fellowship 2015. It was due to her untiring efforts that the IVF facility was started 15 years ago at Ames, and she is instrumental in starting similar facilities at other Ames in India. She is a prolific researcher and has published more than 160 papers in various index journals, presented more than 100 papers in various conferences and many international and national organizations. She is an editorial board member of many prestigious journals. She's also the ICMR Task Force member for regulation of ART and surrogacy in India. I request ma'am to render introduction to this program. Thank you, Nilanjali, for uh, this generous introduction. Respected Professor Paul, sir, Professor Guleria, sir, Professor K.K. Roy, sir, Dr. Nalini Mahajan, and all the faculty, chairpersons, delegates, students, friends, and other offline uh, invited guests. Cancer is a challenging disease, but the beauty of life starts, can, uh, the beauty of life after cancer is worth living for. It's possible not just to survive, but to thrive and to live a wonderful life again. And difficult roads can lead to beautiful destination. These are some of the quotes by young cancer survivors. It's indeed an honor for me to welcome you all for this enlightening international CME on life beyond cancer, which is very important subject in the present context. We have invited very learned and eminent faculty from across the globe to deliberate on this very difficult subject. I'm extremely thankful to Honorable Professor Paul and Professor Guleria for having taken out time for their busy schedule to be with us 
to inaugurate the CME on a very short notice. I would also like to thank uh, uh, Dr. K.K. Roy, sir, who has uh, um, taken in shoes of Professor Batla, who could not be here because uh, she's recuperating from COVID. I really wish to thank all the guests, all faculty and chairpersons who accepted our invitation and have joined online and offline today on a short notice because we hadn't thought that we will be able to hold this uh, CME because of the COVID. The incidence of childhood cancers have steadily increased and with approximately thousands of children being diagnosed each year. However, with the advent of more effective multimodal therapies, childhood cancer survival rates have continued to improve over past 40 years, with more than 80% of the patients now surviving into adulthood, which is really, really encouraging. And therefore, we are here to discuss fertility preservation has become a very important quality of life issue for many survivors of childhood cancer. And therefore, male and female fertility preservation options, both in prepubertal and adolescent patients, and the unique ethical issues surrounding fertility preservation in this vulnerable population is utmost important topic to be discussed. We have been providing fertility preservation services to the adult cancer patients at IVF facility of AIMS since more than 10 years. And many of them have returned cancer free and have undergone IVF with their frozen gametes and embryos and have enjoyed the joy of parenthood. But fertility preservation in adolescents and children is still a challenge for us, which we soon wish to overcome. And we are confident that we will be able to expand our services and aim to help these children and their parents for fertility preservation in our premier institution soon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for the kind introduction. Uh, I now request Dr. Garima to present a token of appreciation to Professor V.K. Paul, sir. Uh, Dr. Garima, please present a token of appreciation to Honorable Professor V.K. Paul, sir. Dr. Ankita, to present a token of appreciation to Professor Randeep Galeria, sir. Dr. Priyanka, to present the token of appreciation to Professor K.K. Roy, sir. Dr. Nimisha, to present token of appreciation to Dr. Nelly Mahajan, ma'am. And Dr. Shivangi to present the token of appreciation to Professor Nita Singh, ma'am. Dr. Nimisha to present token of appreciation to Sabhita Gupta, ma'am. Saraswati Namastubhyam Varde Kamarupini Vidyarambham Kariyami Siddhi Bhavatu Mesada. No program can be successful without the blessings of Ma Saraswati. Hence, we seek blessings from Ma Saraswati with her Saraswati Vandana.
I invite our esteemed guest for lamp lightning. I now invite Padam Shri Professor Randeep Kuleria, sir, the guest of honor, to provide words of encouragement to the gathering. Sir is Director Ames, New Delhi, Professor and Head, Department of Pulmonary Medicine and Sleep Disorders, Ames. He's the recipient of Padam Shri, the fourth highest civilian award in 2015, Dr. B.C. Roy Award for Eminent Medical Person 2017, and awarded the Doctor of Decade by IMA. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Good morning, Professor V.K. Paul, member Niti Aayog, Dr. Nalini Mahajan, a founder president of Fertility Preservation Society of India, Professor K.K. Roy, the acting head of the department, Professor Neeta Singh, my faculty colleagues, residents, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted and very happy that the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology under the aegis of the Fertility Preservation Society of India and the IVF Research Society is holding this workshop and CME on challenges of fertility preservation in children and adolescent cancer as a part of an overall, uh, let's say, workshop or training in in, for life beyond cancer. I think this is a topic which is not discussed as much as it should be but is becoming more and more important now with changes that have happened and advances that have happened. There have been major advances in the area of oncology. We've seen that, we've lived through that from survival in uh, childhood cancers in the 70s and 80s being around 40 to 45 percent to, as was mentioned, survival now going beyond 80 percent is a remarkable achievement. And this has happened because of newer drugs, chemotherapy being available, aggressive surgery being done, we have hemopoietic stem cell treatment available, radiotherapy available, with, including proton therapy, and now newer advances in the form of immunotherapy, which has opened up a new era as far as treatment is concerned. And then, of course, we have targeted therapy for certain cancers based on the mutation analysis that we do. So cancer, in many ways, has changed. And as was once mentioned, this is for lung cancer also, that from a disease with a poor prognosis and having really no survival, it's become more and more like a chronic illness where you are actually able to provide longevity and survival to patients for a very long time. And that's true for many childhood cancers also. But when you start talking of all of this, then life beyond the cancer part becomes very, very important because we're not talking of survival. And although for all of us as treating physicians and even for the parents, it's the initial part of getting over the cancer, getting cured of the cancer, that becomes the priority and the most important thing. But we forget the so-called late effects of the, of the treatment that we're offering 
and it becomes very important to be able to address how do we decrease the downstream sequelae that may happen. And I think one of them is loss of fertility. And that is what needs to be addressed because it's very, very important. And I'm glad that we're having this workshop on fertility preservation because as was mentioned, this can really give these young children as they go into adulthood and family life, good parenthood. A lot of new techniques are there. Dr. Nita Singh had mentioned that in, in, the, in, the, in the form of oocyte cryopreservation, ovarian tissue cryopreservation, sperm cryopreservation, and even testicular tissue cryopreservation. So there is a lot that is available. But I think the challenges here is awareness. Are physicians, especially oncologists, and parents actually aware of this? And are they uh, properly counseled? So counseling, looking at emotional maturity, desire, fitness, all become very, very important. And as was also mentioned, the ethical issues at times. Uh, this is something that we need to address, and I'm sure this would be touched upon uh, in this uh, workshop, patient selection for that matter. Is the patient actually uh, fit for, uh, for, the, for, uh, for the fertility preservation uh, services that is being offered to him? Uh, what about the survival that the patient is likely to have? And also, of course, uh, does is the treatment that the patient getting warrant this uh, a procedure or not because now with newer treatment strategies there are means that you could actually still be able to have fertility uh, preservation without having uh, with the chemotherapy or even the targeted therapy that is available and therefore i feel that it is time now for oncologists and fertility specialists to team up to form a group and maybe have as far as childhood cancers are, com are concerned a combined clinic you probably would also need to have a counselor on board and if a combined clinic where you have oncologist, fertility preservation specialist, a counselor, all available to counsel the parents, address these issues, discuss them, and be able to select patients who are ideal for this. There are various criteria. I'm aware that there's an Edinburgh selection criteria, which is available as far as this is concerned. So there are criteria which are available, but we need to look at it. How do, how do they sort of uh, fit into our own milieu? How do they look in, as far as our own patients are concerned? And as was mentioned, we need to really have more awareness, develop more fertility preservation services, but they have to be in association with the oncologist and the treating physician. So a clinic or a teamwork is something that is required. I'm sure all of this would be discussed in this uh, workshop, uh, international workshop in CME. And I'd like to take this opportunity to once again congratulate the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology for taking this step forward, especially Dr. Nita Singh, because this is something which gets neglected. And like I said, as we move forward towards life after cancer, this is something that we should not forget and address before we start the treatment so that after cancer, there is a good quality of life. I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for your words of motivation. I now invite Dr. Nalini Mahajan, ma'am, to address the August gathering. Ma'am is the clinical director, NOVA IVI Fertility. She is the president, Fertility Society, Pres Preservation Society of India. She is secretary of Asian Society of Fertility Preservation, member of AOGD Oncology Committee, patron of PCOS Society of India, convener of Education Committee. Indian Fertility Society and Guide for Fellows in Reproductive Medicine via IFS Fellowships and NOAA IVI Fellowships. Welcome, ma'am. Good morning, friends and colleagues, the Chief Guest, Professor Paul, Professor Guleria, Professor Roy, and uh, my uh, very, very uh, young youngsters who are upcoming in this field. Today is a very, very proud day for me indeed. When I, in 2014, founded this society, we knocked on the doors of oncologists, but we were shunned away. People did not want to listen. And as Dr. Guleria just said, that the 
thoughts were, you know, let these patients survive. What are you talking about fertility and fertility preservation? However, we persisted. And today we have reached a stage when the oncologists are actually in tune with us, in line with us, and they are referring patients for fertility preservation because they have realized that there is life beyond cancer, that patients survive, and then they're looking for a family. And today, I think I'm even more proud because Nita has taken us one step forward into the area of adolescence and childhood uh, fertility and fertility preservation, because this was an area which was, which in fact is totally neglected in our country. And I don't uh, really, uh, you know, I'm not surprised at that because as was just said by Professor Rachna said that our survival rates in childhood and adolescent cancer are much lower than in the West. And therefore the priority of course is always oncology treatment. However, slowly and steadily we will get there with better centers. We will be able to, you know, provide these services to this group of patients. It is an extreme physical, emotional, and even a technical challenge to provide fertility preservation. But I think India is such an emerging medical force now in, you know, all across, I think we are recognized as providing great medical services. And we want that in fertility preservation too, we should really be on par with the rest of the world. And with these few words, I once again congratulate Nita and thank you, Professor Paul and Dr. Indeep for being here and giving, being so encouraging towards us. Thank you very much and welcome to this seminar. Thank you, ma'am. I request Honorable Professor V.K. Paul, sir, the chief guest to enlighten us with his words of wisdom. Sir, served as the faculty at the Department of Pediatrics Games. Sir needs no introduction. It's my home. It's my home. Thank you. Namaste. Good morning. <clears throat> Respected Professor Guleria, Director Ames, <clears throat> Respected Dr. Nalini Mahajanji, Dr. Roy, Dr. Nita Singh, my colleagues, Rachana, all these distinguished colleagues from the faculty of AIMS, residents, attendees, faculty from India, faculty from abroad for this important CME. I'm grateful to you, the organizers, for giving me an opportunity to be amongst you and to celebrate and compliment and to assist in a noble work, a cutting edge new area of work for India. Very humane, focused, unmet need is what you are pursuing. And that really is remarkable. And I, I congratulate, I thank you, I compliment you. I would like to definitely say that your pioneering work, Dr. Nalini, that uh, you took upon yourselves by creating Fertility Preservation Society of India is remarkable. And other champions who joined you, academics and non-academics, uh, really very timely, you've taken this initiative. I'm also extremely proud of the work that the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology of our institute has been doing for a long time in the space of reproductive health. There was a focus of a different kind where our institution was at the forefront in 70s, 80s and beyond. And we steered very important developments in the space of contraception, working very closely with global organizations, in particular the World Health Organization. So the legacy of that time is continuing. And of course, in our fold, we have that agenda of uh, that aspect of reproduction and reproductive health, but also picking up on a you know, very pioneering way, the, the other limb of the reproductive health and well-being, namely fertility, ensuring fertility, also has been done 
in a pioneering manner in our department, in our institute, and that I, I would like to bask in that glory along with all of us and all our leadership of our directors, our Dr. Kuleria, the current director, and so on. So very, very proud of the achievements of our Department of Obstetrics in multiple spaces, including, and in particular, I would say, in the space of reproductive health and now in the space of fertility promotion, shall we say. As Dr. Guleria has very eloquently emphasized, the multi-dimensional considerations which are now taking us to life beyond survival. And they're focusing on preserving that aspect of life for children and adolescents is remarkable. It's truly remarkable. It's pushing the frontier where the frontier does belong. The cancer outcomes for children have improved. They are quite there now. Uh, the pediatric cancer community has really worked very hard in the last two decades to change the understanding, the change the outcomes, change the perception as well of picking up, diagnosing, treating cancers and giving a great life to children. And therefore, to push the frontier to children and adolescents for fertility prote protection, protect fertility preservation and protection is the right agenda to pursue. And in a very timely manner, uh, we're taking lead, both the society and the institute. And we compliment you this morning for this. And we look forward to this movement to pick up. It's truly a teamwork. It cannot happen in isolation. Uh, and I'm sure uh, in the larger affairs of the society, you will for a cause like this, once you make this cause obvious and show hope, there will be champions, there will be advocates, there will be partners. And that, because it is fundamentally so humane, humane a cause. In fact, I would believe that this should be, and why not, an integral part of our overall management of patients of all ages, wherever it is applicable, and even more so for children and adolescents, for two reasons good outcomes and a long life ahead. Choices are still to be exercised by these, uh, these citizens of our nation. And therefore pushing the frontier is what excites me hell of a lot today, this morning, that we, we, are, we are not accepting the status quo. We are, we are taking it forward. It is the right of every patient, every child, every adolescent and their families to expect reproductive, normal reproductive outcomes. I also noted the effort that you are making in the society as well as at the institutional level to advance the learnings to other centers. We compliment you on that. I would request you to obviously keep in mind the private sector uh, as well, uh, which provides an early, early uptake in a way. And why not? Uh, we should make sure that services are available on that side even as we are pushing the frontiers in the space of public sector. In particular, the teaching, the teaching institution, the centers of excellence, the medical colleges, and then going beyond that. I think we should have the whole vision set out that no child, no adolescent receiving cancer therapy and surviving should have to miss this integral part of human endeavor, human life, and human expectation and hope. Dr. Guleira referred to ethical aspects. I would be interested to know if there are issues around ethics for which guidelines may be needed at the policy level. I understand that the law takes care of most aspects. It gives you comfort, gives families the comfort, gives standardized you know, SOPs to follow. And there is a, uh, there is a, a fear of punishment if these are not followed. But if there is any, any space that has been left out in this mission, please do let us know. We'll be happy to promote that. Uh, at the same time, I would also request you to kindly uh, create increasing awareness across the sections of society. It's very important. I think we should raise that hope because that generates demand that pushes us to look at uh, um, 
look at this option to be made available to, to everybody. Someday we would like to see it being linked to Pradhan Mantri Janaroga Yojana Aishman Bharat. Why not? It's part of the package, part of the endeavor, part of life beyond survival. Why not? Uh, and how we do that would be something for us to explore. I'll be happy to work with you on that particular aspect. If there are other policy related issues, you may kindly bring it to the fore. In order to increase awareness, this aspect should be touched upon in our education as well. Because it should not be the last thing to think of. It should, it should be known to the professionals of today who are going to treat adolescents and children and adults tomorrow. So that it is always something not to be forgotten, not to be taken for granted. And then you have a, a bigger family of, uh, of professionals uh, watching for it, uh, promoting it and being part of the delivery teams, part of the team of providers. Uh, we are uh, expanding the base for cancer care enormously in the country in the last few years. Um, as you know, that uh, uh, with the involvement of Tata Cancer and the AMS network, huge expansion of cancer care and more will follow. And therefore it is time that we show it as an integral part, but also think about how this can be can be taken as an outreach system where the full-blown technology may not be there. So if you come to the nitty gritty, then it's not only about the intent, but it's also about the technology, the expertise and expertise you are building. But I'm also wondering whether you need help in terms of uh, investments in the infrastructure in a certain tiered way in the public sector space. So do let us know if there are any ideas on this, but above all, it'd be a pleasure to be back home to be in the company of uh, distinguished colleagues, pioneers, and the community that looks after children, community that looks after cancer, community that looks after women and fertility. I'm very pleased to be here and congratulations for this endeavor. Thank you. Jay. Okay. Thank you, honorable sir, for the words of wisdom and motivation. I now request Professor KK Roy, sir, to render a vote of thanks. Sir is Professor and Unit Head and Chief Manuel Invasive Gynecological Surgery, Department of Ops and Gyne, Ames, New Delhi. Sir is a prolific researcher and has many awards to his credit, including the Lifetime Achievement Award by NARCHI 2016. Welcome, sir. Let's take it, uh, Professor B.K. Paul. It happens to be that he was my guide and I know his leadership and uh, and uh, uh, Professor uh, Guladia, uh, our Honorable Director, Dr. Nita Singh, Professor, and she has been the, you know, the source of all this new technology. And in fact, uh, the initiation of IVF, I remember in the Institute, she worked very hard. Professor Nalini Mahajan, other dignitaries, students, ladies and gentlemen, very good morning. Uh, it is, uh, you know, I learned that uh, the spectrum of this childhood cancers and adolescent cancers are huge. And the good news is that uh, the prognosis after treatment is, is also almost 80%, though WHO says about 40%, but individual countries has different data. But this fertility preservations uh, is a huge concern and uh, throws many challenges. And uh, you know, this conference uh, is going to throw us more light on uh, the uh, preservations. I'm here to thank particularly uh, our chief guest and uh, Professor V.K. Paul, member of Niti Aayog, and you have seen his leadership uh, uh, during this COVID era. And we look forward that, uh, you know, all health and policy decisions will be endorsed by him. And I must tell you that uh, he will do the job once we approach him. I must thank Professor uh, Randeep Guladia. Or
all these years I have seen that uh, with the support and leadership that a multidisciplinary approach, now we are in an umbrella that uh, every department has a stalwart for coordinations and you know a multidisciplinary approach and treating these adolescent cancers and giving them life beyond life. So I must thank you, sir. I, I thank you immensely for your support and uh, uh, we look forward for all the supports possible. I thank Professor uh, Nalini Mahajan. We know her for decades. When I was junior assistant since that time, I know her. And we are happy that, you know, you initiated this. And then it is now translated all over the country, not only in the Institute, but all over the country. And we hope that, you know, we'll be doing much better job now because Institute is a platform where we can be a leader for others. I must thank each and everybody because, you know, this is a CME program and which is a very new thing, upcoming thing. And Professor Nita Singh, actually, you know, I know that she used to ring me up that uh, this is, I want to have a great success because this is a very new upcoming. And she, I thank her because he, she and her team really worked very hard day in and day out and then made this CME a success. I will thank everybody, particularly the people who worked behind the screen to make this uh, CME successful. I'm very sure it is going to be a very good academic feast. I uh, thank all the dignitaries and uh, the other students, particularly over here, that they will learn. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for rendering the vote of thanks. With this, I conclude the inauguration ceremony and cordially invite everyone for tea. Thank you. Welcome back after tea break. We move on to the next very important session, the second session of the day, for which I invite an esteemed panel of chairpersons, Dr. Rishikesh Pai, sir. Sir is one of India's leading gynecologist and pioneer in ART. Dr. Pai has trained, been trained in IVF by doing clinical fellowship in reproductive biology and embryology at the Royal Women's College, Melbourne, Australia. He did his master's in science at the Eastern Virginia Medical College, Norfolk, USA. He is the medical director of Bloom IVF Group. He has won many, many awards, including the Best Doctor Award by National Indian Medical Association, Lifetime Achievement Award bestowed by the Indian Society for Study in Reproduction, and Lifetime Achievement Award by the Indian Society for Assisted Reproduction. Sir had received the prestigious fellowship in Dunham FRCOG, which was bestowed by the Royal College. I now introduce our second chairperson, Professor Tulika Seit, ma'am. Ma'am is the founding trustee and professor of hematology at the Ames New Delhi. She is a clinical hemato-oncologist by training, having a distinguished academic career with over 160 research papers in various national and international journal of repute, over 80 index abstracts and 60 ch chapters in books. And she was elected fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences in 2012. She harbors a keen interest in preventive medicine and public health. Welcome, ma'am. I now introduce Dr. Sareen Kuman, ma'am. Ma'am has over 32 years of experience in infertility, IVF, and reproductive medicine. Presently, she's director and senior consultant, IVF, Max Panchil. She was senior consultant in Subdarjung Hospital earlier. She's treasurer of Indian Fertility Society, editor of Indian Fertility Society Journal, chairperson, Infertility Committee AOGD 2018-20 and Chairperson Reproductive Endocrinology Committee 2021-23. Our next chairperson is Dr. Jyoti Meena, ma'am. Ma'am is additional professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi, with special interest in gynae oncology. Over to you. Okay, 
So uh, I'm very happy to introduce the speaker for uh, this session. And, and the speaker is Dr. Rashmi Dalvi. She needs no introduction. She's a senior consultant of hematology oncology at the SRCC Children's Hospital in Mumbai. And she's an alumni of St. GS Medical College, KEM and Wadia Hospital uh, in Mumbai. And she's been trained in pediatric hemong in India and in the US and has been an awardee of the Hargobind uh, Foundation of the UICC ICRE. TT fellowships. She's been involved in academics, clinical practice, and research, and has um, more than 30 years experience in this field. She's um, uh, been holding many um, offices uh, uh, in the societies of the pediatric hematology chapter of IAP. And um, cu currently, she is the steering committee member of SIOP WHO GICC liaison. She's an honorary consultant for pediatric BMT and Hemonk at the Lokman Pillar Municipal General Hospital and Medical College in Mumbai. And um, we invite her for this very important talk in uh, fertility preservation in children. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Tulika. Just uh, muted. Oh, no, I'm not muted. I'm, I'm on. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, I'm uh, uh, hear you? sharing my screen now. You stop sharing so that you can share the screen. Right. Um, am I okay now to go? Uh, you can hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Right. So uh, thank you, Dr. Tulika, for uh, your introduction. Uh, Ma'am, you are not audible. Um, no, but she is audible over here on the Zoom platform. Yes, she is audible. Audible. Uh, my, my mute is off. So yeah, yeah, you are audible to us at least. Yeah, you are audible. Okay, should I go on? Yes, Dr. Rashmi, you can yeah. go on. Right. Um, also, uh, thank you uh, to Dr. Neeta Singh um, and uh, the Fertility Preservation Society of India for inviting me to this very interesting uh, symposium today. Um, right. So, uh, in, in my field of pediatric hematology, oncology, we have fertility concerns in uh, oncology in the realm of uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplantation. And also in situations of where we need uh, immunosuppressant therapy, because uh, a lot of these cytotoxic agents uh, are used as immunosuppressant or immunomodulatory uh, therapy. Um, so um, uh, it is estimated that about 70,000 new cases of childhood cancer uh, are, uh, will occur in India annually. And uh, this represents about four to 5% of the total cancer burden in India. And adolescent and young adult cancers uh, also represent 5.7% uh, of uh, cancers in India. And this is the population that we are talking about uh, our uh, fertility uh, concerns today. Uh, this is an old graph, but uh, I like to uh, show it because uh, uh, as you can see that compared to adult cancers, childhood cancers uh, globally uh, are uh, do very well. And um, even if uh, we have a little lower uh, uh, rates of outcome, it is not because the cancers are bad, but uh, it is because of uh, socioeconomic and other logistic reasons. But uh, with this kind of uh, improvement, this is 2009, and uh, the, 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 the graph is even, uh, will be even better today. But uh, you can see that uh, uh, the number of survivors are only increasing and it's estimated that one in 700 uh, uh, individuals uh, will be uh, a childhood cancer survivor um, uh, soon. So this is the spectrum of uh, cancers that we see. Dr. Rachna has already highlighted them and most of them uh, we need, uh, we use multimodal uh, therapy, which includes among other things, chemotherapy, surgery and uh, radiation. So uh, these children and adolescents uh, that we treat, they um, are uh, vulnerable to impaired fertility uh, due to uh, toxic, cytotoxic agents. And this depends on various factors, including the age at uh, treatment, uh, whether pre-pubertal or post-pubertal, the gender, the 
treatment uh, modality or modalities used, then the genetics of gonadotoxicity and gonadal reserves, um, the interruption uh, of hypothalamus pituitary gonadal axis, and other associated uh, late effects like hypothyroidism and uh, metabolic syndromes. So uh, the treatment modalities affecting fertility, uh, I, I'm putting this here because, uh, you know, as I said, that we use multimodal uh, therapy and uh, even the cytotoxic effects uh, of uh, chemotherapy agents are uh, in a milieu of many other uh, treatments that are happening. So cytotoxic chemotherapy agents, radiation, uh, especially gonadal, abdomen, pelvic, cranial and craniospinal, Surgery involving gonads uh, or surgery involving the pelvis uh, or even the spine because it can affect the um, autonomic nerves or the vascular supply uh, to the pelvic region. Uh, and CNS therapy uh, or CNS disease affecting hypothalamus and uh, pituitary area. Apart from this, uh, uh, cytotoxic agents are also used as, as I said, myeloablative therapy, used as high-dose high chemotherapy in uh, you know, um, relapsed or refractory disease. And then we have immunotherapy and novel ther therapies coming, uh, coming up, which also perhaps will have some uh, effect on these. So which are the patients that we see at risk? Leukemias, lymphomas, um, Hodgkin's disease, uh, Hodg Hodgkin's lymphoma is the quintessential uh, example of uh, fertility problems due to uh, ch childhood cancer chemotherapy. Solid tumors, especially gonadal tumors, CNS tumors uh, in the pituitary region or those requiring CNS radiation and pelvic region tumors um, such as rhabdomyosarcoma, lymphomas and bone tumors. So when we use cytotoxic chemotherapy, the basic principle is eradication of all cancer cells and doing so before development of clinically evident metastatic uh, disease. And uh, as I've said multiple times, these are multi-drug multi regimes and the drugs are used in a maximum tolerated dose to um, achieve efficacious uh, kill in spite of whatever toxicity uh, they may cause. So, uh, but this therapeutic dose also has uh, an effect on the actively dividing host cells, you know. Uh, actively dividing cells are uh, bone marrow uh, cells as well as uh, mucosal epithelial cells. And these result in acute toxicities which we uh, deal with, but some of them also have unique organ and tissue uh, specific toxicities which very often are cumulative, that is after multiple doses of the agent, and uh, they are uh, often uh, delayed in onset. So uh, these cytotoxic uh, agents, they um, they act uh, at different time uh, parts of the cell cycle. Uh, some agents like the alkylating agents, they are non-cell cycle specific and these are the ones which are most harmful to us as far as fertility goes. They cause uh, damage to the DNA template. They, there's the intrastrand and interstrand uh, cross linkage and results in uh, impaired DNA synthesis and uh, apoptosis of the cancer cells. And along with that here in uh, our area of concern, there's apoptosis of oocytes surrounding granulosa cells and early exhaustion of uh, follicles. Likewise, apoptosis of spermatogonia and impaired spermatogenesis. And then there is a late effect of gonadal, overall go, gonadal atrophy. In addition, these agents are also teratogenic and carcinogenic. So uh, the most gonadotoxic uh, uh, agents of these are the alkylate, uh, alkylating agents. And uh, the ones which give us very high risk are uh, the first three that uh, you can see here. The nitrogen mustard, cyclophosphamide, iphosphamide, melphalan. Uh, these are used in many uh, various uh, malignancies. Melphalan is used in stem cell transplantation. Uh, nitrosurias, which are used in CNS uh, tumors. Uh, then busulfan again, which is used in CML, uh, chronic myeloid leukemia, stem cell and transplantation. Then there are alkylating like agents like heavy metals, uh, platinum analogs, which we use quite a lot in uh, many of our solid tumors, dacarbazine, uh, timozolamide in brain tumors, and uh, procarbazine, which previously was the number one culprit, one of the number one culprits in Hodgkin's, and we don't use it as much uh, anymore. Um, right. So, um, 
we how do we assess the gonad gonadotoxicity risk in a given uh, patient and uh, there are various ways so uh, one uh, was the alkylating agent dose score which was uh, uh, brought in and uh, this actually takes the cumulative dose and uh, plots it on uh, uh, you know a dose curve for a given cohort of patients and based on the score that you get on the tertile uh, a score of 3 and 4 is uh, gives uh, is high risk for uh, hypogonadism and, uh, and uh, fertility problems. Uh, however, this can be used only for a small population. So another one was devised by Dan Green and his team. Um, and this was the cyclophosphamide equivalent dose, wherein they, they take into consideration, uh, it's calculated by a formula. I haven't put it here. It's a complex formula, but easy to use. So this is the uh, cyclophosphamide equivalent dose. And the risk criteria, the type of drugs that are used, the cumulative dose of these drugs, which uh, it goes into the formula, and uh, associated radiation, as you can see. Ideally, this risk should be calculated uh, pre-therapy so that you can uh, plan and uh, you know your uh, you know fertility preservation or sparing or you know from future point of view. Um, so high risk are uh, those who use high risk agents uh, in a high risk dose. Those who get postpubertal, um, you know, Hodgkin's disease uh, radiation and stem cell transplantation. Moderate risk are those with uh, in the use of platinum analogs, atrimycin, uh, patients who have a low uh, AAD score or uh, postpubertal uh, radiation, but in a lower dose. And then you have low risk, which are the anti-metabolite uh, drugs and low dose radiation, which are which is not in the pelvis or the abdomen. Now, gonadotoxicity in the male. Um, the, so the, uh, the, both the Sertoli cells and the Leydig cell uh, are susceptible to chemotherapy-induced uh, damage. Um, the Leydig cells, uh, they have a low mitotic index and are therefore less sensitive to radiation uh, damage. And uh, there is a dose-dependent decrease in spermatogenesis regardless of uh, pubertal status at uh, exposure. Um, but uh, a lower dose uh, of uh, these alkylating agents, uh, you may have uh, gonadotoxicity uh, to begin with, but 70% uh, of them have been shown to uh, recover after several years of stopping uh, treatment. Again, uh, this, this problem uh, came to light and was most important for Hodgkin's disease, where, as you can see, um, with the earlier protocols, 80 to 100% of uh, uh, male uh, patients were azospermic and often had permanent uh, azospermia, hypogonadism. Whereas with the current regime that we use, ABVD, uh, the, uh, the incidence is much lower and there's almost up to 100% chance of, uh, it, not always, but up to, uh, it can go up to 100% chance of recovery. So uh, another study has uh, shown that uh, the infertility um, uh, among male survivors is uh, around 46% in comparison to their normal siblings where it is 17%. However, they showed that uh, out of these 46%, 37% of those who were actually uh, labeled as infertile had, or had fathered one child with uh, their partner. And these are the risk factors uh, which uh, talked about. So screening is important um, for, with an age appropriate history, tanner staging uh, um, uh, and looking for gynecomastia, finding out sexual function, fertility history, hormonal evaluation peripubertal and if it is uh, not pubertal then uh, to repeat every one to two years and uh, so on. With respect to females, chemotherapy induces apoptosis of the primordial follicle pool uh, causes damage to the cortex, alters the blood flow, and uh, ultimately causes ovarian uh, atresia. Uh, in, in contrast to the male, the, here the germ cell failure and loss of endocrine function are synchronous. Um, the risk factors, again, are dose uh, and age-dependent uh, toxicity. Uh, as uh, was mentioned by Dr. Rachna, uh, premature ovarian failure is uh, uh, what you see, and uh, this can occur, occur as acute ovarian failure during or soon after therapy, or in the uh, may present as premature menopause uh, under 40 years of age. And uh, one of the studies uh, of Hodgkin's showed uh, that the risk uh, with high risk uh, therapy, the uh, the the actuarial risk of uh, early menopause was 64% versus uh, low risk, uh, uh, you know, treatment, uh, which where it was 15%. Uh, 
these children also have been, uh, I mean, these individuals have been shown to have a 30, 13 fold higher risk of infertility compared to their normal uh, siblings. In addition, they may also have uh, other health related uh, outcomes which may uh, affect fertility, uh, like I mean, osteoporosis, psychosexual dysfunction, hypothyroidism, and so on. These drugs are teratogenic during uh, pregnancy, but uh, it has uh, been shown that there's no increased risk of childhood cancer to off offspring of these individuals, except if it is a germline cancer uh, predisposition syndrome related malignancy. Again, age appropriate history, uh, staging, uh, and uh, further uh, evaluation as uh, required. Uh, this is just uh, an example that uh, I have put up here that uh, this was a 10 year old female who um, had uh, abdominal uh, B cell uh, NHL was uh, this was in the 90s that we treated her with uh, the comp protocol uh, 15 years later she uh, relapsed and was treated uh, elsewhere with chemotherapy uh, chop. and that 22 years against she had some uh, recurrent abdominal lymphadenopathy suspected relapse. And she received one cycle of chemotherapy and rituximab, but uh, and uh, some radiation and uh, surgery. But she could not continue the chemotherapy because she had some uh, very severe uh, toxicity. However, she did well actually after that. She got married. She had a pregnancy, but she developed menopause at uh, 34 years of age. She is now 38 years. She had uh, you know multiple metabolic and other issues but uh, with various lifestyle changes, uh, she is now uh, fit and fine. Um, this was another girl uh, who was uh, long ago treated in the 80s, and uh, she was a seven-year-old female with um, a bucket type of uh, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. And uh, as was the treatment in those days, she received uh, this protocol with uh, three-year therapy, and uh, it involved craniospinal uh, irradiation. And uh, this girl, um, I last saw her when she was uh, 30 years old. She had severe short stature. She was amenorrheic and uh, she just looked like uh, a child, you know, even um, at that time. Uh, this is some of the Indian data. As Dr. Rachna said, has mentioned that, um, you know, for various reasons, we do not, uh, uh, we, we, we now do have a very formal, uh, you know, uh, after chemotherapy clinics and late effects uh, clinics. But uh, uh, we have problems in that many patients actually uh, do not follow up once the treatment is over and uh, so on and so forth. But uh, we now have the Indian Pediatric Oncology Group, which has a late effects study group. Dr. Rachna Seth is the chairperson of that group. And um, uh, there, there are projects uh, through this group. And some of the older data, I think Dr. Rachna has already shown, so I won't go into this, but um, these, these are from earlier patients, uh, you know, uh, where we use the earlier Hodgkin's protocol uh, with procarbazine and other things. Um, I will just skip that. This is Dr. Rachna Seth's data, which she has already presented. And this is our data, which is more um, current. Uh, and these are children who were uh, treated, uh, a cohort of children over 10 years. And um, uh, out of the females, all of them uh, attained secondary sexual characteristics, uh, but uh, three with uh, CNS tumors had uh, delayed, uh, have delayed menarche. Two of them are married uh, with children. And among the, male, uh, the males, they, uh, most of them were above uh, 11 years of age at the time of treatment. And uh, they have attained uh, sexually, uh, secondary sexual characteristics. Um, three are married and uh, one has uh, proven fertility. So um, uh, I kind of come to the end of my talk. And uh, uh, as you can see that the endocrine, metabolic and reproductive uh, outcomes are all uh, interlinked. And these children need surveillance. They need early identification for intervention from a fertility point of view. They also actually, uh, we need to look at the fertility angle even uh, you know, uh, before completion means at the time of uh, diagnosis and starting therapy. And uh, you know, so these children uh, and these issues actually need psychosocial support and uh, counseling. From our point, uh, from the oncology point of view, uh, we need to refine treatment to minimize late effects, uh, you know, having more fertility friendly chemotherapy, fertility sparing surgery, radiotherapy elimination where possible, a refinement in radiation delivery techniques. 
Um, we, there are many newer therapies for refractory and relapsed disease and hence the evolving the profile of late effects and even reproductive, uh, reproductive effects uh, is still evolving. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ma'am. It was a very lucid presentation and you very beautifully highlighted uh, uh, the importance of uh, counseling also because in these patients uh, who are undergoing chemotherapy, uh, the, not only the uh, effect is on fertility, but other aspects also, like you very well said that other health issues will also be there like osteoporosis and psychosocial dysfunction. So it is very important that uh, we carefully select the patients and uh, uh, as you said that we should use a, a chemotherapy-friendly um, chemotherapy, uh, fertility-friendly or fertility-sparing measures should be taken. But important thing is, very important thing is, uh, counseling of these patients uh, is very important uh, before uh, taking up for the uh, treatment. Uh, uh, so, uh, Sir Paisa? Uh, yeah, yeah, hi, I'm here, sorry. Yeah, hi, <laughs> so, so uh, you know, the Rashmi is my classmate, so is Madhuri Patel. We are all from KM Hospital. And, you know, in between, I had to zip through Bangladesh, give a talk and come back. So, but I only think this can be possible by digital, you know, the, the way the speed is there. Uh, so, I've been also doing a lot of preservation since 2007, outside freezing I started doing. And I do a lot of uh, ovarian tissue freezing. So, I think uh, maybe... The, the oncology groups in the country, because I've been struggling for the last, I've done about 15 to 18 patients of uh, cancer since the time I, I did, I've done a huge amount of fertility preservation for uh, lifestyle, but for cancer, I'm struggling. There are two consortiums and I would like to request on this platform, Rashmi and all of you that there's a, we need to have more connect. Uh, there is a onco fertility consortium in Europe and there's a, uh, uh, another fertility protect consortium in Europe and onco fertility consortium in United States. So we must have a consortium. We have huge amount of cancer in our country, and we must. Uh, you have huge amount of cases for preservation of fertility. So how to do it? I would love to. Uh, Madhuri is also there, and all, all the fertility prevention society. Dr. Majan, Dr. Nita Singh. We have to. Dr. Gopinath. We have to all decide and how to create that consortium in our country and now go to the next phase. You know, we must say that in the by one year's time, we are going to cross 10,000 patients of fertility preservation. How do we do it? That is the, the role we, we need to discuss uh, and focus on. Thank you. Uh, definitely. Uh, actually, we have the Pediatric Hemonc uh, Society in India, and we have an uh, uh, Indian Pediatric Oncology, uh, you know, study group. And uh, actually, the late effects, Dr. Rachna said, is the uh, chair of that. Uh, so, you know, we can, uh, uh, you know, engage with, uh, uh, you know, whoever and, uh, you know, get, uh, you know, look into that. Secondly, we also have an International Society of Pediatric Oncology, uh, with uh, of which many of us are uh, active members so you know there are uh, there will be multiple ways of uh, engaging definitely thank you and thank you rashmi that was a wonderful talk and uh, there's just one question i had for you that the score you put was very interesting the aad score yeah. in this uh, do you at some stage maybe later or maybe with a family history taken something about ovarian reserve or a family history of early menopause does that count in these uh, uh, actually no actually these scores are basically for calculating dose exposure only both the scores so uh, but that is interesting to note i mean uh, definitely you know when we are taking the uh, history uh, you know uh, subsequently, when we are following up the patients, uh, this could be one point. Uh, uh, yeah, are... that's very important because uh, any uh, history of low ovarian reserve would defi definitely impact this score. Yeah. And yeah. the other question I had was that when you use AB, ABVD instead of MOPS, there is no difference in the outcome of the cancer? No, no. Yeah. 
So have you switched over to this regime with the younger children and the yes, younger adults? Yes, more or less we have switched over to that. There are even other regimes, but ABVD works very well. And in fact, the same INPO group has a lot of uh, studies that are coming out uh, on the use of ABVD in our Indian children. Okay, right. so, great. Thank yes. you. So thank you very much. That was an excellent talk and an excellent session. Uh, and the only other comment I just want to make is not only in late uh, effects, but actually even in the counseling of cancer treatment, we often have uh, families where they will abandon therapy because they are afraid that the girl will not be fertile. And if we have these kind of resources and we work together, which I think is really, really exciting and the time has come for us to do this, um, I think it will help us to ensure that more patients will complete therapy because they know that they will have a wonderful life ahead. So thank you for the organizers for um, uh, having this platform and looking forward to interacting with the fertility preservation experts in our country. And it's wonderful to meet all of you. And as an oncologist, I really look forward to partnering with you in the future. Thank you so much. Thank you, esteemed chairpersons and the speaker. It was a very enlightening lecture. We now move on to the next session, for which I would like to invite our esteemed panel of chairpersons, Dr. Sujata Kar, MAMS Consultant Gynae and Obstetrics at Carr Clinic and IVF Center. She pursued advanced training in laparoscopic surgery from Calcutta and did her IVF training from Belgium and from London Harley Street Fertility Center. She's the recipient of many prestigious awards for her achievements in the field of yeah. Dr. Seema Singhal, ma'am. Ma'am is additional professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ames, New Delhi, with special interest in gynae oncology. Dr. Atul Batra, Associate Professor, Department of Medical Oncology, All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. And Dr. Shalini Gender, ma'am is additional professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, PGIMR, Chandigarh, India. Over to you. Uh, thank you, organizers, for inviting to this uh, excellent uh, conference. And the next uh, talk is by Dr. Antoinette An Anazado. So she's trained in pediatrics and adolescent oncology in the UK and completed her training with a clinical fellowship in Kids Cancer Center at the uh, Sydney Cancer, Sydney Children's Hospital. She was appointed as the director of adolescent and young adult cancer at Sydney Children's and Prince of Wales Hospital in October 2010 and has subsequently developed a comprehensive AYA cancer service across both the pediatric and adult cancer center. She has been part of the AYA national leadership group, working with the national and state partners to develop specialist youth cancer services. And she also leads the future fertility research program on reproductive concern of cancer patients. She is the chair for the Australian AYA Fertility Preservation Group and Guidelines Group. And she is the receiver of a number of awards. A uh, few of them include Champions Award from Prince of Wales Hospital, Pride of Australia Award in 2015, and Churchill Fellowship in 2015. And she has recently won the Cancer Institute NSW Premier's Award, Rising Star, and NSW Health People's Choice Award, as well as winning a prim Premier's Award in the Integrated Health category. So we invite Dr. Anazado for the next uh, for talk. Okay. Her talk is about oh, effect yeah. of non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy agents on infertility. So we look forward to hear you, doctor. Wonderful, thank you. So um, if you stop sharing, I'll share my screen. Uh, please stop sharing. Yeah, please, yeah, please share your screen. Uh, sharing first from there. So then stop from here. You can start sharing your screen, ma'am. Okay. Stop. You cannot. She cannot share. You stop sharing from there. We've already stopped sharing from here. Screen over here. Yeah, it has to go. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um.
doesn't seem to want me to. Open. Sorry, I'm trying to share. It doesn't seem to want them. I'm just trying again. Please select to share the screen. Yes, I've done that, but it's um, this is to you open. Just select the screen. screen button and select mm. your slide. It's not. It's not. It says allow Zoom to share your screen, and when I do that, it says open systems preferences. But I did send my talk just in case there was an issue. Uh, excuse me, ma'am. Ma'am, you will have to share the screen because we cannot play from here. Uh, then you will not have any. Uh, we will have to shift this uh, PPT slides, and you will have to only play the slide. Mm. Okay, I'm not sure why it won't let me. We are sharing, ma'am. Just wait. Yeah, ma'am. Meanwhile, we are trying to share the screen from here and we are trying to show the slides from here and then we can start. Okay. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. So look, thank you for, um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm the, you know, remember fondly coming to the conference before COVID and hopefully we'll be able to come in person again. So today I'm really going to be talking about something that people may not have heard so much about. So we're talking about non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy drugs. And that's really important because there is a new field in oncology, which we call precision medicine, where we're looking at specific molecular targets for an individual patient's cancer and trying to target therapy for those patients. And this has been very successful in certain cancer types and increasingly is going to become a mainstay for cancer treatments. First, in relapse and rare tumors, and then more and more in everyday tumors. And so why is this important? So Professor Dalvi has, has really highlighted very nicely the gonadotoxic risks of cancer treatments. So standard chemotherapy and radiotherapy. And we know that these treatments lead to temporary and permanent damage to gonadal tissue and gametes. Infertility causes substantial risk uh, to patients. And, and those risks, as uh, Professor Dalvi has said, is not just medical, but it's a psychosocial impact for the patient, their partners, and their family members. We are very fortunate to see an increase in cancer survivals. Uh, and as the speaker in the first session uh, highlighted, childhood and adolescent cancer survivals is over 80% now. And so more and more, we are really trying to fine tune those cancers where the survival is poorer. And so there's a lot of patients who have rarer tumors where we haven't previously been able to treat them or relapsed tumors who have been over-treated. And so that's where the non-cytotoxics and immunotherapy drugs come in. And as of now, these are not drugs where there's a lot of reproductive data, but it's a very important group of drugs because while there are many gynecologists and fertility experts in uh, the group, they will be seeing patients 
who not only have cancer, but they have rheumatological problems, they have GI problems, they have non-malignant hematological problems like myeloma, or they have um, neurological problems with things like uh, refractory seizures. And these conditions are all now being treated with non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy. So it's actually broadening out the patient reach, not just cancer, I know this is cancer conference, but a broader group of patients who up till now haven't really had the information about the risks of gonadotoxicity and the opportunities for fertility preservation. Next slide. Okay, so what are these drugs? So non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy, I've referred to them as NCIT. These are drugs where they have an interchangeable name. So they sometimes called molecular targeted drugs, precision medicine drugs. Um, and these drugs are newer agents. Uh, they have been, uh, they've got a slightly different mechanism to conventional cancer treatment. Um, and they are, they are enhancing the survival for cancer patients in several cancers. And the cancers that people, two cancers that people probably know most about where they're used is melanoma in the adolescent, young adult and adult population, where stage three and four melanoma 10 years ago would have been incurable. And now a cohort of these patients are surviving. And then in the childhood, very rarely, uh, things like um, chronic myeloid leukemias being treated with tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Next slide. So this is a table um, based on uh, Australian data. Uh, you'll see these are nine cancers that are solely treated with novel agents. And it's very important to look at this cohort first, because this cohort of patients are going to give us information about the true risks of gonadotoxicity. The, the, these, these new agents are used in many, many more uh, cancers, but they're usually used in combination as multimodality therapy. But in these nine cancers, the non-cytotoxics and immunotherapy are used on their own. And that's why we're especially interested in this cohort, because it gives us information about the true risks on reproduction. So you'll see, as I've told you, melanoma, number one, it's the most common cancer in the 15 to, to 45 year old age groups in Australasia. Um, they, again, have been treated by a number of different uh, targeted agents with an increasing survival. GIST tumours, a type of a sarcoma uh, seen in the young adults being used, uh, treated with tyrosine kinase, medullary thyroid cancers uh, with specific tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and now the very um, selective RET inhibitor, selpacatinib, showing almost a 90% survival in these children with medullary thyroid cancer. So these are not only uh, drugs that are specific for these patients, but we're seeing fabulous outcomes. And you'll see the others uh, with similar um, targeted therapy. Next slide, please. So these drugs, in contrast to conventional chemotherapy and radiotherapy, they do not directly kill all cells. They're very specific. So they are tailored to specific molecular, uh, molecular pathways, and that may be an effect on a specific molecule on the surface of the molecule, or it might be a, a small molecule within a cell. And so when I explain this to patients, I think about a video game, Pac-Man. And Pac-Man, hopefully everyone in the audience is old enough to remember Pac-Man, where there is a, a circular type uh, um, video game with a triangular mouth who's trying to eat things. And if you imagine that is the cancer cell, and the triangle is the specific target, okay? Now, if you can do molecular or precision medicine uh, screening and you find out the target, that target may, like the Pac-Man, be on the surface. And if you find that target, it binds to the triangle and it immobilizes that cancer cell. So two things could happen. 
it either immobilizes the cancer cell so it stops producing and doesn't multiply. So the patient is living with their cancer. Okay, so as long as they take the medication, which for most of these drugs is oral, they will live a long period of time. And if you think about um, the um, chronic myeloid leukemia, there are now survivors who have been on these oral agents for coming up to 20 years. Okay. The other thing it could do is actually cause the cell once it's immobilized to start shriveling up and dying. And so in some of these cancers, we'll see that the effect, once the, once the drug has had the effect, the patient can stop taking the drug. So thinking through that, we know that these drugs can induce cell apoptosis, they can inhibit angiogenesis, so cell growth, they can tr control the gene expression, they can trigger the immune system to start killing more of these cancer cells, or it can interfere with signal transduction. And so each type of molecular target, and there's a number of different types, has a different pathway and different mechanism of action. And the effect will depend on how long you're using these drugs. So one of the things we have to bear in mind as fertility specialists is unlike conventional chemotherapy, we may get cures for these patients or the patients may be taking the drugs for a long period of time, rendering them chronic cancer patients. But the fertility effects you may not see straight away and slowly over time because they're continuing to take these drugs, the patients start having problems with their ovarian or testicular reserve. Next slide. So how do we gather evidence for reporting on gonadotoxicity? Well, you'll see internationally, neither the FDA, so the Food and Drug Administration, or the TGA, the Therapeutic Goods Administration, mandates that we have to provide human or even basic animal toxicity data on approved product information, okay? So we, as a, my research group, have looked at the um, non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy drugs over um, the last couple of years. And we found that, you know, very few of them have uh, comprehensive information on or acknowledging the reproductive risks of these, these drugs, okay? And it's the paucity of data that actually hinders us. It hinders the oncologist or other specialists in actually realizing there's a risk. It hinders them in making the referral to the specialist, fertility preservation specialist. And it also hinders us being able to make a recommendation for fertility preservation. So the truth is, without this information, we don't know whether we are treating too few patients or we're over treating and doing fertility preservation on patients who may actually not need it. And that, um, when you think about resources is also very, very important because you don't want to over treat patients when this is actually an expensive procedure to do. And then there's, as um, Professor Delvia says, the psychosocial uh, implications for undergoing a fertility preservation and not knowing whether you're going to be infertile. Next slide, please. So again, so my research group about three years ago, we started investigating this area. And the first thing we did was we reviewed the 32 non-cytotoxic and, immune, and immunotherapy that had been listed by the FDA and TEGA over a five year period. So of the 32 drugs, none of the, these drugs had any human data on the reproductive effects published or in the unpublished proprietary data, okay? And what is usually the fallback is in the patient information sheets or the clinical trial informations, they say, please advise the patient to use contraception or consider fertility preservation, okay? But those recommendation is not based on the evidence of risk, okay? So from preclinical data, 23 of the 32 drugs had some preclinical data. 
only two of, the, of those 23 reported no adverse experimental effects on, on gut anatoxicity. Nine had inconclusive data. Nine in males showed infertility and three showed infertility in the females. So certainly the preclinical data that exists is enough for us to start worrying that the influence of precision medicine that we are about to see increase exponentially in our clinical practice may actually become a new risk for cancer patients. Next slide. So what human data is available? Well, sadly, the human data is very sparse and quite disappointing when you think that there have been more common tumor types like melanoma, like chronic myeloid leukemia, which now have over a 10 to 20 year period got actually extensive, uh, certainly treatment data. But it's because fertility, when, when you've got a cancer which is not curable, people don't think about fertility. It's only when you suddenly realize over years that more and more of these patients are surviving and that the cancers are in younger patients who actually haven't started or completed their families, that it becomes something that people are interested in documenting. And so you'll see uh, with the immune checkpoint inhibitors, um, these are very commonly used for melanoma. There's only four reports of pregnancy after treatment. I, I find it hard to believe that that is the case, but again, that's what the data says. There's a case report of two men who treated for melanoma with immune checkpoint inhibitors, one on a drug called Vemurafenib, uh, and they had minimal effects on a sperm output, but the other on Debrafenib. And in this um, male patient that had more detrimental impacts on sperm output. So again, this is someone who's documented it in two patients and you can see we've got contrasting information. Um, there is one paper which is a post-mortem paper and it is very interesting on spermatogenesis. They have uh, seven patients who have been treated with immune checkpoint inhibitors and they show that there is definitely um, uh, effects, detrimental effects on sperm output in these patients. However, these patients, you know, are dying, well, have died. And, you know, during that, that time, we know that there are other terminal effects in those patients' bodies. So it's hard to completely say that all of the effects um, on the spermatogenesis were due to the immune checkpoint inhibitors. The um, last area was the tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And again, tyrosine kinase inhibitors have been around for a long time. You saw in the table previously, nearly all of the nine cancers solely treated with uh, immune therapy or non-cytotoxics have used a tyrosine kinase in some way. And what we know about the data available is that in male patients, in the developing gonads, it seems to have an effect, but in adult patients, the effect doesn't seem to be as marked. Next slide, please. So in our center, again, moving on to this, we wanted to see, well, what is our experience um, with these non-cytotoxics and novel agents? And, and is it enough for us to make any recommendations? So for the females looking through, this is retrospectively, looking through the notes and because our patients get evaluated and we have a registry, we're able to pull those data. Um, we had seven patients and they were aged between 18 and 37 on a number of different drugs. Um, and six of those seven female patients continued to have regular menses all the way through their treatment. Um, the evidence of ovarian toxicity is manifested in the reduction in the antral follicle count with a median antral follicle count of uh, 14, a range of 7 to 50, and the serum um, uh, AMH median of 12 on the 10th percentile. But there was inconsistent patterns in the serum LH, FSH, and estradiol. 
And, and the difficulty with these seven patients, of course, it's only a small number, but there are so many different categories of uh, non-cytotoxics and immunotherapy that to get very clear data, we're going to have to have power in each type. So you, your tyrosine kinase inhibitors, your ALK inhibitors, your MET inhibitors, we're going to have to have patients in each of those types. Next slide, please. So in terms of pilot data for males, um, we had 14 patients aged between 19 and 42, mainly with melanoma, 10 of them had melanoma, others um, uh, with um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And because we have a lot of males who come in for sperm banking, we're able to have match controls as well. And in these 14 patients, we actually did not see significant adverse impacts on any of the semen variables or reproductive hormones uh, that we had. Next slide. So what is the relevance and importance? Well, I think I have clearly articulated that we are increasingly going to be using these drugs as curative treatment protocols. And while the nine cancers I've highlighted are cancers of slightly older patients, and some of those patients may have completed their family, we are using non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy in pediatric uh, protocols as part of combinations. And so while these drugs promise less gonadotoxicity damage than conventional cancer treatment, there is a lack of data. And it is really important for us to start thinking as a community, how do we answer that question? Next slide, please. So um, we have opened uh, last year, the first study on non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy. Uh, and the aim and objectives of the study was to determine the impact of a novel non-cytotoxic cancer treatment on the fertility in male and female cancer patients and to initiate follow-up of fertility amongst patients who'd had this treatment. Next, next slide, please. So the, the study has two cohorts. It has cohort one, um, which is a longitudinal study of male and, and female patients who have been treated with these drugs. So we appreciate that it's going to be very important to quickly get data on patients who have had these drugs. And we also know it's going to be complicated because the, the patients we really want to highlight are those that have not had conventional chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So the data is clean. So we have the longitudinal study, not because it's an ideal study design, but it's a way of allowing us very quickly to see whether there's any problems and then say, well, of all the different types of uh, non-cytotoxic immunotherapy categories, can we pick out some categories to, to specific look, look at? So is it all of these drugs or is it just specific ones? And then cohort two is really how you should design the study. So it's a cross-sectional study where we look at patients prior to starting their cancer treatment, and then we follow them up. And like I said, a lot of the patients who are on nine cytotoxic treatment will have the treatment for a long time. So what we need to find out is whether it is a dose effect um, and what that cumulative dose effect will be. Okay, so for these patients, um, we certainly want to start with getting a sample of 100 and hope to have 20 in each of uh, the common uh, non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy categories. And also, we've got to think about the, uh, the gender issues and make sure that we look at both male and female patients and think about the effects of age. Next slide, please. Um, so to start with, our, our ethics uh, uh, group would not give us permission to do this study in children. They felt that uh, it potentially was going to be causing more distress to families to think that there were unknown risks than actually helping families to make decisions. And they felt that it was ethically better to just do the study in um, basically 
uh, patients who are aged from 18. The patients have to um, consent to blood tests, ultrasound scans for if they're females, uh, semen analysis if they're males, um, and to allow us to monitor them before and in three month intervals for those patients who uh, continue on the non cytotoxic agents. Uh, next slide. So this is really what I've said before, reproductive and general medical history is really important. I think over time we'll find as part of the risk that Professor Dalvey spoke about in the last slides, we'll also find the, the actual um, genetic risk of infertility that plays a part um, in uh, um, the gonadotoxicity uh, profile of patients. For the male patients, we obviously want the testicular volume, we want reproductive hormones uh, for male and female patients, semen analysis, and in our centre, because we uh, do fertility preservation, we give them the opportunities to have fertility preservation, knowing that some of these patients in the future may actually not need it. So we, we, we just don't know. And we're taking the opportunity to look and collect DNA blood tests so that if we identify specific genes that influence reproductive damage, we can do some more tests. So I think you'll see from this, um, this short presentation that while non-cytotoxic and immunotherapy um, agents are increasingly more common in cancer treatment, we have a long way to go before we get more generalizable gonadotoxic information that will be useful. But I think if we start thinking about it now, we'll be able to give really useful information to patients in a short period of time. So I thank you for listening to my talk. I'm happy to share the papers and the publications um, with a study chair um, and very happy to take any questions. I think I've gone through that slide. So, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for such a comprehensive talk and sharing your experience with us. And now I think we all can counsel our patients. We can reassure them who are taking these drugs, you know. And this topic is such a novel topic. We have never read this topic. And so we are really reassured that these patients and these patients, the effect does not match on their fertility. And, you know, we can yeah, reassure them. So do we have any questions in the chat box? Yeah. Dr. Anazado, I'm Dr. Shalini from, uh, yeah, actually you've covered everything and uh, what uh, we can conclude now that uh, we still are in uh, actually lacking any uh, robust, uh, uh, I mean, effect of these drugs on the gonads. So when we are talking about the counseling of our patients, uh, especially in our setup, we need to at least inform when we are going to give this to the young adolescent or the reproductive age group that uh, we do not actually have any backing of information, what effect it will cause. So the consent taking becomes very important when we are Absolutely. going to start these drugs. And uh, especially with the, I mean, the study you quoted, which was uh, including 23 studies, uh, that, uh, I mean, only two studies said that there was uh, no effect on the gonads. Rest, you know, it, nine were in, inconclusive and nine had uh, impact. So, I mean, uh, we are nowhere still. It, this is so true. I mean, yeah. look, I mean, it just goes to show when, when drug companies are putting things together, when our clinical academics are putting studies together, they're not always thinking about survivorship. They're not thinking about the future. No, exactly. They're thinking about cure. And remember, a lot of drugs now for precision medicine are being repurposed. So, yeah. for example, this week I started a 13-year-old boy with T-cell lymphoma, uh, relapsed and refractory, on a breast cancer drug based on the molecular profiling we got. Okay, So if the drug hasn't been tested for males... This is a drug that's being used a lot for females. We've got yeah. nothing on the males. And more and more our practice is getting like that. So we've got this double-edged sword. We want to provide information for patients. 
we want to do fertility preservation, but we don't want to worry people by doing it too much. And we don't want them to have the burden of cost of doing an unnecessary procedure. And then we've got the added insult, which is if the patients have molecular screening and the drug is tested and works clinically, they may be on this drug for years. So with yeah. the CML patients, we used to transplant all these patients. And now we've realized they can be on imatinib, disatinib for years and years and years and live just normal life with taking one tablet a day. But they're going to be taking these tablets for life. So more and more, we're seeing young men with tyrosine kinase inhibitors whose sperm quality is poor. So it's very important that we start collecting the data to yeah. give some reassurance. And another thing we recently discussed with the onco people, uh, I mean, who were treating breast cancer was the way you reported that the hormonal uh, profile is very variable. So we realized when we were giving them uh, therapy for post, uh, I mean, can, uh, breast cancer, the FSH level would rise. And then the FSH level came down, which is not the routine we see in other reproductive women. So, I mean, this is something very different, which happens in the oncology treatment. That's right. That's right. Thank you. So, uh, uh, with the permission of organizers, can we close this session now? Thank you so much, organizers, for giving this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, esteemed speaker and the chairpersons. It was a wonderful session. We now move on to the next session. For this, I invite a panel of esteemed uh, chairpersons, Professor Lina Vadva. Ma'am is Professor at ESI PGIMR, Basaidarapur, Delhi. Dr. Nivya Valicha, Consultant in Charge, Fortis Ridge IVF, Shalimar Bagh. Dr. Nadeep Kaur Guman, Ma'am is Associate Professor, Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ains Chodhpur. And Dr. Latika Chavla, Associate Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Ains Rishikesh. I request Professor Lina Vadba, Ma'am, to introduce our speaker. Am I audible? Yes, ma'am, you are. Yeah. Thank you for the kind words. I take the privilege and honor to invite uh, Mr. Surendra Viraya. Uh, he will be, uh, he has a lot of experience, 20 years of experience in the field of psycho oncology. Professor V. Sundaran is currently heading the Department of Psycho Oncology and Resource Center for Tobacco Control at Cancer Institute, Adya, Chennai, India. He has published more than 20 scientific articles and has contributed various chapters. And to his credit, he has initiated various patient support group programs and designed interventional modules to improve them. And one of the highly appreciated initiatives is the free WIC program for patients receiving chemotherapy and offering breast processes for patients underwent mastectomy. He is one of the expert member of the State Policy for Cancer Care, Government of Tamil Nadu. Also serves as the chairman of the Independent Ethical Committee of Psychology Division, Women's Christian College, Chennai. And uh, he will be speaking on the psychosocial dimensions of cancer in adolescents and children. Dr. Surrender, please. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I think good afternoon. Uh, am I audible to everyone? Yes, you're audible. Thank you. Share my... Is my PPT visible to all of you? Yes, it is visible. You can go ahead. Right. You can make it full screen. I, I've done it. So I'll do that again. Yeah, it's visible. It's okay. Right. Yes. So, um, at the outset, I would like to thank the chair, uh, Dr. Uh, Anita Singh, and all the organizing uh, members and, and uh, beloved colleagues from the oncology uh, area. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. First of all, <clears throat> my sincere appreciation to the organizing team for thinking about including this topic. Uh, generally, this topic uh, is ignored in many of the uh, meetings, I would say. 
uh, but this is something that's very important. And I was listening to all the lectures and everybody pointed out that uh, uh, this is something which is very essential and uh, need to be included, uh, especially in pediatric and uh, the uh, children with cancer, not only during the treatment, even post-treatment during the survival. So uh, to start with, uh, see, uh, generally uh, the cancer diagnosis itself uh, leads to distress, not only to the patient, also to the family siblings. Uh, to add one more point, uh, this is very distressing for the treating physician and the entire healthcare providing team, uh, because uh, it's very, very, very uh, disheartening at most of the situations when the child goes through the procedure, the doctor really need to uh, convince the family and ensure that the child receives the treatment, uh, even the evaluation. The procedures are done uh, on time and the child is put on treatment on time. So all these are very challenging for the treating team, especially the physician, uh, because we see that on a regular basis, uh, whether it's surgery, radiation or chemotherapy, but uh, they, it, it's very distressing for all of, all of them. So, uh, so the, the distress, not only in diagnosis, whenever the doctor need to uh, talk about uh, the outcome of the treatment, whether it is uh, remission or whatever it is, the decision need to be communicated. And uh, then the family has to take a decision, what is next? So everything is very challenging. Uh, so the communication plays a vital role here. And uh, most of the time uh, we are involved in that process uh, where when the, when the family and the patient goes through the distress and we spend, and now we have a dedicated team of staff who offer intervention, the behavioral intervention uh, in uh, reducing the distress. And uh, the, not only during the treatment, now with the help of uh, uh, the uh, Indian Cancer Society, we started after completion treatment therapy clinic where we have a dedicated psycho-oncologist along with the doctor, they assess the psychosocial aspects of survivorship and that's also being documented and wherever required appropriate interventions are offered. And uh, if there are recurrent special attention given, now we have a dedicated pediatric palliative care uh, unit uh, uh, dealt by our palliative care team. So what, why I have this slide uh, as a first slide. So when we say it's a teamwork, uh, it is definitely a teamwork where everyone needs to be involved. So uh, now I'll take you through other specific issues that uh, a child and the family goes through during the treatment and post-treatment. So distress uh, associated with medical procedures, uh, as you all know, and uh, doctors like Balvi and, uh, Dalvi and uh, the doctor beautifully explained about the, the treatment and the procedures and the uh, toxic effects of the treatment. Uh, see, generally, um, one side is the, uh, the effect of treatment. The other side is the child, when the child goes through procedure, for just to take one procedure, bone marrow aspiration. Uh, though there are advancements, it's, a, it's made painless procedure, but still uh, that reminder is always there for a child. Whenever you talk, when the child is asked to go for a BMA second time, the child definitely goes through distress. So, uh, so Definitely in cancer setting, especially in pediatric and adolescents, this invasive cancer diagnostic and treatment procedure are always a reminder resulting in uh, distress. Um, and the children with lower levels of attention have uh, more difficulty. Of course, uh, you encounter uh, a child with uh, different levels of uh, intellectual functioning and uh, accordingly, you may encounter issues and concerns. Um, so experiencing distress during procedures, long-term uh, uh, treatment-related anxieties are very common, and uh, these sequels may occur before, during, even week after the procedure. But uh, the important thing here is to identify those problems and address it on time so that you can prevent uh, from a child developing uh, severe consequences, especially the psychosocial consequences. So younger children exhibit more distress, uh, because uh, they, they are, uh, you know, they will be having, generally the young children will have a lot of issues when they go to school, when they move to other social situations. So here the same. So the, the, the trouble is more uh, when, when they are very young. So because they may have frightening fantasies, 
and uh, parents feel helpless and guilty as they watch the child suffer most of the time. The counseling and the behavioral intervention is required for the parents than the children. And as I told you earlier, it is not only for the parents and also stressful for the medical staff, especially for the doctors. And we often discuss uh, uh, about you know de-stressing oneself from all these uh, uh, ruminating thoughts. Now, coming to specific issues, uh, see, this is one of the common um, problem that is encountered by the treating physician, that the non-compliance to treatment. Uh, it is really an impediment to therapy administration, not only therapy administration, it also you know, affects follow-up, uh, you know, going for evaluation. When we talk about treatment adherence, so it, it really affects. So uh, refusal of a treatment, failure to keep an appointment, choice of alternative treatment modality. Sometimes what happens, uh, they, they also you know, uh, think about going to alternative treatment. That is where uh, talking to the family um, and explaining them uh, the importance of continuing treatment and understanding their concerns and issues associated with involving in this procedure is very vital. What we did here in our institute is uh, we have, because uh, every time considering the load, uh, so it's very difficult for us to sit with a child for a longer time. So uh, what we have done, we have uh, developed a module, interventional module, uh, where the doctor explains the procedure, whatever the procedures may be in different languages, um, in all regional languages. And we have a leaflet containing the messages and we show it to the child as well as to the mother or the caregiver, care provider, immediate care provider. And following that, we will have a one-on-one -on -one session. And if they have further concern, then we will address that so that the compliance improves and uh, the non-adherence in our institute initially was very high. Now it has drastically come down because of this procedure. So if you look at the data, so the non-compliance rate is uh, under, under the age of 13 years is 33%. And in adolescence, it is 59%. Uh, see, non-compliance in adults, uh, adolescence is high because, uh, because of the other psychosocial concerns, I would say. Um, uh, see, there are, uh, when I say other psychosocial concerns, it's especially the anticipatory nausea, vomiting that I would generally relate with, especially adolescents and also other surgical procedures. Uh, for example, uh, if there is a loss of limb, that can be one of the important aspect that you need to pay attention to. And uh, common psychological comorbidities are adjustment disorders, neurodevelopmental disorders, depression, anxiety. When we talk about anxiety, it is procedural anxiety and separate, uh, separation anxiety. These are commonly reported. And the you know, earlier I was talking to you about uh, the anticipatory symptoms, 29% uh, develop anticipatory nausea and 20% develop anticipatory vomiting. And of course, uh, it may be, uh, 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 not maybe, it is definitely distressing for a child who goes through this uh, whenever they think about a procedure or whenever they think about the follow-up or when they think about the next uh, chemo cycle, it is very disheartening for a child. So if you prepare a child and the family member and the, and, and the procedure goes through easily, and if not in all cases, at least in most of the cases. And psychiatric emergencies, this is something I think all of us need to be very much aware of. Uh, there are uh, occasions where the child uh, may uh, have suicidal thoughts or uh, may attempt or self-harming behavior can be seen in children, especially and adolescents, especially it's very high. And the suicidal rate also very high in that age group above, above 15 years, I would say. So, we need to pay attention. So we have made the distress screening as a routine procedure in all our pediatric unit. And uh, uh, so we follow them up closely if the distress score is more than four. And uh, delirium also noted uh, commonly uh, among children receiving chemotherapy. I think uh, this is something that uh, pay attention where you need to have a proper differential diagnosis and refer the patient to a psychiatrist if required. And uh, and when a child is very aggressive or potentially dangerous to others, and we should educate the staff nurses or uh, the treating physician involved and alert the family and offer intervention on time to uh, avoid uh, other damages <clears throat> or other issues. And uh, very pertinent and important aspect, I thought uh, 
this is something very important to discuss with meaningful uh, in this uh, meeting. Uh, fertility and sexuality, of course, uh, uh, all of us are happy. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, there is an increased number of survival. And if you look at the, uh, the, the previous speakers uh, uh, beautifully explained about the survival, um, but uh, uh, I'm very happy that in, uh, I think, lower income countries, lower and middle income countries, India stands uh, very high with respect to pediatric cancer survival. I think we are showing, we have the result of more than 60% of uh, survivorship among uh, pediatric cancers. Um, um, so what happens is uh, when we see one side happiness, the other side is there are toxic effects uh, which are need to be paid attention. And I think if we pay attention to this, I think the future, these children will have good quality of life during their survival. So um, the, uh, this, I think the Dr. Uh, Dalvi has already explained about this. Uh, the, the infertility was observed in 46% of the survivors, especially males uh, versus the 17.5% of the siblings. The general population, it is only 17.5% uh, whereas it is 46 in the uh, cancer survivors who treated a very young age. So the psychosocial factors are uh, playing a, a very significant role in uh, development of uh, uh, sexual problems in children. So early age at diagnosis is one of the important factors that uh, uh, we need to look into and because which may negatively influence sexual identity formation and consequently longer term psychosocial sexual development. So um, see why we talk, see, for example, uh, this is a transition from adolescent to adult, the child, adolescent, adult. If you take the child about the age of 12 years to 18 years, there's a complete transition. So that's when, if, when they receive these chemo drugs, which the doctors were uh, talking earlier, uh, definitely it has its adverse effect, uh, definitely it affects the growth as well. So where they have the identity crisis, and uh, they have their own doubts about, uh, you know, who am I? And uh, uh, am I look like a normal person? Uh, so this is where we need to pay attention. So you need to prepare the child, give them reassurance and help them understand that there is a life after this. So that is something very important. And you all were, uh, Dr. Pai was talking about, uh, I think, uh, uh, fertility preservation. Wherever there is a possibility, uh, and uh, we should, of course, uh, the researches are very scarce and I think uh, we have not paid much attention in the past. Uh, good that we are talking about it now. I think future definitely there are, there will be trials coming up and uh, uh, there are more meaningful outcomes can be seen in the near future so that it will improve their self-esteem and improve interpersonal understanding post-treatment uh, when we pay attention to fertility and sexuality. And uh, sexual dysfunction is also commonly seen uh, among the survivors, especially this is more common among women gender uh, during their survivorship. Uh, so, so difficulty in sexual functioning reported in uh, around 43% of young adult survivors of childhood cancer. And uh, this is due to, uh, this may be due to uh, the treatment, uh, physical symptoms, psychological factors and social and interpersonal factors. So that's why of course, you all know, uh, you may pay attention to the physical and treatment factors, but I think it's very important to closely look at the psychological and the social and interpersonal factors associated with this component. Many times, in our, if you look at our culture, uh, even parents fail to talk about the, the sexual functioning and uh, even uh, uh, reproductive and fertility issues uh, because uh, they are hesitant to talk to the doctor. Uh, sometimes the family asks them about doctor, can my child get uh, married? And if married, will my child uh, become a father or mother? These are all the greater concern when they come for follow-up. Not may not be at the time of treatment, but definitely during the follow-up. At the time of treatment, their concern may be more of uh, helping the child live, making the child live. They talk more about survival there. But when they come for follow-up, they're concerned mostly about academics, mostly about uh, uh, the reproductive and the fertility related issues and marital concerns. And uh, I just uh, quickly go through this and uh, even my uh, doctoral dissertation one on this was on this. See, definitely these uh, drugs, especially radiation and chemo drugs, some of the chemo drugs are associated with uh, neurocognitive deficits. 
and uh, now there are newer protocol uh, which are uh, showing very less neurocognitive deficit but we are yet, yet to see uh, uh, a trial with no deficit um, so this i spoke to you and uh, other issues are like uh, agitation and behavioral difficulties and these are commonly seen when the child is receiving treatment and social adjustment also one of the uh, commonest problem experienced or encountered by children when they uh, go back home and they continue to uh, school and uh, job so uh, during their survival so, so social difficulties may also arise secondary to separation from peers as a result of hospitalization isolation at home limitation in activities imposed by their disease uh, so these are the some of the other concerns and uh, the other concerns uh, which i would like to touch upon is the post traumatic stress disorder uh, i don't say disorder the symptoms we need to look at the symptoms when the child comes to uh, your act clinic it uh, be very very important and academic problems of course uh, definitely these children go through academic problems it is uh, uh, increased risk is seen uh, when they are diagnosed at a very young age uh, and uh, prolonged school absence and cancer treatment that result in a reduced energy levels cancer treatment affecting hear and vision uh, not all children sometimes it happens cancer treatment resulting in physical disabilities and uh, as i told you sometimes uh, when the child is supposed to go for amputation then that so that though there are uh, improvement and uh, innovations in surgical procedures but in some cases it is unavoidable they had to go for it in such situation you need to really prepare the child to cope and uh, reassure the other possibilities especially rehabilitative procedures and uh, what are the i've come to an end so now what are the uh, predictors of positive family adaptation uh, uh, so these are the some of the uh, uh, predictors of positive family adaptation absence of uh, premorbid psychopathology and uh, uh, if there are no psychiatric or psychomorbidity uh, uh, in a child i think that is one of the family uh, uh, factor associated with uh, positive family adaptation and family cohesion and uh, flexibility this is where uh, when a doctor or a team uh, works with the child you need to involve the family uh, especially siblings in this uh, case i would say ability to recognize and balance demands of the illness with the family and access to economic resources that is something very important that we need to pay attention clear family boundaries and open and effective communication is much needed otherwise they'll come back and question you you said this but see now it is uh, reverse please explain so our communication should be very very clear uh, and active coping teach them there are different ways of coping adaptive maladaptive but teach them actively how the child can be engaged uh, during the time of treatment and during survival and and a, a strong spiritual belief system when there is a spiritual uh, spiritual belief system then definitely one of the good adopt uh, uh, adaptation that helps family adopt very well and social support is another important aspect that we all uh, should pay attention to so um, overall i would say uh, when it comes to children and adolescents uh, psychosocial factors definitely plays a vital role in improving the uh, quality of life if we pay close attention and offer intervention at the right time uh, when i say right time from diagnosis to survival uh, even if it is end of life care and i think we need to discuss and disclose the information appropriately using the right strategy that will definitely enhance the quality of life but not only quality of life the quality of relationship with the physician family and the patient once again i take this opportunity to thank the organizers thank you so much look forward to questions Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, it was a wonderful talk, sir. And uh, considering we come from a system, usually takes a back seat. 
uh, you know, even discussions on uh, mental health and mental support are uh, considered to be a taboo here in our uh, setup. So I think this was a fantastic, uh, you know, issue that needed to be discussed. Even for adults, we don't talk about mental health, let alone for, you know, small children and adolescents. So I congratulate you on your talk, sir. Uh, Thank, you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think if there are no questions in the chat box, we can uh, close this session. Okay, uh, I would uh, uh, like to thank Dr. Nita Singh and for the preservation team for this arranging this wonderful uh, CME. And with this, uh, I close this uh, session and we move uh, for the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, esteemed chairpersons and the speaker for this enlightening session. Thank you. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our distinguished guest, Dr. Kavita Rajashekhar, ma'am. Ma'am is senior scientist at the Department of Health Research, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Ma'am could not be there for inauguration, but has now graced the occasion. I request Dr. Ankita and uh, Dr. Shivangi to extend floral welcome and token of appreciation to Dr. Kavita, ma'am. Please return light, please. Not for DJ Anna, you gave. We move on to the next session. For this, I'd like to invite our chairpersons, Professor Nita Singh, ma'am. Ma'am is Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Ames, New Delhi. Professor Mohan Kamat, sir. Sir is Professor and Head, Department of Reproductive Medicine, CMC Bellore. Dr. Umesh Jindal, sir. Sir is the Project Director of the Jindal IVF and Sant Memorial Nursing Home. And Dr. Papa Desari, sir. Senior Professor, ART Coordinator at JIPMER. Uh, and he has delivered the first ICSI baby of JIPMER in 2020. Over to you, ma'am. Okay, so uh, a very warm welcome to Dr. Madhuri Patil, uh, a good, very good friend and a very, very uh, vibrant person I know in this fraternity. She's a very famous and renowned reproductive endocrinologist and infertility specialist, and she is the president-elect and found a member of our society, which is called Fertility Preservation Society of India. She has been the vice president of PCOS Society, and she's on the executive board member of Asian Society for Fertility Preservation. And she has many, many awards to her credit. Uh, let's not come in into her talk and listen to her what she's going to talk. Uh, we are already running late uh, of the schedule. I'm, I'm really sorry about uh, this delay in the program, but we are all uh, waiting to hear uh, Dr. Madhuri Patil. Thank you, Nita, for that introduction. And also I congratulate you on uh, having this program. And I think it has been a great program. And uh, I would be talking today on the different techniques of fertility preservation in people and adolescent patients. So we are, uh, we are aware that we require fertility preservation in childhood and adolescent cancers because we've already heard Dr. Rachna as well as Rashmi talking about the effect of chemo and radiotherapy on future fertility. And probably uh, the, we have to look into those individuals whose previous treatment of childhood cancer has also led to infertility or stability and can often benefit from fertility treatment options such as egg and sperm donation, gestational surrogacy and other still experimental procedures. Uh, so, uh, we've also seen that uh, there is an improvement in the survival of uh, survival in these children who have had cancers or especially those under the year of 14 years. And it is almost about 83.8% that is we can uh, say about 84% and one in a thousand adults is a survivor of childhood cancer. 
Uh, we've also seen the various cancers which are common in childhood and I would not uh, uh, like to go over it again. And I would uh, like to talk about those conditions, especially which require counseling about fertility preservation. And when you talk about the uh, female children, uh, especially those who have been subjected to high dose of alkylizing agents like cy cyclophosphamide and here, yeah, the about in a female, whereas that in the male. Yeah, then the patients have been subjected to radiotherapy. In the female, the, both the ovaries and uterus can be involved, whereas in the male, it is basically the testes. Those having uh, cranial irradiation as well as a hemopoietic stem cell transfer, and those for uh, who have been subjected to oophorectomy in the female and orchidectomy in the male for cancer in involving the organ. We've also looked at the various uh, risks associated with chemotherapy. So we have those which have a high risk of uh, infertility, which include cyclophosphamide, iphosamide, mulstin, uh, busulfan, melfan, procarbazine, chlorambucil, uh, lomistin, and um, metoclortamine. Whereas those with medium risk are cisplatinum, carboplatinum, and adriamycin, and all these other drugs uh, like vincristin, methotrexate, actinomycin, bleomycin, and vinblastin have a very a low risk of uh, low risk to fertility. Uh, if you look at the impact of radiotherapy and chemotherapy on female uh, fertility, the chemotherapy can have direct ovarian toxicity, vascular toxicity, as well as cellular effects, which can affect the cytoskeleton, the DNA, and oxidative stress. But radiotherapy will affect not only the ovaries, but also the uterus. Whereas in the male, if you see in this picture, we can see that they could be damaged to the spermatogonial stem cells with permanent azoospermia. They could be damaged to differentiating germ, in an, uh, differentiating germ cells with transient azoospermia. And they could also be damaged to the Sertoli cells, wherein you can either have a transient or a permanent azoospermia. And uh, they could be damaged to lytic cells, which occurs only at very high doses and is generally not seen. And this can then lead to uh, testosterone deficiency. Whether we go in for a fertility preservation procedure or not will basically depend on certain uh, factors, both, uh, in both in the girls as well as boys. And these include the intrinsic factors like the health status of the patient, the psycho psychological factors, and the consent, which has not only to be obtained from the patient, but also from the parents because they are under the age of uh, uh, 15 years. We need to assess whether there has, uh, what is the pubertal status of the boy and the girl, as well as the ovarian reserve in the female. Whereas the extrinsic factors which can influence is the risk of predicted treatment, whether it has high, medium, low, or uncertain risk to fertility, the time available with us before the treatment is initiated, as well as the expertise and the technical options which are available to us. So coming to the various techniques, in the female, in the pubertal, we could go in for oocyte cryopreservation, ovarian tissue cryopreservation, gonadal shielding, oophoropexy or ovarian transposition, as well as ovarian suppression with GnRH agonist. Whereas in the pre-pubertal, what uh, the method we have is the ovarian tissue cryopreservation, we could also, uh, uh, to some extent, uh, these patients would be helped by gonadal shielding and uh, old ovary cryopreservation is still an experimental procedure. Whereas in the males, in the pubertal, we really do not have much problem because we can preserve the semen. And at times, uh, there are only few case series which have been reported wherein uh, gold gonadal shielding could be useful. But in the pre-pubertal, again, we can see that for gonadal shielding, we have only a few cases, especially when they're subjected to radiotherapy. And uh, moving testes out of the radiation field, there's only case series and still experimental. And we also know that testicular tissue cryopreservation has not yet been tested in the humans and is still experimental. And I will uh, discuss in detail about it later. Coming to the adolescent female, we know that oocyte uh, uh, as well as ovarian tissue cryopreservation can be done. And pregnancy rates have been uh, reported using cryopreserved oocytes and the, the uh, pregnancy rate is about 50%. After auto-transplantation of ovarian tissue after OTC, uh, it has definitely restored endocrine function in all. 
And live birth rate is also seen with the success rate of, of almost about 45%. And more than 14 live births have been reported after OTC has been done in adolescent population. One concern is contamination with malignant cells, which is seen in cryopreserved ovarian tissue. And this is basically, uh, this has a higher incidence in those patients who have had leukemia. Uh, it has also been observed that there is no increase in the chromosomal abnormalities, birth defects, or developmental deficits that have been noted in children born after cryopreserved oocytes or after OTC as compared with other standard ART procedures and also with natural conception. Uh, the, the different sources of oocyte for fertility preservation basically uh, are ovarian biopsy or oophorectomy specimen wherein we do an ex vivo in a vitro maturation. Uh, basically, if uh, she is pubertal, we can do ovarian stimulation with N2 oocyte uh, cryopreservation. And we could also do in this group of patients in vivo IVM. And uh, we can either, uh, and this is followed basically by oocyte cryopreservation and whenever required fertilization and then embryo replacement either in the cell or surrogate. And in vitro development of oocytes is still an experimental procedure. And if you look at the oocyte competence in the adolescent females, we can see that more mature oocytes are basically obtained in the postmenarchal girls. Whereas if you uh, look, at, uh, look at the IBM rate, it is again uh, more in the postmenarchal girls as compared to the premenarchal girls. Coming to ovarian tissue cryopreservation, we know that it is the only method in prepubertal girls, and uh, uh, and this is basically uh, uh, that it is and, and it has been uh, helpful in those patients wherein they've had breast development, and it can it's uh, the ovarian tissue transplant can result in puberty. And two live births have been reported uh, after OTC, which has done in pubertal girls, though there are more than 140 live births which have been reported after ovarian tissue preservation and transplantation in the adolescent and the uh, adult population. And here you can see that there is a definite restoration of the over ovarian endocrine function. And you can see that the FSH levels uh, come back to normal after about four to five week, uh, months of ovarian transplantation. It has also led to induction of puberty. And here are two examples. And this was a girl who, who was a 10 year old girl who had sickle cell disease and transplantation was done at 13 years. And after two years, she, uh, she had her puberty. Whereas this was another girl who was a nine year one old girl with Ewing sarcoma. And after transplantation at 13.6 years, after a period of about 19 months, she achieved menarche. And these are several papers which have shown restoration of ovarian activity and pregnancy after transplantation. And like, as I already said, that it has also been reported in pre-pubertal and post-pubertal adolescent girls. But one must remember that the initial follicular density is of great importance to the longevity of the graft after ovarian tissue transplant, uh, transplant. And though loss of ovarian follicles during the whole OTC and transplantation have been reported, uh, reported. there are several strategies that have been explored to preserve the follicle, uh, follicles upon autografting, such as delivering angiogenic and anti-apoptotic factors and giving antioxidants and adipose-derived stem cells to increase the vascularization as well as decrease the ischemia after tissue grafting. We also need to look at uh, those tissues which would have a risk of ovarian contamination, but we still don't have a strategy that has been developed. And basically, uh, they are looking at uh, IVG, where we do the in vitro growth, but it has a very low efficiency rate and abnormal morphology and mature oocytes have been formed. Or one could have an artificial ovary, and this has been tried in the mouse model, but there's no data in humans. The other strategies include gonadal shielding and ophoropexy, and ophoropexy has been uh, effective in preserving the endocrine function of the ovary in 60% of the cases in a and in about approximately 15% of the patients who became pregnant. Uh, and uh, it has been shown that there were 42 libers which have been reported after 
for a PET-C before you do therapy exposure. And the existing guidelines support that move for a PET-C does not increase the risk of congenital abnormalities among offsprings. GNRH analogs are effective in restoring regular menstrual cycle, uh, uh, cycle for up to 17 years after the end of the treatment and are usually used as an adjunct to, adjunct to other procedures for fertility preservation. No late complications from hormonal suppression were noted in most of these patients were given the GNRH analogs. Following cranial irradiation, ovarian function can be supported at the time of family planning by use of gonadotropin therapy, uh, especially in those patients who develop hypogonadism. Gestational surrogacy is an option in those who have undergone pelvic irradiation with scarring of, or other post-radiation effects to the uterus and vagina that preclude conception or the ability to maintain a pregnancy. And today, we also know that several cases have been successful after uterine transplant. We could also go for conservative surgery in girls, wherein we can preserve the ovarian function especially in those patients who have had reproductive tract malignancy uh, and uh, conservative surgery is possible in certain early stage tumors and choosing chemotherapeutic agents that have less gonadal toxicity. It could also generate oocytes and, regen uh, and, and they could be regeneration of dysfunctional endometrial form stem cells. And it has been successful in mice uh, where they have created oocytes from pluripotent stem cells. These oocytes could be fertilized and one study resulted in healthy pups. Advances in the development of human germ cell line in vitro is being investigated and will be one of the fertility preservation techniques probably in future. Stem cells may be able to regenerate the dysfunctional uterine and to promote the vaginal reconstruction as well as regeneration and as I said, uterine transplant is another jack on the block. And if you look at the evidence, we know that counseling is essential for all patients, both post-pubertal and pre-pubertal, who are receiving high dose or low dose alkylating agents or who are undergoing surgery. And probably also uh, in those who are not at risk uh, for infertility, but we could do fertility preservation if it is requested. Oocyte cryopreservation, uh, is done with high dose alkylating agents only if there is the cancer prognosis uh, is good and it does and it does not and is not uh, and probably there's no delay uh, in the treatment protocols. When we are using low dose alkylating, only it is done only for those patients who are at high risk of cancer recurrence and in patients wherein you are doing a unilateral oophorectomy probably we have to do it in those patients who are at a higher risk of cancer recurrence, whereas for other treatments uh, who are not at risk, only if the patient desires. Ovarian tissue cryopreservation is required in all those who are subjected to high-dose alkylating agents, whereas those who are undergoing unilateral oophorectomy or other treatments or who are uh, taking drugs which are uh, which do not have a risk of, fertil uh, of, of risk to fertility, uh, they are not recommended. Ufuropexy again is recommended for radiotherapy to ovaries uh, and hormone suppression is not recommended uh, and can be formulated. And basically, uh, there are no recommendations that are formulated, but probably it depends upon your experience and for what type and depending upon the uh, type of cancer she has. Coming to fertility preservation and adolescent boys, we know that sperm crowd preservation after masturbation is the most established and effective method of fertility preservation in male adolescent. And sperms are found in about 50% of the boys by the age of 14 years. And when the testicular volume is between eight, to, uh, eight and 15 ml, and as considered when testicular volume is, uh, and should be considered when the testicular volume is about 10 to 12 ml. Sperm preservation after testicular aspiration or extraction, mass aspiration or MISA, electroejaculation or retrieve from the post masturbation urine sample is also possible. Uh, and the sperms uh, should be preferably collected before initiation of the cancer therapy, and the pregnancy rate and live birth rate range from 20 to 72%. Pregnancies were reported even with sperms that were stored for up to 28 years. Sperm collection after rectal. Uh, electroejaculation under anesthesia and the testicular sperm extraction have also been successful, though there have been only case report or small case series. 
Three live births were reported after ICSI with testicular sperm extraction in adolescent boys. Mature sperm, uh, sperm spermatogonia and spermatogonial germ cells were observed after dissection of the testicular tissue, and these could be cryopreserved. There's no significant effect of hormonal gonadal protection noted during chemotherapy in reducing the risk of infertility. And here you can clearly see that boys uh, between the age of 14 and 18 years have a similar uh, sperm quality as uh, compared to the adults. And if you look at the pre and post treatment uh, azospermia uh, and the testicular sperm extraction, you can see that uh, basically, the, there has been almost a 50% success rate in sperm retrieval and about 42% live birth rates have been reported. Coming to prepubertal boys, we know that sperm cryopreservation is not possible and testicular tissue cryopreservation is the only option and the approach to restore subsequent fertility is dependent on the preservation of the germ cells with the stem cells function within the cryopreserved tissue. And this testicular tissue uh, after cryopreservation, either we can do an autotransplantation or a xenotransplantation. We could also go in for in vitro maturation of the testicular tissue or stem cells, and we can do a germ cell transplant. Uh, look, looking at the evidence for testicular tissue, animal studies suggest that immature testicular tissue cryopreservation with autotransplantation, xenotransplantation, and in vitro maturation resulted in long term survival of the transplants and complete differentiation of immature germ cells into spermatozoa. Tissue collection must be well timed in order to minimize the impact of the disease uh, or the treatment on the spermatogonial population. Human testicular tissue cryopreservation has been reported all over the world and ongoing clinical trials are being conducted to address the issue of fertility preservation in pre-pubertal boys. Uh, this was a paper which was published in 2019, uh, wherein uh, they have had success with autologous grafting of cryopreserved prepubertal uh, research testes, uh, and it produced uh, sperms as well as offsprings. And if you look at the technique to restore uh, uh, fertility preservation after testicular biopsy uh, in those testes which have been con uh, contaminated, you have a uh, option of in vitro sperm generation, uh, but there lack, there's a lot of lack of markers to isolate the pure spermatogonal stem cells and also poor survival and differentiation of these cells has been observed. You can do an explant testicular tissue culture and the new thing which has come is the uh, is or, uh, use of organoids, but uh, it has resulted in incomplete spermatogenesis in rats and there has been no data for humans, though uh, Several experiments are going on. So when we talk about in vitro culture, it has resulted in full mammalian spermatogenesis in the mice. And in the humans, basically, they have tried, uh, wherein uh, they have cultured uh, these uh, tissues for about 10 days, and they have seen formation of uh, few sperms. And this then has been cryopreserved. And it has been shown that if you add uh, anti-apoptotic components to the cryopreservation media, it enhances the spermatogonal survival. Coming to testicular organoids, uh, it has been seen that 3D support, uh, support given by the cellular aggregates was, uh, was observed when newborn and juvenile uh, rat testicular cells were cultured in rotation and allowed to form seminiferous tubule-like structures. Uh, formation of organotapic testicular organoids in the microwell culture with a consistent testis specific architecture was also seen in pig, mouse, and primate cells, uh, which support cell type specific functions. In humans, a uh, first trimester human gonadal tissue fragment cells were cultured in vitro, having functional capability of producing hormones, which are known to play a major role in normal gonadal development. And when this media on the gonad culture, uh, it uh, was uh, examined, it showed strong positive correlation between AMH and NABNB levels, which are statistically significant, as well as the testosterone AMH and NABNB. And this also uh, was statistically significant. There was another paper in 2017, which looked at uh, preserved semi-threads to build integrity with spermatogonial uh, survival and induction of sertoli and cell maturation. 
after a long time organite culture of prepubertal human testicular uh, tissue and uh, uh, and this tissue showed preservation of the spermatogonia uh, of the uh, spermato uh, of this form of uh, seminiferous vestibule integrity showing paracrine interaction intratubular proliferation and survival of the spermatogonial cells for up to 139 days of culture with progression to uh, spermatogonial stem cells as well as leddic cells as and certainly cells to a mature stage uh, but this is still experimental and we need to have further evidence for using these techniques there was another paper in 2018 that looked at the haploid germ cell generation in organite culture of testicular tissue for prepubertal boys. And uh, it concluded that this uh, represents a relevant milestone in the field of fertility preservation for prepubertal boys. And the differentiation of the germ cells up to a postmeotic stage noted, was noted when slow uh, frozen thought prepubertal testicular tissue from patients of different ages were cultured. The spermatogonia were maintained over the whole culture period. AMS secretion in the supernatal showed a significant progressive decrease during the culture period, and this was statistically significant. There was no variation in the androgen receptors seen per seminiferous tubules, and there was also no statistically significant variation in the number of SOX9 positive cells per, uh, per Sertoli cells. On a histological assessment, differentiating germ cells corresponding to the spermatocyte and spermatids were also seen. Uh, there was another paper in 2017 which looked at three dimensional testicular organite uh, in human spermatogenesis. And uh, it showed that uh, it mimics uh, in vivo spermatogenesis by supporting the differentiation of the spermatogonal stem cells to the post meiotic germ cells. Uh, this was another paper in 2017 in the stem cell reports, uh, which looked at the primary human testicular cell, uh, cell self-organized into organite and testicular tissue. And what they concluded was that primary human testicular cells are able to self-organize into human testicular organites, uh, which harbor spermatogonia and their, and their important initials, which retain specific functionalities during long-term culture. Uh, there was another paper which was published in 2009, which looked at spermatogonal stem cell transplantation uh, in vitro propagation uh, in prepubertal boys who had prosthetic cancer, uh, wherein they had done a subculture of the germline stem cell clusters. But the risk of uh, the spermatogonal stem cell propagation is tumor cell remaining in the testicular biopsy, spontaneous formation of ES-like colonies, and also epigenetic alterations in the spermatogonal stem cells with genetic mutation, histone cell modification, and DNA methylation changes. But probably there is some future for the spermatogonal stem cell propagation, uh, and we could develop sperms and perform an ART, which can result in a healthy offspring. Uh, there are a lot of ethical questions which are raised on non-spermatogonial uh, stem cell-based fertility preservation in boys, wherein skin biopsies are used with the production of a healthy offspring. Uh, but again, uh, we have to we have a long way to go to use this technique. And if you look at the evidence for fertility preservation in prepubertal and pubertal uh, adolescent, uh, counseling is, is essential in all patients subjected to uh, chemotherapy, radio, uh, cranial radiotherapy, and other treatment groups. Sperm cow preservation is possible in pubertal and post-pubertal, both with high and low risk uh, population, as well as those given cranial radiotherapy, but it's not possible in prepubertal boys. Sperm cryopreservation using uh, electroejaculation and TSA again is possible in all the groups, and testicular cryopreservation can be done in both prepubertal as well as postpubertal, those having a high risk of fertility after chemotherapy, but is not recommended in those who are subjected to low dose, uh, uh, low risk uh, chemotherapeutic agents with cranial radiotherapy and other treatment groups, whereas hormonal. Uh, suppression is not at all uh, recommended in this group of patients. 
So I would like to end by saying that we should have an established and streamlined referral pathway with cancer diagnosis wherein the oncology consultant has a treatment uh, plan in place. And if there is risk of infertility, refers the patient uh, to the uh, for fertility preservation. And after seeing the fertility preservation consultant, we could either go ahead with the fertility preservation procedure uh, and then start cancer therapy, or uh, we could probably just go in for an expected management if the risk is low and start cancer treatment. And a proper ideal referral form should be used when we do. Counseling and information are important to increase the knowledge, the satisfaction, as well as helpful in decision making and also help in decreasing the decisional con uh, conflict as well as the regret if fertility preservation is not done in this group of patients. So I would like to conclude by saying that pubertal boys have an option of sperm crowd preservation and pubertal girls have an option of oocyte as well as ovarian tissue crowd preservation. In pre-pubertal girls and boys crowd preservation of the ovarian and testicular tissue is the only available option to preserve fertility as they do not produce mature gametes. Cryopreservation preservation of ovarian tissue has proven clinically valid in terms of fertility restoration, whereas that of testicular tissue has not yet reached the stage of clinical applications and human testicular xenografting can also be an option. But in vitro spermatogenesis and production of hormones has been achieved in humans and in vitro re-engineering of the human testicular microenvironment from primary cells during 3D cell cultures has shown uh, shown to achieve spermatogenesis in vitro. The potential benefit of oophorapexy before radiotherapy probably outweighs the potential harms in preventing premature ovarian insufficiency. Hormone suppression with the use of GnRH analog for fertility preservation uh, requires uh, a few resources and is feasible to implement to prevent loss of ovarian function. Fertility preservation in children and adolescent malignancies is complex but is essential. And the shift in treatment focus from childhood cancer patients from potential survival alone to the inclusion of fertility preservation is a reflection of advances in medical therapy. Research protocols are in place for developing methods for fertility preservation, especially for the pediatric population. The fertility preservation techniques continue to advance the opportunities for children and adolescents to have a reproductive potential for the future. And I thank you all for a patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Madhuri, for that uh, very, very lucid presentation on uh, what we can do actually for uh, fertility preservation in adolescent and uh, childhood cancers patients. And uh, you have very, very beautifully shown us uh, the whole uh, journey from where we started and where we are now. And we are looking uh, forward that uh, there would be a day when we will be able to realize the dream of many uh, adult adolescent uh, cancer patients by doing a successful uh, ovarian tissue cryopreservation and testicular uh, tissue cryopreservation and regrafting. And uh, it has uh, not only given a new dream to a lot of youngsters in the hall, and, and many who have joined uh, on the hybrid mode that uh, we have to go miles before we sleep. A lot more work needs to be done. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Nita, for giving me the opportunity to be chairperson. Uh, Dr. Uh, Madhuri, ma'am, I know her uh, quite few years. She's been doing a lot of work and she was in Jipmar in 2017 to sensitize regarding fertility preservation. We had a nice CME, but what was uh, uh, lacking is the support which you had such a beautiful uh, inauguration session where your director and the chief guest has supported you so much. And uh, I'm sure that you will take forward to establish these fertility preservation facilities, especially and a public private partnership where even if you have ovarian tissue is de uh, done in a private setup because it needs long-term uh, uh, storage 
uh, institutes like AIMS, DIPMA, and uh, Chandigarh should offer a free storage. And as uh, Dr. Pai said, we should form a consortium, Fertility Preservation Consortium. I tried forming Fertility Preservation Board in Jipmar after uh, the CME, which uh, Dr. Madhuri Patel uh, came and did. But what was lacking is the cooperation of the other departments like pediatrics and uh, oncology, especially medical oncology, because most of these pediatric adolescents are in, uh, taken care by medical oncology department. We don't have a separate uh, pediatric medical oncologists. We did a study on awareness 2019 and 20. 90% of these adolescents and young adults are aware of the cancer, aware of the survival, but they were not aware, only 20% are aware of that, uh, you know, fertility can be preserved after treatment, after survival, and uh, they get the news, some of the educated from the media. So we should take the help of the media also in taking forward uh, this uh, noble uh, work. Thank you, Ella. Thanks a lot. Thank you, esteemed speaker and chairpersons for the great session. Uh, we move on to the next uh, session, which is the pre-lunch session. And for this, I invite a respected uh, panel of chairpersons, Dr. Nali Mahajan, ma'am, ma'am is clinical director, Maternal and Child Health Hospital, Delhi, and founder president of Fertility Preservation Society of India. Dr. Sadna Patwardhan, ma'am is a director, Nagpur Test Tube Baby Center and Dr. Ketkar Hospital, Nagpur. Uh, Ma'am, Dr. Tanya Bakshi. Uh, she is an internationally trained consultant and has helped set up the Onco Fertility Program for Cancer Survivors at the Max Hospital, India. Uh, professor Anju Agarwal. Ma'am is Professor, King George Medical University, Lucknow. I request Dr. Tanya Bakshi, Ma'am, to introduce the speaker. A very good afternoon to all. I would like to first start by thanking Professor Nita Ma'am for this wonderful session and gathering such an incredible amount of students and variety of international speakers. So I shall move on and we will start by a yet another very exciting session by Professor Anderson. He is the scientific director of Laboratory of Reproductive Biology, University Hospital of Copenhagen, Denmark, professor of human reproductive physiology within the Faculty of Health and Medical Sciences at the University of Copenhagen. He was a member of the team that introduced IVF to Denmark in the mid 1980s. He is a senior accredited ESHRE embryologist and has worked as a consultant with more than 10 fertility clinics nationally and internationally. Over the last 15 years, he has headed a national program of cryopreservation of human ovarian and testicular tissue, which is approved by the Danish authorities. He's considered one of the pioneers in this field and continues to expand the indications for the use of ovarian tissue cryopreservation in different clinical settings. His major research contributions has been in ovarian endocrinology, oocyte maturation, cryopreservation of gonadal tissue, human embryonic stem cells, and the development of new principles for ovarian stimulation, including the introduction of the agonist trigger and novel approaches to luteal phase support. We will now hear him talk about gamete collection in prepubertal children and adolescents, bench to bent bedside, oocyte and ovarian cryopreservation. Professor Anderson, such a pleasure to have you here. Please unmute. Kindly unmute, sir. So, yes, hello. I need you to allow me to share my screen. I'm unable to share my you screen. You can do please. that, sir. No, I cannot. Just a moment.
Could you try again, Prof? Yes, now it may be better. Let me just see here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, you just yes. select, sir, PPT file. Mm, I, I just need. Uh, you just select your PPT file in below, sir. Yes. Yeah. So if you could just select the PPT file, which is at the bottom of the screen. It means uh, it's, it's do not, I don't see that. Let me. Just at the bottom. At the bottom, I do. Yes, sir, yes. So yes. Do you see it now? That. Yes. You just you make it full screen, sir. You just make it. Okay. Is that all right? That's perfect. Thank you. That's perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for this invitation to talk to you about the special thing uh, on fertility preservation in children. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about how oversight and ovarian tissue prior preservation can be performed in children. This is a very special case because children's ovaries are very different from adult ovaries. Uh, and I would like to point out to you what you need to take into consideration when you're doing this. What you see here, on my first slide is actually a, an ovary from a four-year-old uh, girl. And you can see that this is now a millimeter paper below. So the ovary is actually very little. On the other hand, it's stuffed with follicles and you need to take this into consideration. So what I want to do today is to talk to you about the technical aspects of what we are doing when we freeze, uh, especially ovarian tissue from children, because this is indeed different than we do when we are looking at adult women. So you need to take into consideration that this is now very small ovaries and they are, uh, the constitution of follicles inside the ovary is different. Then we have done quite a lot of children in Denmark. I would like to uh, discuss the cohort of children that we are having in Denmark. And then the interesting thing, of course, is what happens if you transplant back uh, an ovarian, ovarian tissue, which were not active, which hasn't matured sufficiently in the, in the girl or woman to be active when you retrieve it. Does it work when you put it back? And often these uh, young girls that we do it with, they, they may have a cancer, but they may also have rare genetic diseases where the issue is not alone that they have fewer follicles, but they also have a disease. I want to touch upon that as well. So of course it is a, uh, it is a delicate matter to take prepubertal girls ovaries uh, because uh, there is a risk that uh, she will lose her fertility due to the disease or the genetic conditions that she has. On the other hand, and, and we have to balance this against that we are having an invasive procedure where we are taking out an ovary. And in many instances, we actually don't know whether the tissue is able to provide fertility when the uh, girl grows up and have a desire to have children, especially in some of the, these rare genetic diseases. And this is the dilemma I think we have, and I think we need to balance out the different uh, issues at stake here. And this is what I would like to touch upon today. So what other options do we have available? Uh, in adult women, we may want to use a DNA agonist to downregulate the pituitary, so we have no FSH, no uh, follicular recruitment. Uh, we cannot do that in prepubertal girls because the uh, recruitment of follicles is not that high. Or for preg C, we can do that, uh, but it's, it's not um, always coming out the way we want. Cryopreservation of oocytes and cryopreservation of embryos. This, I'm actually, although my title indicates that I should talk about that, I'm not going to talk much about that because all the information we have available is that there is very few oocytes and they are very 
less likely to reach measure phase two once we have done IVM to them, as long as they are coming from uh, young children. So this is really not a, a clinical option. It's not that you are unable to get any measure phase two oocytes. It just doesn't happen very often. And often, if you try to do it, it turns out that you're ending up with one or two measure phase two oocytes. And is this really now uh, something that this girl is going to hope for in the future? I don't really think so. But freezing ovarian tissue we can do, especially because the ovarian tissue contains a lot of follicles. Let's just have a look at the activity that we are doing in Denmark. You can see here that this is now uh, all our patient cohort divided into age. And the first group is from zero to five years and then all the way up to 35 and 40 years. You can actually see that we have quite a lot of girls who are less than five years old. The youngest one we have done is three months old. And if you take the young girls and adolescent girls up to the age of 15, you can see at the bottom that they make up 194 cases. So this is 14% of our entire cohort. So basically one in seven of the patients treated in Denmark is a very young girl. So it is, it is indeed a very significant group. And this is a group where you, this is the only option they have available in practical terms is freezing of ovarian tissue, at least in my opinion. And here you can see the age uh, distribution from zero to three, three to six. So certainly it is, especially uh, patients with, uh, who are in, in the higher group, uh, which are now having these options offered. And uh, I think it's also interesting just to have a look at the different diagnoses in these young girls. And as, as you see, then the, uh, in the early years, leukemia, sarcoma, and uh, genetic diseases are prevalent diagnoses, whereas when they grow a little older, the sarcoma uh, and, and genetic diseases, um, and leukemia for that matter, also contribute to the diagnosis. But I guess that if we look at the different diagnoses that we use for freezing of the children, they quite closely reflect these distributions. So it is, uh, uh, it, it, this uh, of course reflects that the, the treatment they're receiving are highly gonadotoxic. I think that we get an idea of what we're talking about when we're looking at histological sections. This is a histological section of a human ovary just three months old. If, if you can follow my uh, arrow on the screen, you can see that here we have an enormous amount of small primordial follicles, all resting follicles. So the ovary small in size, but stuffed with follicles. This is even more pronounced in this picture here, which is a histological section from a two-year-old uh, ovary. You can see that all the way out to the cortex and all the way in through the medulla, you have tightly packed uh, follicles. So this is, of course, something we have to take into consideration when we are preparing the tissue, because in these very young girls, there's hardly any medulla, and we do not need to take out, we should not take out, any tissue from this ovary. So what we normally do is that we would cut it into a sausage-like slice so that we get very thin slices of one millimeter and then take the whole ovary and freeze. This is a picture of a seven-year-old girl's ovary where, which has been stained with GDF9 antibodies and all the, the brown dots here represent primordial follicles. And here you can see in this particular case that there is not, it's not one millimeter outer surface where the follicles are located, but there is a medulla. So depending on the age, depending on the form of the ovary, we will need to decide how exactly we are preparing it. And if we look at the density of follicles, you, you, you can see here, this is a log scale. So the, the younger the ovaries are, the more follicles they contain, and they are basically stuffed the follicles in the young years. This is not surprising, but it do have an impact on how we prepare the tissue. This is a study at uh, Tom Kelsey they have done in, in, uh, in, uh, in Edinburgh, where we have the ovarian volume here and uh, the age here, and this is uh, our cohort, so there's a lot more in Tom's cohort and but you can see that the ovaries in the young years are very small one milliliter two milliliters they're not very big 
and then they peak in, in uh, maybe at 19 or 20 years of age. So this, of course, has a, an impact on how we should do it. I think that if you look at this, you will you can see that the ovarian volume is very different in relation to years. I'm sorry. Uh, is there somebody who could please mute? I'm speaking now. Shit. Okay. Uh, you can see here uh, the small ovary. This is hardly more than one centimeter long, and then they grow over the years and become almost a normal size and ten years. In this particular examples, and of course, in in an ovary like this, we wouldn't take out any medulla tissue. Here, we probably don't need to take out a lot of medulla tissue, but here in the older ones, we we may. This is just to let you know how different in size of the same age that uh, ovaries may be. So they, these are between six and seven years old, and you see that they are very different in size. And we wouldn't prepare this ovarian tissue in a way, similar way, depending on which one it is. This one, we would probably freeze all the tissue, whereas this one is likely to have some medulla tissue. We would have a look at this when we cut the ovary into half and decide how we would like to prepare it. So this is how we do it normally in the adult tissue. We have a, an, an adult ovary where we preserve, the, we isolate the cortex, small pieces, freeze them, and then we can transplant them one by one. This is a video of how we prepare a three-year-old ovary. Now let's hope that this will work. It does, beautiful, that's very nice. You can see that we have now free hands in the uh, flow bench. So we are actually free of us helping two of us helping one another to prepare the ovary. So we're now slowly just cutting this ovary into half. Um, it was, this is just a, a very small ovary. There's, this is only one and a half milliliter in size. And then we would just very briefly remove some, ovarian, uh, some medulla tissue here. You can see that this is how it looks when we have prepared it, hardly any uh, medulla tissue is taken out. They are thicker, but they, they, these are thin enough to be cryopreserved individually. And then we will just um, cut them into pieces. When we have children's ovaries, we normally make the pieces smaller because the follicular content is so much higher that we would have still have a lot of follicles in uh, the uh, ovary when we um, replace them. So this is just the rest of the, the uh, procedure. We don't need to have a look at that. So we have now actually for the first time started to have some experience in how to transplant this tissue. So this is a, um, a, a paper which came out in this, a journal of assisted reproduction and genetics just last year, where we are describing our experience with transplanting ovarian tissue from girls who were very young at the time of freezing. And then what happened when we transplanted this tissue? Does it actually work and how does it work? And here you can see that we have now in our cohort, six young girls. She, uh, the third one is maybe just about the age, but here's nine years, 9.3, 0.5, 12 and nine. So these are young girls and, it, and certainly, uh, except for her, they were all pre -pubers. And you can see the ovarian volume. This is what it is, age at the, when they returned for transplantation and the period that the tissue have been stored and the different diagnoses, the amount of tissue that we transplanted. And so you can see that the, the first one we did was this one, just 20%. And here we actually transplanted 67%. So we are now putting more tissue back. And the interesting part, of course, is how does this tissue respond once it's transplanted to these adult women? They have never seen circulating levels of FSA. So the interesting part, of course, was to see how does this prepubertal tissue now behave when you transplant it uh, in, uh, back to the adult woman? And actually, you can see the FSA to LH. They come back, there's a small bump here and there, but overall, after 20, 25 weeks, the tissue becomes active also when the tissue was pre when it was transplanted. So this is really good news and tells us that this tissue will respond to the endogenous levels of FSH and LH. And that's 
shows that it, it do work. Actually, this is the right hand uh, panel here at the bottom is AMH. We didn't have that on all of them because some are so old. We didn't measure AMH, but you can see that it, it corresponds to the fact that after 10, 15 weeks, the ovary becomes active and the follicles reach the size where they start to secrete AMH. So this actually fits quite nicely what we want. The difference in estradiol here over weeks is, is a little pronounced. So this is those which were adult when they were cryopreserved. So they take up estradiol faster. And this, uh, I, this is probably just reflecting that these follicles take a little more time to come up. They are coming up here. So uh, these are probably just having a little extra time to really produce estradiol in pre-ovulatory uh, levels. So we have had one successful woman who have had tissue transplanted when, she, when it was frozen, when she was uh, young, nine years old. And this is a, a picture, uh, this is a case we actually did published some years ago, and she had thalassemia, so a genetic disease. And I just want to point out that you probably in India are having a lot of these patients who may benefit from having their tissue cryopreserved, provided that they are going to have a bone marrow transplantation uh, in connection with treatment of their beta thalassemia. So this particular woman from, was from the United Arab Emirates. She suffered from thalassemia. She went to Leeds in the UK with Roger Gost and had her tissue frozen in 2001 when she was nine. She came to Denmark in 2015 to have her tissue. This was brought here. She had her tissue transplanted. And after that, she, removed, she returned to UK and had IVF treatment and gave birth to a child. The new and interesting thing is that this particular woman, based on what she had transplanted uh, originally, now not more than a year ago, had her second baby from the same transplant. So although this was transplanted in 2015, it is still working and still have provided her with an additional baby. So this is really good news. This is just to let you know how it looked. FSH yellow, um, LH pink and, and AMH red. And you can see that she had high levels here, no AMH, we transplant the tissue here, and then it do come up. And we have AMH coming up, we have a little fluctuation of FSH. This is normally what we see when we transplant the tissue. So these five pieces of tissue were transplanted here, and uh, this still works. So this is absolutely nice. So if we are having a look at the follicular density in women, in girls with thalassemia compared to age. You can see here, we have actually now collected uh, two types of um, uh, this, uh, diagnoses, thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, which are related. You can actually see that the gray ones are normal girls who don't have a genetic disease. They may have a cancer, but the 95% confidence interval is, is pretty huge. But most of these actually fall within so there's a very good reason to take and freeze these girls' ovaries before they receive bone marrow transplantation, if this is what they need. This is just to show you a picture from a girl who have thalassemia, the, old, the follicles look exactly as we would like them. Their morphology is very good. So, and this is now just confirming what we have seen. So the initial study we did in 2012, this is now indeed published a long time ago, but this was used to induce puberty in this particular girl who had her uh, tissue frozen when she was nine and she had it transplanted when she was 13. And you can see that FSH came down, came up here, actually came down later on and she had her puberty. So this was just used to induce puberty. And this is also what you may use the tissue for if this is very young girls. Uh, you, the argument, of course, is that if you use two pieces of tissue, if you have 10 pieces uh, frozen, she will still have 80% left, 80% of her one ovary. The number of follicles this corresponds to is far more than we, we, we freeze from women who are 25 years of age or, or, or older. So they still have a huge amount of follicles to help them. This is a study from Catherine Parot in France, who also transplanted a young girl to induce puberty and indeed saw that FSH fell and estradiol 
also increased. So she was also able to help this girl. So this is an indication which may be considered if you have sufficient tissue. So often these girls would be girls uh, with leukemia. So they would often end up having had treatment before they actually have the tissue cryopreserved. So we did a study in 2016 where we looked at those at the follicular density. So how much, how many follicles did these patients lose due to the uh, initial treatment before chemotherapy? So as you can see here, that the majority of those who had chemotherapy before we froze their ovary had leukemia. There's uh, other ones with Ewing sarcoma, Hodgkin, and other cancers. But indeed, this is majority of patients and as compared to what happens in this group where they did not have treatment. So if we look at their follicular density, so now this is follicles per cubic millimeter of ovarian cortex. You can see that the ones with uh, um, treatment before ovarian tissue freezing and those who did not are absolutely similar. So we are unable to see. So the induction cure that the, these uh, leukemic girls have in order to make them conditioned so that um, they don't have malignant cells circulating are not severely going into toxic. What we also had a look at was that we looked at the ovarian volume. And here you can see that those who did not have uh, chemo before tissue freezing had a higher volume than those who ha have had it. And as we are isolating just the cortex, this actually means that there should be fewer follicles in totally in those with smaller ovarian volume. So if you calculate that in relation to age, you can see that the estimated ovarian reserve after treatment, taking the volume into consideration, is 90% for two years, but it actually drops almost 30% in, in those which are most frequent, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 18 years of age. But I, I certainly do not think that the reduction in follicle numbers here do not justify that we offer them uh, tissue freezing. There's still a lot of follicles sitting in there and the 70% of follicles in one ovary from an 18 year old corresponds nicely to what a 25, 28 year old a woman would have. It's interesting now that, and this is mainly girls, that if we start to look at what has happened with leukemia, obviously this is the most difficult uh, diagnosis for us. And we have to be very cautious to see that we don't uh, introduce a relapse to these women. I actually just want to, to show you that we have now 15 patients who have had ovarian tissue uh, transplanted with a formal leukemic uh, diagnosis. And these are all the ones which has been published, as you can see them here. And a lot of them actually now have had children. Obviously, this is still a very delicate group to do it in and require a lot of prevention measures. But at least neither of these 15 women, there has been any reports of relapse. I'm, 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 I'm certainly aware of that this will be a biased, uh, information we will have. It, people may not want to tell us that they have reintroduced the leukemia, but up until now, there is a, a very cautious uh, approach to this. And I, I think that this is interesting. Uh, I just want to finish off by showing you that we have now looked at Turner syndrome patients where we do know that the follicles may disappear very early on. And is this because there's a genetic um, uh, mismatch with uh, one X chromosome too little, or is there something inherent wrong with these follicles? Here you can see that we have now looked at Turner uh, patient uh, in, in the same manner as we did previously with, uh, uh, with thalassemia and sickle cell anemia. They actually also included here, but the blue ones are now Turner syndrome patients. And you can see that if we look at them, a lot of these Turner syndrome patients, sorry for that, actually have follicular densities which are in the normal range, especially if they are mosaic uh, Turner syndrome patients. I know that this is also a delicate matter to say they're mosaic because what are they in their ovaries? But it do turn out that some of them actually have 
sufficient for number of followers, which is a very good starting point. We have now looked at Turner syndrome follicles, uh, their follicles and stained for different uh, important markers of follicular health, uh, AMH, DDF9, BMP15, IGF, BP4, PABE, and standard cancer uh, 2. And actually this is now the control and here's uh, three uh, Turner syndrome patients. And basically the follicles in many instances actually show a similar staining pattern. So it do turn out that at least from the expression pattern of these, um, these markers that the follicles often are okay. So I do think that the, there's a, an interest and we are now actually putting up a larger project in Denmark looking at the Turner syndrome patients. Will they benefit once they have the tissue transplanted? This is of course the difficult part. Um, but if we do not try it out, make informed consent from the patients, we will not have the experience. So I do think it's justified to go ahead. I, and if you <clears throat> finish off by an international consensus of if you asking young Turner patient syndrome, uh, they, <clears throat> they actually come out and say that they are very interested in this and the an expert panel is suggesting that this is now justified. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I, I think that this is something we'll hear a lot more about in the coming years. So finishing off with the conclusions, <clears throat> I think it's feasible feasible to freeze away tissue from children. It is justified, we can do it technically, and we do have surviving follicles which will be working once we transplant the tissue to now the adult woman. So this is very nice. I think genetic diseases like thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, certainly appear to benefit from freezing tissue if they're going through, um, uh, they're going through, uh, uh, chemotherapy to prepare them. And I think that Turner syndrome patients, they will still await a proof of concept. We have to see that this actually benefits these patients when we transplant it. And I, I guess that this will not take long before we actually have the first uh, experience. So I'll finish off with this and thank you for your, uh, uh, for listening to me. Uh -huh. Professor Claus, I think there is a standing ovation from all of us for this brilliant presentation. I want my all my students to get up and give him this. It was a wonderful, wonderful presentation and you have shown that we can do this. You have done it and we will definitely look forward that we are able to preserve the fertility in this young cancer survivors and are able to give them the joy of parenthood later. Excellent yeah. talk. Okay, thank you very Nita, much. Can I ask a question? Yes. Nita, can I ask yes, a question? Yes, 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 ma'am, you can. Uh, hi, Professor Claus. It was uh, wonderful hearing you after such a long time again. And uh, I just wanted to know, is there a concern, with, uh, obstetric concern for these Turner syndrome patients? We are transplanting, but we also know that they have a very serious, uh, they can have very serious issues, especially cardiac in, uh, if they yeah. become pregnant. So has, was that concern thought about when, you know, you were looking at freezing and then and transplanting? Of, 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 of course, you're right. We do know that Turner patient, uh, uh, Turner syndrome patients have difficulties having <clears throat> pregnancies. It's just difficult. That argument is difficult in Denmark. Here they are actually allowed to have oocyte donation. Mm -hmm. And I guess that the pregnancy will be of similar complications if you have oocyte donation than if you right. use your own tissue. And, and therefore it's difficult to say, oh, but you cannot have your tissue frozen because you may have difficulties with your pregnancy if they can go next door to the fertility clinic in a public healthcare sector here and say, could you please provide me with oocyte donation? Mm -hmm. And I think that this is the case so, in many yeah, European so... countries where we are saying, well, when we, let, let, let's, let's try and see if this now will provide them with their own, uh, with their own uh, biological children. Biological. Mm -hmm. Professor Claus, uh, I may ask you a question that most of these uh, women who went uh, for allografting or xenografting, where did you grafted the ovary, the, the frozen ovarian pieces which you had shown, uh, which uh, you yeah. regrafted? 
Yeah, no, that's that's um, that's also a very good question. I think that uh, we often in these uh, young, uh, the, the, the very young girls, <clears throat> their ovary uh, are, are very small. The one, the remaining, which the remaining one, which is sitting in there, which was experiencing chemotherapy when the child, when the when she was just a child. So often we would need to put this into peritoneal pockets because the remaining ovary is simply too small to harbor more than one or two pieces of tissue. We, we do, if, if it is possible, we often try to put them into the remaining ovary because this, I think that this <clears throat> will provide her with natural fertility and uh, is, is the place where the tissue basically should be positioned. But this is not possible, so we, we put them into peritoneal pocket most of the time. Would any of my co-chairs, Sadna ma'am, Anju ma'am, would you like to ask any question? Uh, actually... Thank you so much, Professor Claus. It has been such a wonderful presentation and you have really clarified uh, matters and we really look forward to looking to your results in the Turner syndrome patients. It is a very exciting research and we have really enjoyed the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. This is very good. There's one question, Prof, from the chat box. Uh, Dr. Prasant, what is the risk of contamination with malignant cells when you are retransplanting? And I think what everyone wants to know, do you retest or do you do any testing on the tissue before you retransplant? We, we don't do this when, it, when the diagnosis is breast cancer or Ewing sarcoma. We have a morbus Hodgkin. We don't do it because we have now a great experience and I have all the, the centers which are doing lots of transplantation do not see relapses from these diagnoses. The, the one where we are all very cautious, of course, is leukemia. And this is why I actually draw the results out for you so that you could see that now 15 patients have been transplanted. But here, with, whenever we are having a leukemic uh, diagnosis, this, we, we indeed do have cases in Denmark where we have said we do not dare to transplant tissue to you. But if we are unable, if, if we transplant it to a, a nude mouse for 20 weeks and the mouse is healthy, and we are unable to detect any genetic markers. I think, and I, I think you all should do, if you're freezing ovarian tissue from leukemic patients, make sure that you have an, a, a blood sample stored with the tissue, because it may be that you are unable to detect any, uh, any marker from this particular uh, woman where she has a genetic marker on her, um, leukemia, but there's all there's new markers coming up all the time, and when she returns and asks for transplantation, there may actually be a marker in the blood at the time when she had the tissue frozen, who which you now know and where you can look for this particular marker in the tissue, and if the marker is is absent, you actually now these uh, genetic methods are very sensitive. And if you are unable to see it in the tissue, this is where most people now, these 15 women, if, if you're unable to see that marker, although this was leukemia, you would say that the load is now so low that the risk of transplanting the tissue is uh, probably very, very small. So this is where it stands at the moment. I do think that leukemia and, and some other uh, diagnoses, rare diagnoses, you really have to be careful. But a lot of the most common ones, breast cancer, morbus Hodgkin, Ewing sarcoma, we have not seen relapses due to the ovarian tissue. Thank you. Just a last question, Prof. Um, what was the longest time period? I mean, you showed that when you've retransplanted in the lady where with thalassemia, it lasted quite a while, actually, the graft. What about the younger mm -hmm. girls? You know, you've done it in even the zero to five age group. You have a substantial number. What is the average that you're looking at that the graft usually survives? We haven't transplanted any girls who had their tissue frozen between zero and five years. This is simply because that we haven't done it for so long that those girls, they, are not, uh, they have not reached an age where they want to have children yet. So they, they, they are just storing liquid nitrogen. So I do think that the youngest we have done is nine years old. Thank you. 
but they, I, I'm sure that they will be coming because now time is running and the tissue that we froze now 15 years ago, they are slowly getting to an age where they may want to use their brain tissue. So I'm, I'm unable to ask, I'm unable to answer for the very young ones. That's true for one of the girls where the induction of puberty actually did take place. So I think that's again an increasing indication that we see um, that probably getting more data from these girls as well. Yeah, I think that's an interesting point that you raised and that probably gets us into the next question that I have for Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you esteemed speaker nice and thank you, esteemed speaker and the chairpersons. It was a very, very informative session. Now I call to invite the dignitaries and the delegates for uh, lunch. We will resume in 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank quick you. lunch. Super. See quick you all lunch. back very soon.
So I welcome everyone after lunch. So without undue delay, let's move to the next session. And for the same, I would like to invite our esteemed chairpersons, Dr. Firoza Parikh, uh, sir is Director, Department of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics in Jaslok Hospital. Ma'am, sorry. Dr. Firoza Parikh, um, apologies. So ma'am is uh, Director, Department of Assisted Reproduction and Genetics in Jaslok Hospital. Responsible for Southeast Asia's first XC baby love sing in 1994 and editor in chief fertility and sterility, Indian edition. Professor Samir Bakshi, sir. Sir is Professor, Department of Medical Oncology, Ames, New Delhi, with special interest in pediatric oncology. And Professor Sanjeeva Reddy, who is Professor and HOD of Department of Reproductive Medicine and Surgery, Sri Ramchandra Medical College. So now may I request Professor uh, Samir Bakshi, sir, to invite the speaker for the next session. Over to you, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to invite uh, Dr. Mohammad Faisal Ahmed from Malaysia to speak on sperm retrieval and cryopreservation in prepubertal children. Dr. Mohammad Faisal bin Ahmed is a clinical specialist and lecturer of OBGYN in the hospital can uh, <coughs> counselor Tonku Mukhriz University Hospital, and his special interest is reproductive endocrinology and oncofertility. Over to you, sir. <coughs> thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. So, um, the topic that we given to me is the sperm retrieval and cryopreservation in prepubertal children, as compared to our previous lecture, which is the ovarian as well as oocyte cryopreservation in children is more, more established. But here in this topic, we will discuss more on the experience and experiment method that had been established and what we are going from now. So the male gonad contains spermatogonial stem cells that is a foundation of spermatogenesis that leads to matured and fertilization competent spermatozoa. Germ cell loss can be induced by cytotoxic treatment, as we know, but it's also linked to hereditary conditions such as kidney filter syndrome and Falconi syndrome. Thus, fertility preservation is need to be advocated in this kind of cases. So as we know, the similar parameter in health adolescent and young adult is more or less is the same. However, the uh, numbers of the is less as well as the sperm mortality is also lesser. But we need to know that this um, adolescence uh, is a special population that need to be catered in this current situation of oncofertility in the special uh, population. So as we know that the effect of chemotherapy and rotherapy have a tremendous effect in the gonad, as well, especially at the seminiferous epithelium of the testes. As you know that if the high doses, if if used in radiotherapy or chemotherapy, they will actually lead to the uh, gonadotoxicity and also Leydig cells um, toxicity and lead to the rest of the spermatogonia process and lead to infertility in future. So as we know that the stems, uh, the uh, spermatogonia stem cell is the uh, most immature stem cell, and the second one is deficient spermatogonia. The deficient thing spermatogonia is the one that been uh, numerous in our special population in prepubertal, in which they have self renewal about twenty seven days, and the deficiency is according to the the schedule as well as the patient profile. However, this is very sad because this uh, kind of cell is extremely sensitive uh, to be killed by most anti cancer agent, and it not been um, repaired. Uh, in molecular level of the DNA uh, should it be exposed to the chemotherapy or radiotherapy. So we need to prevent this from happening in order to improve and, uh, and uh, preserve the fertility in future as compared to other uh, stages of the uh, sperma spermatogenesis, which is the spermatid, spermatid with testicular sperm and so as a matured sperm that is actually resistant to by uh, many of anti cancer depending on the uh, subtype as well as the moderacy and the severity of of the agent that use. So the impact of chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, surgery on the prepubertal gonad is very well established that radiation is depending on the dose and the fractionation schedule and the field of radiation. The prepubertal testes are more affected uh, by the treatment uh, than compared to the matured testes and radio sensitivity is much lower in lytic cell uh, than in the spermatogenic cell. If the children have the cranial irradiation of the brain tumor also it can actually help 
uh, essentially uh, lead to destruction of the hepatomic pituitary gonadal axis and lead to endocrine failure. As I mentioned earlier about the chemotherapy, it depends on the agent administration and cumulative dose that they receive, as well as the surgery. Most of our patients receive the surgery in pre uh, in order to uh, for testicular, testicular cancer. Uh, they lead to gonadotrophin deficiency that develop when hepatomas and pituitary gland damage by the surgery. The testicular cancer associated with impact in sperm parameter and it been further propagated if the patient need to underwent orchidectomy. Uh, on top of the normal surgery, they will do a retroperitoneal peritoneal um, procedure such as a uh, resection of retroperitoneal lymph node in the case of testicular cancer or sarcoma that can lead to infertility by damage nerve responsible and cause great indication in the patient in future when the patient is in puberty. So in the pre pubertal male patient, we already know that the sperm banking is uh, play an important role in, 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 in this fertility preservation. And it's important for us to initiate this prior to the chemotherapy. Even though the patient receives a small or low dose of gonadotoxin, it can affect the quality of, of, of that. That's why we need to make it, uh, make it clear that we need to do a sperm freezing prior to the chemotherapy. In the case where the failure of the patient to produce sample by masturbation, we can assist it with the penile vitreous stimulation or electro ejaculation under anesthesia as a second line option. However, our concern and our problem is more on pre pubertal male, as the challenge for fertility preservation uh, is they cannot produce a sperm and uh, thus they cannot do an established method with sperm cryopreservation. The germ cell of pre pubertal testes, um, including the Spepanogonia stem cell, uh, do, do not have any mature Spepanogonia, thus we have some sort of like problem. So should we cryopreserve this? Testicular tissue because we currently have no idea what we can uh, offer to them in future. Uh, although we know that fertility preservation in puberty is still in, in infancy, but we know that it's progressing in this field. And we need to balance the biologically, biologically clinically, and te technical knowledge in order to improve the outcome, as well as to cater the ethical and legal question to enhance the awareness among the parents and our colleagues, oncologists. So, what we have now for fertility preservation in boy. We have sperm prism, which is established if the patient can able to produce a sperm. We have spermagonia stem cell with the SC transplantation, testicular uh, tissue grafting, as well as in vitro spermatogenesis. So this is the cartoon that actually highlighted the, um, the option that we have for the fertility preservation in, in young boy with no sperm retrieval. We can do a testicular biopsy and we can do the isolation of the single cell or uh, spermatogenesis Gonia uh, stem cell propagation, and we can actually um, inject this into the Ledic cell and uh, achieve the maturation later. Or we can just do a grafting on, uh, which is the uh, grafting onto the um, previous um, scrotum and actually achieve this membrane from there. Or we can actually put it in the 2D or 3D culture to improve the in vitro uh, spermatogenesis, then lead to a mature sperm and use it uh, with ICSI and um, help the patient to get the baby. But which one is more superior, which one is available, then we can answer it uh, along the way with this lecture. So the first one is uh, spermatogonial uh, stem cell propagation and autotransplant. This in vitro propagation of the SSC followed by autotransplant in the seminiferous tubule via retinal testes is considered the only method uh, available for restoration of fertility to aim for natural conception. In this, in, in this um, method, what we do is we actually um, isolate the, the spermatogonia stem cell from the testicular tissue that we did, we, that we biopsy and, um, and propagate this, uh, this uh, stem cell to make it mature. Uh, when the stem cell already mature and good enough to be uh, injected into the, um, into the uh, retinal testes of the patient, and once the patient has already completed the chemotherapy, and we can actually allow the patient to have their own baby via intercourse. So this is tremendously excellent, uh, uh, theoretically, whereby it can actually help in, in, in sense of achieving pregnancy naturally. 
uh, some of the SEC can also be uh, matured spermatogenesis uh, via the in vitro spermatogenesis using 2D or 3D culture, as well as the organ culture model and uh, and harvest the mature oocyte and we proceed with ICSI and uh, and and actually offer the patient the fertility treatment via ART. However, uh, what what is the main concern of this is we didn't know whether the residual or the um, malignant cell is actually present uh, in the stem cell, does lead to the contamination of the uh, of the um, of the the uh, gamete as well as uh, re re remission of the uh, re reoccurrence of the cancer in future. Therefore, one of the things that we also need to know is when the patient already receives some chemotherapy or they have some uh, DNA problem, they can actually have this uh, genetic mutation on top of this propagation and lead to the uh, inherited of the disease in future. So some of the um, spermato, um, uh, stem cell also fail to complete meiosis and arrest uh, during the uh, inject injection uh, as well as lead to the infertility. So um, we have one uh, landmark study that actually uh, helped to uh, answer the question whether the stem cell stem stem cell is is um, achievable uh, or not for the pregnancy so they have been uh, established by Brian Herman in 2020, 2012 whereby they they have um, a successful uh, um, embryo that produced by the mature sperm uh, following the spermatol gonial stem cell transplantation into the rectal testes uh, of the rat uh, you can see here the testes and the rectal testes of the needle to the ST and they, they actually do some sort of IHC and gene, gene expression to see the maturation of the of the sperm sperm as well as they collected 85 of um of the oocyte and in and do an XC for them. 81 oocyte actually produce a, a good um, embryo ranging for four cell to blastocyst. And you can see here in my left uh, right hand side there is a good uh, uh, embryo development up to blastocyst day seven and hatching. Uh, but they didn't actually um, proceed to a pregnancy to, to see whether there, there is a production of any offspring. But what is the pitfall of this method? It's very complex. When you want to translate this uh, technique um, into the human tissue, they need to sort out for a selected marker uh, to determine uh, the migration of the SSNH into the seminiferous membrane after the human transplantation. And it's very complex to monitor whether the, uh, the um, uh, SSC have been matured or not. So there's multiple uh, complex marker that have been uh, undergoing evaluation for now in order to improve uh, this technique to be implemented in, 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 in human. In, in terms of epigenetic aspect, uh, they also concern about the stability and the safety when we do a propagate of SSC. Uh, noted there is some sort of, um, uh, of uh, contamination and also uh, increased risk of uh, malignant, transform malignant transformation following uh, the animal model and also the introduction of cancer cell, especially in non solid tumors such as leukemia or blood metastasis tumor. So it's still being um, debated as well as being evaluated in order to. Uh, translate into the uh, human um, human aspect to make it uh, better for human study later in future. Uh, the second thing is testicular tissue autografting. The testicular tissue autografting is the transplantation of the fragment of testicular tissue, which provide alternative strategy to be to to us to use uh, rather to use the SSC suspension as before. So in this technique, they will maintain the SSC within the an exposed natural niche and preserve the interaction between the germ cell and the supporting somatic cell so that there's no arrested or mitosis and there will be a lot of uh, improvement in terms of nutrition and support. However, we need to exclude malignancy by assessment of the minimal residual disease from whatever method such as flow cytometry or gene expression. And at, up to now, there's no established protocol of testicular tissue freezing, whether you want to use flow freezing, vitrification, and what type of media for cryoprotectant that you want to use is depending on your center and your center experience. So this is uh, how uh, they propose for the testicular tissue freezing, whereby they will do a, a direct uh, testicular biopsy and cut into the pieces and put into the cryoprotectant as preferred by the center and do a method of cryopreservation depending on vitrification or slow freezing because it's both are uh, co considered equivalent and they will thaw the tissue letter for future use. So the um, graph 
crafting of the tall tissue has been uh, debated whether it's atopic or homotopic uh, location. Initially, in animal model, they, they actually do a lot of um, different sites such as peritoneal space, ear, under the back of skin, and, and so forth and so on. But when, when we noted that from the beginning of the uh, fundamental aspect of this crafting, they noted that higher temperature of the atopic site compared to the scrotum uh, lead to the metotic arrested and also um, altered the spermatogenesis. Therefore, they suggested that wherever we take out from the scrotum should go into the scrotum again. And they noted that there is a very good um, uh, promotion of spermatogenesis when you put it in the scrotum due to the temperature. Um, then they subsequently they proposed that this is the best place for you to do the um, auto transplantation of the grafting. So um, the, they had proven from the mice model that this um, um, testicular tissue cryopreservation have able to produce an offspring uh, from the Japanese team Tetsuhiro Yukanishi in 2014. They have done this uh, testicular tissue cryopreservation using both method, vitrification and also slow freezing. And they noted that the different kind of cryoprotectant affect uh, the uh, outcome of testicular tissue grafting survival rate as compared to the method of uh, freezing and they managed to actually produce and good uh, good uh, evidence of offspring from uh, the mice subsequently um, the same the same uh, country have proposed the 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 testicular tissue to a non human primate which is a monkey and uh, using the similar uh, method uh, which is um, which is uh, cryopreservation of the testicular tissue and grafting work is, was done in the in the uh, scrotum area and they harvest back the sperm uh, about about uh, seven to three uh, five years later and on 2017 uh, the first graft derived sperm was used and uh, following the ICSI and they noted there is a formation a good uh, blastosis and uh, implant into the surrogate uh, monkey. And in, four, in 16 April 2018, Gardi, the monkey, is born to actually have this most landmark um, uh, so-called image of the testicular tissue cryopreservation that can actually give us some idea that uh, this technique can be used. So this is the, the, the so-called um, bloom um, uh, so-called a landmark study for us now to consider this testicular tissue freezing as one of the ocean. Uh, however, up to now, uh, what is the progress in human? They already done in pig, cattle, goat, sheep, horse, cat, and also uh, monkey, but there's none in adult human because when you transplant the um, testicular tissue pre-pubertal uh, to to apa to to the um um uh, xenografting, you can see that um there's uh, arrested of spermatogenesis. So we still in the puzzle of. Uh, coming to uh, to uh, produce a good media, good technique, what type of cryopotetan and the percentage of each of the media in order to improve the spermatogenesis uh, in, in human tissue. So uh, last but not least, the in vitro defin definition of the male germ cell. This, this is the third technique that been postulated for our for uh, fertility per, uh, preservation among boys, that in vitro generated sperm for fertility restoration have been shown good result in adult azoosperm patient. Uh, they, they, they took this adult um, uh, stem cell and the, they proposed it in vitro maturation and it's differentiated into the primary spermatocyte to half blood cell and it been observed at 48 hours. And this half blood cell have been reported become functional and they result in birth. Uh, with XC. So this is the um, group of Tesarik in 2017, uh, sorry, 1999, more back then, more about 20 years ago. They already uh, proposed that the, the restoration of the spermatogenesis can be achieved via in vitro maturation of the uh, stem cell. So when they proposed for a stem cell uh, maturation of spermatogenesis, in vitro, they come up with these five participants, and all these participants have DNA good DNA content. And uh, after a while of uh, culture, they noted that there is a good um, sperm uh, that spermatic states that can be uh, used for fertilization, and they inject into the um, uh, oocyte, Twelve of these uh, this this uh, person, and six for this 
person and we can see the following then, they can see the cleavage of good embryo at the six and one pregnancy was achieved between uh, as outcome as uh, in, in this study. Um, so this actually gives us an idea that we can actually do this uh, for our boys. However, uh, in, 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 in pre-pubertal uh, field, the first testicular pre-pubertal rat was performed early in 1964 and they, not, they put this thin layer of argos as a promotion to stimulate the culture between medium and air and they think that this method can actually improve the part-time spermatogenesis um, stage in the testicular tissue and they noted that this new new technique that they have proposed in that era can help in improvement of the uh, improvement of the spermatogenesis. However, up to now, um, they noted that the work have shown that this um, problem with this, uh, they can actually achieve a good spermatocyte, but the, the, in the human tissue, they cannot actually produce a complete uh, spermatogenesis. They might have some sort of like spermatid or some sort of like round, round sperm, but they cannot have a complete spermatogenesis from the human tissue. So this is one of the example of uh, the higher achievement of this technique uh, using the in vitro differentiation of the red spermatogonia that been, uh, been uh, promoted to develop into a round spermatic in tissue culture. You can see that here they, they, they use a pre pubertal tissue. We have uh, only round semi nephrous tubule and after uh, the promotion of the in vitro maturation, spermatogenesis, you can see from the round tissue, it can actually cover uh, uh, in vitro the uh, spermata, uh, spermatocyte as well as the round sperm. So in conclusion from this radar at all in 2016, uh, they said that there is a successful of in vitro differentiation in pre-pubertal pre uh, pre tissue from undifferentiated into a complex and differentiated um, uh, complete uh, spermatogenesis been achieved, but they cannot actually prove to us that they have this complete spermatogenesis that can actually function. Therefore, they have no production of offspring yet uh, up to now from this method. So um, they much, then they conclude that they also try to escalate this into the human tissue, but this very much different in physiology and they can still arrest um, the spermatogenesis at the earliest stage if they use the human tissue. So up to now, there's no conclusion whether we can use this or not. So the only thing that we can actually achieve now is um, based on the testicular tissue freezing. So how about our experience or my experience with my team in Japan, actually we when, we, when I, uh, been invited back to Japan to continue my fellowship on co fertility. We already established the ovarian tissue in Asia under the Asian Society of Fertility Preservation. Uh, and in Japan, it's like tremendously working well. So, Professor Suzuki, which is my mentor in St. Marina University of Medicine, um, Kanagawa, uh, Tokyo, Japan, has, in, has initiated uh, a testicular tissue cry preservation. So, we actually try to, um, to mimic the, the process of testicular tissue cry preservation in order to ensure that the vitrification that we will use now as compared to slow freezing has a good um, uh, promotion for a towing letter for spermatogenesis. So we use this um, five days, uh, days post-pubertal mice, uh, then I harvest the, the testes which is still uh, at the area of the uh, abdomen and I this is the adult mice that I do a castrated, I do an ocdectomy, then I implant the fresh tissue, uh, frozen uh, tall tissue from slow freezing as well as vitrification uh, at the scrotum area and the result is still ongoing. So we yet to harvest this result and we escalate this into the uh, cyclist monkey uh, in Osaka that whereby we take this uh, pre-pubertal uh, monkey I think age about eight years old and still not don't have any uh, spermatogenesis. Very big testes, very big. So we need to cut it out and we try to propose for our own um, formulated media using the same slow freezing, vitrification, and fresh technique. And we now uh, in the process of uh, in 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 still in process of frozen of the tissue and we plan to transplant the tissue later, uh, maybe in one year time. So it's still ongoing. So hopefully uh, with this uh, Japanese. Team uh, can actually uh, 
share some experience that we have in our own local data in how actually the um the uh, fertility preservation in people uh, is actually uh, what is the outcome that we can actually achieve so as a conclusion um we only have three techniques so far the ssct vesicular tissue uh, cry preservation and in vitro spermatogenesis so which one is the best now at this moment i think the testicular tissue uh, cry preservation is still uh, a good um, uh, method that need to be developed in order to improve and implement in our pre-pubertal boys. So the current challenge in this field is we need to have standardization of protocol for the collection and preservation of testicular tissue among pre-pubertal and we as a team need to optimize the protocol uh, for management and transportation of tissue as well as to develop the protocol for the quality ratio before and after store and to actually lead uh, this to assessment of minimal risk for disease to reduce the anxiety as well as our anxiety also when we transplant back and follow up the patient day after. And as us want to emerge in this field of fertility preservation in pre-pubertal boy, we need to be a clinician scientist in which we need to develop a lot of research uh, to develop a good protocol for cell sorting in SCC optimize the SEC protocol, obtain the proof of concept uh, using human. Um, now we have all in, 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 in mice and also primate, then we need to do in human. This is the time now because we already have all the proof of concept in, in murine model and develop our own IVM for uh, human SSC. We have IVM in oocyte, but we not yet have IVM in sperm. And we need to evaluate with geneticists regarding the genetic and epigenetic stability for us to uh, move forward and assess the fertility uh, fertilization capacity of the sperm that we preserve from prepubertal. So as the conclusion, fertility preservation is increasing for the boys and the technique is already been proof of concept uh, in all the, the animal, but still uh, in infancy at the human stage. Uh, until the successful clinical trial demonstrated the safety and efficacy, the fertility preservation among boys uh, still remain uh, experimental and we as a scientist clinician need to do more research to consolidate the evidence for us to share in future. With that, thank you very much for listening. I'll request my co-chair, uh, Dr. Feroza Patel, to open the discussion. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, and Dr. Feroza will open the discussion, and then I'll join in later. Dr. Ahmed, first of all, my hearty congratulations for all the fantastic work you are doing. I have two questions to ask you. For these young men or boys, where we are considering fertility preservation, how will you select and tell the parents that, okay, these are the genetic markers that we will do for this boy. And if these genetic markers are normal, then we will go on to fertility preservation. How will you select these boys? Because we know that men with particularly testicular cancer and other forms of cancer can have diminishing fertility potential with their sperm. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Firuza. So basically, in, in our country, in my experience, we are at the infancy, I, I told you, we are at the stage of we will offer all this, the pre pubertal boy for testicular tissue for preservation, regardless whether they have this kind of condition or not. Because at this moment, we are at the stage of developing the protocol to ensure that we can actually store the tissue accurately. After that, we will we already have some discussion with our geneticists to enhance the, the evaluation of the tissue later before we transplant. So that one, I for sure that we will do some work of protocol to enhance the assessment of genetic, uh, whether they have some inherited genes or not later in future before we transplant. So for now, not yet. I didn't do anything yet for now. <laughs> no, it's, it's a very important marker because we give, give hope to these patients to their parents. Yeah. But in the long run, and you're doing fantastic work, there is no doubt about it. In the long run, what will we tell these uh, parents? What will we tell the boys? As a follow-up to this, my question to you is I've never understood that why is it that young boys with testicular cancer particularly have very poor sperm parameters? Can you shed some light on this? Okay. Um, I received... Uh... 
at now when I started my onco fertility uh, services, I received more more than thirty patients who actually prepubertal that have testicular cancer. 80% of them, as also reported in literature, have azospermia because the, the pathology itself impair the maturation of the germ cell. Therefore, they affect the spermatogenesis uh, in the other side, which is normal. Although I try to do onco tese for the normal side, I cannot find any sperm. This is uh, proven in literature. They, they, they already highlighted that the spermatogenesis is impact uh, genetically in the patient with testicular cancer. Therefore, before I start to offer onco tese for this kind of patient, I will tell the mom that I might need to have any sperm that retrieve from this procedure because it's already known that the spermatogenesis is impaired due to the genetic itself. So it's may, may, maybe due to the genetic or maybe to the process of the disease that is accelerated and arrested on the mitosis process in spermatogenesis. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad. Fantastic talk. We've learned so much from you. Thank you. Dr. Thank you. Ahmad, I'm Professor Sanjeev Reddy. How young you can uh, take the testicular tissue for cryopreservation? Uh, uh, I beg your pardon? Young. How young? Age. Age of the oh, patient. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. Usually, uh, because I started this uh, in, in, in our country, is based on research. So we started uh, at least 10 years and above, 9 to 10 years and above. Because below that, um, our pediatric, uh, pediatric surgeon uh, don't really recommend that because they also have some difficulty in handling the tissue. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Samir, you can continue. Thank you very much for the offer. So hope to see you again. Thank you for taking this time. Okay. I think we will close the session then. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very informative session. And I also thank all our esteemed chairpersons for making the session more interactive. So moving to the next session, it is my pleasure to invite the chairpersons um, uh, Professor Vatsla Dadwal, ma'am, is Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, with special interest in high risk obstetrics and fetal medicine. Dr. Nandita Pal Shetkar, ma'am, is Medical Director, Bloom IVF Center and eight IVF centers across India. She has 30 years of experience. Then, Dr. Renu Tanwar, Professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Maulana Azad Medical College, New Delhi, with special interest in infertility and assisted conception. I also invite Dr. Bindu Bajaj, ma'am. She's professor, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at VMMC and Sabdashang Hospital, New Delhi. So may I request, ma'am, Professor Vatsala, to invite the first speaker for this session? So good afternoon, everyone. Moving on to the next session about fertility and obstetric risk in uh, young cancer survivors. The first talk uh, or a recorded talk is from uh, Dr. Vitale. So can I have his CV, please? Yes, ma'am, just a minute. Thank you. So Dr. Vitale Kushner, he's currently clinical associate professor in OBGYN at University of California, Avon, and he has his fellowship in reproductive endocrinology and infertility. So we'll have a recorded lecture from him. Speaking about the challenges during pregnancy for young cancer survivors. Um, just a brief background in itself. I'm a medical director at this facility center.
technical issues in playing the pre-recorded video. So may I uh, request my co-chairperson to introduce the next speaker, Dr. Bindu. Hello. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Padma Re Rekha Jirje. She'll be speaking on fertility and obstetrics risk in young cancer survivors. May I have a CV, please? I will just be sharing the slide. Oh, just a minute. Um, and there's some technical issues. So uh, we apologize for the delay. There was some technical difficulty. So now we'll be resuming. So may I request ma'am, Dr. Bindu, to introduce the next speaker. Dr. Padma, she has completed her clinical research fellowship in IVF from Glasgow University. And uh, she's practicing right now in Kolhapur as fertility specialist since 1998. Uh, she's an editor-in-chief of Journal of Human Reproductive Sciences. She is a member managing committee, PCS Society of India, and she has lot many. She is a national corresponding editor for Journal of Ops and Gynae of India. Welcome, Dr. Padma. Kindly speak on your topic: fertility and obstetrics risks in young cancer survivors. Thank you. Ma'am, Dr. Padma, kindly unmute I yourself. Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. now you're yeah. audible, ma'am. Yes. Yeah. Um, I'm very grateful uh, for the kind invitation uh, to Dr. Anita Singh and, um, and for organizing this excellent academic uh, event. Thanks to the chairpersons for uh, your kind introduction. And um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to address fertility and uh, obstetric risks in young cancer uh, survivors. If we look at the uh, currently available uh, evidence, we do know that majority of uh, adolescent and young adult men and women cancer survivors have fertility concerns. And this does have a direct influence on their quality of life. Fertility preservation is considered as a key survivorship issue for these uh, young men and uh, women. So what I would like to do is address the fertility risks in women and uh, men who are young cancer survivors and also address the obstetric uh, uh, risks in these uh, uh, young people. And we need to bear these issues right from the beginning, from the time of diagnosis of uh, malignancy through the treatment uh, period, following a cancer-free period, and also during pregnancy. So these are the important uh, uh, times where we need to address uh, variedly the issues pertinent to that stage of uh, uh, their uh, management. So we have seen through the day, there are various fertility preservation options available for both men and women, pre-pubertal and uh, post-pubertal. And what they um, aim to achieve is basically increase the fertility window. If, they, if the gonads are irreparably damaged and irreversibly damaged, um, through various uh, steps uh, of these, we can increase the fertility window for these people to or shift it to a more suitable uh, period of their lifetime. Now, do, do we really need to introduce this aspect and... Uh, pay a lot of attention to this aspect while they're going through another journey of uh, treatment for malignancies and uh, recovery from that. The, uh, there is obviously an increasing uh, evidence to say, show the importance of this. And the Scottish Registry, um, uh, looking at the data from 1984 to 2014, has compiled a huge amount of uh, um, informative uh, evidence. If you look at the pie chart uh, here, 
what it is showing is compared to people who have never had malignancy, um, there is a pregnancy deficit because of malignancies itself in these young cancer survivors. And if you see this pie chart, we can see that just carcinoma of the cervix contributes to about 26% of the uh, deficit and again, maybe around 23% by breast cancer. So just between these two malignancies, there is nearly 50% deficit um, in the pregnancies that could have happened in the um, reproductive age group. Further, they do show that at an individual uh, level, if when we counsel these uh, young people as to the importance of fertility preservation, we do know that there is about 43% uh, reduction in the post-treatment um, uh, chances of uh, pregnancy. And this, we have to uh, address that it is both a genuine impact of the treatment for, on fertility and also you know, consequent uh, fear factor or other factors which may influence the decision to avoid uh, pregnancy. So how do we uh, address these uh, issues? So if we start looking at the fertility and obstetric uh, concerns, so first addressing the fertility issues, the so various modalities of uh, uh, cancer treatment, be it radiation, surgery, targeted therapy, or chemotherapy can lead to future infertility because of uh, disruption of the hypothalamus pituitary axis and consequent hypogonadism. And in addition to this, the obstetric issues arise again because of all these modalities of treatment because of their impact on the uterus, whether it is uh, radiation uh, related or surgery related, particularly in carcinoma of the, of the cervix um, with the radical uh, trachelectomy. Um, both of these can, uh, can lead to preterm birth. But one of the aspects we don't normally understand or address is the systemic impact of radiotherapy and chemotherapy or targeted therapy on heart and lungs um, affecting uh, maternal cardiopulmonary uh, status. This is something we uh, very often do not uh, uh, understand or uh, acknowledge. So we need to look at two aspects. One is the post-cancer loss of fertility uh, in women due to decline in ovarian reserve um, because of impaired uterine uh, function and also disruption of the hypothalamus pituitary axis because of various modalities of uh, treatment. And also much wider and more, uh, you know, uh, more worrying is the impact on uh, maternal health, particularly cardiopulmonary. So various drugs can cause arrhythmias, congestive cardiac uh, failure and cardiomyopathy, hypertension, myocardial ischemia, pulmonary fibrosis, and valvular uh, heart disease. So these are the aspects we also need to pay attention to while we are um, talking about fertility and obstetric risks in young cancer survivors. So when we have to uh, evaluate somebody who has had previous uh, radiotherapy, first and foremost, we need to see is whether uh, the issue of fertility preservation has been addressed before any primary therapy and whether any uh, cryopreservation of gametes or tissue has been done. So, um, and also evaluate the current ovarian function. If it is good, then we initiate steps towards uh, uh, achieving uh, pregnancy. If there is ovarian failure, then we have to consider alternative modalities of treatment. If um, ovarian tissue or oocytes have been cryopreserved, again, you know, they can, uh, we can initiate the algorithm for uh, going through uh, treatment to achieve uh, pregnancy. Um, so one of the things we need to do is evaluate the uterine condition, particularly for uh, endometrial thickness, which can be very often affected with previous uh, radiation and also MRI, which is not something we often think of routinely, um, but that is something very important to look at the myometrial uh, fibrosis. Having done these, then if they've received any total body radiation or partial pelvic uh, radiation, then uh, we can uh, counsel them and then appropriately initiate uh, HRT. And very important is to consider long-term pentoxifilin and vitamin E uh, regime to improve the uterine health and then go ahead with the uh, pregnancy and monitor the pregnancy very carefully. However, if any of these, at, along any step of this algorithm, if there is concern about the ability of the uterus to 
um, uh, achieve successful implantation and uh, pregnancy. They or if they have received whole body uh, irradiation, then we will have to uh, discourage pregnancy and consider surrogacy. Of course, uh, if there is uh, if the uterine health is uh, is uh, considered to be okay and they have achieved uh, pr uh, premature ovarian failure, but there is no available uh, cryopreserved uh, tissue or uh, gametes, then another option would be to consider egg donation for these uh, young women. What about uh, chemotherapy? So again, uh, there are concerns about chemotherapy because of the potential gonadotoxic uh, regime. So uh, most of the people uh, who would require future surveillance are the ones who have received alkylating agents, maybe cyclophosphamide or a combination of chemotherapy and uh, radiotherapy uh, where ovaries are partly exposed. Uh, traditional, conventional uh, way of monitoring ovarian function um, for an toxic impact is through monitoring uh, FSH levels and uh, estradiol uh, levels. I think Professor Anderson's talk also showed how much of importance is uh, given to uh, this endocrine uh, monitoring. But increasingly, even though AMH is not uh, declared or considered as the uh, hormone to evaluate for uh, assessing ovarian reserve, increasingly there is accumulating data to show that it plays an important role in evaluating the ovarian um, existing ovarian reserve in these uh, young cancer survivors. What is most important is if they approach us for the first time, who are the ones who need to be um, evaluated uh, post therapy? They are uh, these are the ones. I mean, those who do not have uh, any signs of puberty by the age of thirteen years, those who have primary amenorrhea uh, at sixteen years of age or beyond that or uh, where there is, they've achieved puberty, but then there is amenorrhea, where there's failure of pubertal uh, progression. Uh, so these are the um, subsets of women who need to be evaluated uh, for their uh, residual ovarian uh, function. And then, you know, the, if they approach us, uh, not during this stage, but uh, directly for uh, concerns regarding pregnancy later in their life, of course, you know, they need to be evaluated as well. So if you look at um, how do we um, uh, proceed following evaluation of the ovarian uh, reserve in those who have received uh, chemotherapy, similar to radiotherapy, it is very important that we establish whether they have existing ovarian function and whether it can be utilized to achieve pregnancy or if they have preserved their uh, gametes or ovarian tissue. And at the same time, they need to parallelly go through assessment for their uh, general uh, health for cardiac function, if they've received uh, anthracyclines or uh, molecular agent exposure, if they've had chest radiation, um, for hypertension, particularly those who have undergone treatment for uh, Wilms tumor, uh, treated with abdominal uh, irradiation, for gestational uh, uh, diabetes and also preconceptional diabetes, if they've had abdominal uh, irradiation, um, and also uh, those who have had uh, cranial irradiation, we have to be concerned uh, about possibility of spontaneous pregnancy loss and, uh, uh, and those who have received abdominal pelvic uh, irradiation with increased risk of uh, miscarriage and uh, premature delivery, low birth weight infants. So all this highlight to a very methodical and multidisciplinary uh, approach for achieving successful pregnancy outcome. Now, this, this slide refers to the same data I showed the Scott, from the Scottish Registry earlier. Um, uh, uh, it shows about, a, they have not looked at the nature of treatment if anybody has received uh, uh, during the observation uh, period or the follow-up uh, uh, period, but they've looked at the data of nulliparous women achieving their first pregnancy post uh, treatment for uh, cancer. And uh, uh, particularly in those uh, below or up to nine, uh, 39 years of age and compared to uh, controls who have never un, uh, had any malignancies or any therapy for that from the dura for the duration of 1981 to 2012. So it's a very comprehensive uh, data. So looking at uh, uh, cancer affected women further uh, achieving uh, pregnancy 2071 and uh, those who never had malignancies, it's about 117,000. Uh, uh, so if you look at the Miscarriage data, the percentage of miscarriage is very similar 
in both these groups very heartening and termination for pregnancy termination of pregnancy for any uh, fetal abnormalities what is very interesting is there is a um, there is definitely no increased risk in uh, those who had malignancies previously in fact there is a uh, significant de decline in the um, uh, term risk of uh, termination for uh, any abnormalities stillbirth live birth um, an infant death or death all appear to be very similar. So it is extremely important. Uh, this study highlights that because they seem to have the uh, similar uh, obstetric outcome compared to their uh, um, uh, controls who have never had malignancies. Again, it reiterates the importance of identifying those women who would benefit uh, from fertility uh, preservation prior to primary um, gonadotoxic, uh, gonadotoxic therapy and subject them to, uh, expose them to reproductive counseling. Um, but if uh, they've already received the uh, uh, treatment, then establish the diagnosis of uh, ovarian in insufficiency as early as possible, treat it and provide them access to ART at the right juncture. Now, what about, the, what about those who have had malignancies, recovered from it, and eventually have gone through um, ART treatment. What, what is important is this study, again, connected to the national uh, uh, data uh, from the US, the data registry from uh, in the US, shows that there is no difference. Those who had residual ovarian function, there is no difference in the number of oocytes re retrieved or the proportion of the oocytes uh, which fertilized between um, those who had history of malignancy and those who did not have a history of malignancy. But those with previous malignancy required a higher total dose of FSH indicating some amount of uh, ovarian uh, decline in the ovarian uh, reserve. Among those uh, autologous cycle starts, cycle in women with uh, history of uh, malignancy were less likely to, um, <clears throat> sorry, were less likely to uh, result in an uh, ongoing intrauterine uh, pregnancy compared to those who never had any history of malignancy. And this was not uh, seen in uh, those with donor cycle. So that again indicates some amount of compromise in the ovarian uh, function. However, even in those who underwent uh, donor oocyte uh, treatment with donor oocyte, there was an increased risk of pregnancy loss. So that we need to watch for both ovarian and uterine um, health in these uh, women who undergo ART. So we need to... Um, the take home messages from all this evidence available is the survivors should be counseled that their fertility and likelihood of uh, having births after cancer are lower, but uh, most will have a residual window of ovarian function and fertility of uh, after primary cancer treatment. As data estimating the remaining fertility window is not available, survivors after cancer treatment, once it is considered uh, uh, okay to go ahead with pregnancy, should consider attempting pregnancy earlier. Um, than uh, delaying it. As far as their uh, reproductive health is uh, concerned, um, uh, those with history of receiving anthracycline or chest irradiation are at an increased risk of developing pregnancy-associated cardiomyopathy. And uh, they need to be, It's a, the absolute risk is low, but the clin clinical consequence can be very worrying. And hence, they need to be subjected to pre-pregnancy cardiac evaluation for these um, subset of women and uh, there is a higher rate of uh, preterm pre delivery and low birth weight uh, neonates uh, among the young uh, adolescent and young adult cancer survivors particularly those exposed to abdominal and pelvic uh, irradiation the increased risk can be as high as two to three fold and hence they need to be uh, watched for this uh, compli these complications limited and inconsistent data exists on the risk of uh, gestational uh, diabetes among uh, female childhood cancer survivors. Of course, in our country as such, the risk appears to be higher than uh, um, Caucasian population. So we need to watch for uh, occurrence of this problem as well. Uh, overall, rates of uh, birth defects among childhood cancer survivors are low, do not appear to be increased compared to general population. So they, as far as evaluation for uh, uh, congenital abnormalities are concerned, they should go through the same level of uh, observation and uh, monitoring as uh, those who have never had malignancies in their lifetime. 
childhood cancer survivors who underwent cns or chest radiation might experience more problems uh, with breastfeeding compared to healthy uh, controls and will need additional uh, support and additional attention to this aspect as well there's no increase in the risk of childhood cancer um, in offsprings of these cancer survivors and if you remember in the very first or second slide i did say that some of them actually avoid pregnancy because of uh, various other concerns and one of the reasons is this fear of their child developing malignancies and the current evidence doesn't support um, this uh, problem so what about male survivors if semen banking has not been done we do know that uh, micro dissection testicular sperm extraction micro tse is still an option uh, for these uh, people who wish fertility um, approximately 37% of them um, uh, may have some residual uh, sperm available once they are subjected to this micro dissection tse and uh, many of them may achieve pregnancy uh, fertilization rate of up to 57% and a pregnancy rate of about 50% has been um, achieved through this uh, process so what is very important to convey as far as uh, young men um, who are cancer survivors uh, is, is that the potential harm to sperm dna integrity from cancer therapies especially in the era of art which has allowed use of sperm that would not otherwise be capable of naturally fertilizing in oocyte has led to concerns about the health of offspring um and uh, we need to provide a particular length of cancer free uh, treatment free period before we attempt to retrieve these sperms uh, which is approximately uh, which is uh, about a year post radiotherapy or two years post uh, chemotherapy as a general uh, rule but uh, depending on the modality of treatment used it may vary um depending on the particular agent uh, used so to uh, put it in a nutshell counseling plays a very important role and is an integral part of the treatment of these uh, um young cancer survivors while they wish to preserve their fertility um promote their fertility and achieve uh, pregnancy so different specialists um uh, will be involved at different stages but should be a continuum multi uh, disciplinary involvement is very important and sensitization of the team members from various specialities is very very Uh, is need of the r at diagnosis during or following treatment when considering a pregnancy or during pregnancy they do require supports from different uh, uh, disciplines and uh, also we have to acknowledge that at any given time if the person wishes we need to be able to provide appropriate counseling majority of the evidence um, show that different standard and experimental options for fertility preservation do increase the fertility window or uh, offer fertility uh, at an appropriate stage for these young people very little evidence on future fertility and treatment option um, needed is available at present and little evidence regarding reproductive management of uh, male uh, adolescent and young adult survivors even though as we have seen recent years have uh, seen some progress in this uh, um, uh, sector as well population based studies indicate a reduced chance of pregnancy in young cancer survivors fertility preservation timely evaluation and guidance may improve fertility in this uh, population of both men and uh, women maternal health concerns remain a challenge following certain treatment modalities and pre pregnancy evaluation and management in a, in dedicated obstetric units geared up uh, to provide these uh, um, additional facilities is very essential thank you Yeah, but Marika, this is Dr. Nandita Palshekar. Very beautiful talk. It was really very all-encompassing. Are we having question answers now, or are we having that talk after the talk? Okay. So we have we one more talk. Thank you, Nandita. Uh, yes, ma'am. We have. We will try to play again the uh, the recorded PPT by Dr. Vitali Krishna. Meanwhile, we can take the yeah, questions, ma'am. What do you say? <laughs> Yeah. Oh, we can go ahead with the questions while they set up the video for the next talk. Thank right. you, thank you, Nandita, for joining. Good to see you. 
Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Neeta, for inviting me. I think I have one question for Padmarekha. Padmarekha, you said that, uh, you know, you wait for one to two years post-therapy uh, for the man. For the woman, how long do you wait if she's not frozen it's, her... It's the same. It's the same. You have uh, to wait for a year or uh, yeah. two years? Radiotherapy, oh, wow. one year and chemotherapy, two years. Because... <clears throat> and then, okay. And then another thing... Pardon? Yeah, from the initiation of therapy. Yeah. From the initiation of therapy. Okay. And from the last dose taken, anything like that? Or? I think, you know, the, 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 there doesn't appear to be a consensus or um, enough amount of evidence at present, uh, Nandita. So it would basically depend on the uh, type of chemotherapy uh, used. Used. Yeah. So it has to be a decision taken along with a medical uh, oncologist. Okay. And I also wanted to ask you one more question. If it's a breast cancer patient, yeah. you've frozen the fertility and it's uh, estrogen progesterone receptor positive. Would you advise pregnancy in that patient? That's always a question which is... Very, very true. I think this is, uh, uh, you know, uh, if we have actually um, uh, done fertility preservation in these uh, women, probably the um, uh, it is comparatively easier to handle this uh, situation. Overall evidence does show that after a uh, cancer fertility, I mean, uh, cancer free period, um, uh, they, they would be allowed to conceive naturally. Um, so similarly, any treatment, as long as it doesn't lead to supraphysiological levels of uh, estrogen. After we have followed the uh, stipulated cancer free period, um, we should be considering we this should. Yeah, because generally even now the consensus is that you can stimulate the patient with even letrozole, gonadotropins, yeah, yeah. that a uh, little bit increase in E2 doesn't really cause yeah. any deterioration of the disease. So I think yeah. uh, we can promote oocyte freezing in yes. them either prior to surgery prior to or surgery. even, prior to or or even before, post. Uh, yeah. Post-surgery, you know, before chemotherapy is a good um, time to consider these procedures. Uh, there was a very beautiful article by Anna Kobo, which actually she said that even steer, you know, freezing after therapy for these yeah, cancer patients have... is good enough. You must do it. What is yeah, your I mean, opinion on that? If you know, uh, if we see if they're, they're cancer free and they have residual ovarian uh, uh, function and still they're undecided about uh, fertility, that this is an option that should be offered to them at that time. If they have good reasonable ovarian function, and not keen to conceive at that moment. But we know that the reproductive window is short. So to make the maximum of that, we should offer them post-therapy as well. And I think even PGTM, you can offer them so that if there are any hereditary cancers, because young patients usually with cancers would have a lot of hereditary cancers and you can yeah. offer PGTM. So if they've undergone the huh, assessment beforehand. Ooh, um, yeah. But I think assessment, would you advise it in all the patients? Don't you, uh, do, do you feel it's necessary? I mean, if you have, uh, if, it, if the BRCA mutation assessment has been done, um, then offering any uh, PGTM, uh, it will be a continuum of uh, mm. such assessment. So if we know that she, she has an increase or she has these mutations, then it makes sense to, you know, take care of the offspring mm to prevent that problem happening in the that, next... Yeah, to pass it on to the next generation, you can actually prevent it. Yeah. So I think that is a very important message uh, which you can give everybody yeah. that you can actually prevent it from going from one generation to the yeah. other. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? I don't know in the chat if there are. Hello. Hello, Dr. Yes. I'm yeah. Dr. Renu Desai. Uh, yeah. Can I just ask you one question? Thank you. Your presentation was beautiful. Thank I just you. want to and thank you for bringing this into picture that cardiomyopathy, these patients are increased yeah. risk of cardiomyopathy. I have just one question to ask you. Uh, is there any cutoff for this left ventricular function to be done for, for this cardiomyopathy so that we can advise these patients that they should not consider pregnancy or that? Is there any cutoff in the literature? Often, I function. haven't come across any uh, guidelines to say that, you know, we should follow 
uh, a particular level. I think a good clinical uh, practice would be to uh, have an evaluation, pre-pregnancy evaluation by cardiologists who are aware of these uh, problems. I mean, the, the whole thing is, you know, um, it has to be a multidisciplinary approach. There has to be an understanding of these risks um, uh, because of uh, gonadotoxic uh, therapy. I mean, uh, because of chemotherapy or radiation happening on the chest, cardiopulmonary health. And uh, I, I have not come across any uh, uh, any guideline or uh, any particular uh, cutoff value. But um, I think pre-pregnancy evaluation would set the uh, tone for uh, pregnancy management. Yeah, because I, I think I the think... absolute risk, they say, is very, very low. And we haven't uh, experienced any of this uh, uh, problem. We have never seen this problem. Of course, the experience is very, very limited, I think, at individual level. Yeah, because usually we are not going for an eco. The patient is young. We think just only the ECG could yeah. be better. But when I was yeah. going through the literature, I found this line that if the left ventricular function is less than 30% before the pregnancy, oh, okay. that means yeah, yeah. these patients should be at high risk for um, cardiomyopathy when they continue with the pregnancy. Thank you so oh, much. Thank you. Thank you. Shall I? I think, yeah, I'll stop. I think Padma, we are not going to leave you because we haven't yet got the next speaker <laughs> on. <laughs> so so we'll let's leave. talk about ovarian tissue cryopreservation, Padma. Oh God. Uh, you, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, no. In young adults, I think we can just talk till the till they tell mm. us to stop. Yeah. Samita, please let us know when we uh, can. No, so we are trying to, uh, no, you know, yeah, no, but you can medical problem. So, Doctor. Tali's talk, uh, a brief talk on yeah. uh, fertility concerns and pregnancy issues in for in the cancer survivor. Sure. So, Dr. Kushner yeah. is from uh, California. So, there was a time zone uh, uh, gross disparity. So, he recorded, pre recorded, and sent it to us. So, we're going to play his uh, talk. Hello, I'm Dr. Vitaly Kushner, and uh, it's a pleasure to virtually present at this conference. Um, today, I'll be speaking about the challenges during pregnancy for young cancer survivors. Um, as a brief background on myself, I'm a medical director at West Coast Fertility Centers and associate clinical professor at the University of California, Irvine. I'm a reproductive endocrinologist, so I primarily specialize in fertility treatments, uh, and I'll uh, mention both pregnancy issue related issues after uh, fertility treatments uh, for patients who have survived cancer, as well as um, methods of fertility preservation and uh, uh, available options for these patients. Um, brief disclosure, uh, I do have uh, pending patents related to the clinical use of antimalarian hormone, and I'll briefly describe some of that uh, in my talk. Um, so I think it's important uh, to recognize just how prevalent cancer is, and, uh, and uh, here I have statistics for the United States. As you can see that uh, each year there are more than 1.6 million new cancer cases diagnosed in the U.S. and uh, close to 600,000 deaths. Um, and uh, the uh, cases can be broken down, of course, by gender and, uh, and uh, uh, type of cancer. And as you can see, the most common amongst women is breast cancer, uh, which uh, can affect uh, women of reproductive age. Uh, and uh, other cancers that are fairly common are ones uh, like leukemia and lymphoma um, that uh, are also uh, happening often in reproductive age women. Uh, and uh, likewise in men, you can see that uh, some of the cancers that are happening in men can affect them during the reproductive years. Uh, what's important to, to also note is that uh, there are uh, each year close to 16,000 new cases in, uh, in young patients under age 19 that are diagnosed. And uh, because cancer survival rates have been improving gradually, uh, and there has been an increase an increased emphasis on the quality of life, uh, we've seen uh, a shift in the way that um, uh, doctors and patients think about cancer survival and cancer treatment, and uh, especially now that we have uh, successful fertility preservation options that have been developed, and uh, many patients are now uh, 
thinking more about post-treatment parenthood options. And so uh, we have to be very cognizant to offer patients uh, accurate information about their uh, fertility options, uh, risks, and uh, uh, try to coordinate this uh, as, as best we can uh, with their oncologists and uh, uh, assure that uh, the patients receive the best possible care that's comprehensive. Uh, and of course, the uh, societies in uh, not just in the fertility field, but also in the oncology field very much recognize this. And uh, uh, ASCO uh, issued these clinical guidelines now more than a decade ago, uh, which uh, clearly state that as part of informed consent prior to therapy, oncologists should address the possibility of infertility with patients as early in treatment planning as possible. And certainly in my practice, I have seen an increase uh, in uh, newly diagnosed cancer patients coming in. Just within the past week, for example, I've seen uh, a, a young male patient with testicular cancer. I've seen a young female patient with breast cancer and uh, patients uh, with uh, early stage uh, ovarian cancer where one ovary was removed. Uh, I also recently saw a patient with uh, uh, early stage endometrial cancer. So there, there's uh, many, many of these patients out there and uh, um, I think we have to be really cognizant to make sure that we are uh, really understanding what their needs are. So as far as pregnancy after cancer, um, this is a very nice study that was published in uh, The Lancet. And uh, as you can see here, this looks at uh, siblings, uh, uh, patients who had cancer and their siblings who did not. And as you can see that uh, uh, for the sibling that was affected with cancer, generally their uh, uh, chances of um, having a subsequent pregnancy is substantially lower and chances of having a live birth is substantially lower than their uh, siblings who uh, never were diagnosed with cancer. And uh, there could be, there could be mul a multitude of reasons for that. It could be that uh, the cancer treatments are affecting their fertility. It could be that the cancer itself is affecting their fertility or whatever it, it was that predisposed them to develop cancer is affecting their fertility. Or maybe that they're just not, cho they're choosing not to have children after cancer survival. But it's important uh, data. Uh, now, as far as parenthood and cancer patients, uh, the first time um, probability of parenthood at age 35 uh, was uh, you know, substantially reduced in uh, female cancer patients uh, versus the general population. And um, uh, these early studies also documented that there's increased risk of various pregnancy complications, including low birth weight, preterm delivery, and perinatal mortality. This was one of the very first studies that had looked at this. Uh, and I'll show my, a lot more data here in a minute. Uh, now, as far as pregnancy after cancer, um, uh, it, it seems that cancer does not trigger recurrence even in the case of breast cancer. So that's uh, very important information that patients need to know. Uh, although it's true that growing follicles may be damaged by chemotherapy uh, or radiation therapy, uh, but primordial follicles are often spared and can produce healthy eggs uh, down the road in six months or, or even several years after being exposed to chemotherapy. And uh, additionally, it's very important to understand the type of uh, treatment that the patient had because certain uh, uh, chemotherapy can be damaging to the heart and the lungs and that can of course affect the patient's ability to safely carry the pregnancy. Uh, and uh, all of that added stress can uh, contribute to the complications of pregnancy. Now children born after cancer, uh, uh, it's reassuring to know that the birth defect rates in those children uh, uh, is the same as it is in the general population. And there does not seem to be any increased risk in uh, genetic disorders like Down syndrome or Turner syndrome uh, in uh, children who were conceived to cancer survivors. And uh, also there's, there has not been really any documentation of unusual cancer risk that's been identified in offspring uh, of cancer survivors with the, with the rare ex exception of uh, patients who are true genetic uh, cancer syndromes, which may be, of course, inherited to the, in their children. Um, 
and uh, here's data to uh, to show this uh, uh, for various different kinds of uh, disorders, cytogenic syndrome, single gene disorders, simple, simple malformations, uh, and um, uh, the data overall is very reassuring, is that uh, in that there does not seem to be any you know any substantially increased. Risk. Now, this is a very recent meta-analysis uh, that was published just uh, a few months ago, uh, and it looked at a very large uh, um, uh, sample size. And uh, here, there were uh, this this was primarily focused on breast cancer survivors, and there were uh, patients uh, in the in the medical literature that had uh, uh, pregnancies after breast cancer, and there were over 7,000 such patients. Uh, what uh, the study found is that breast cancer survivors were 60% likely um, uh, to have uh, a pregnancy than um, women in the general population. So again, a documented lower fertility after cancer. Uh, and they again documented the uh, pregnancy-related complications were more common in survivors uh, in that they had more uh, risk for low birth weight delivery, preterm delivery, or having a baby that was small for gestational age. Uh, but what's reassuring is that most survivors who did become pregnant have uh, healthy babies, and there, were, there also did not seem to be any adverse impact on long-term maternal survival, uh, and uh, there, was, there was not uh, any increased risk of cancer uh, um, uh, re emergence after uh, pregnancy. So that, that is very reassuring information. Yeah. Thank you very much. So, so here we close. I think it was a beautiful session. Congratulations, Dr. Nita. Wonderful, wonderful program and fantastic speakers. And there's no questions in the chat box. Last session. So we start the next, we'll close the session then take up the next session. Thank you so much. Thank you, organizers, Thank you, especially Dr. It was a wonderful session. Uh, thank you, uh, chairpersons and dignified speakers. We now move on to the last session of the day. For this, I invite our uh, chairpersons, Dr. P.M. Gopinath, Director and Senior Consultant, Institute of Obstetrics and Gynecology and IVF, SRM Institute of Medical Sciences, Chennai. Dr. Priya Kanan, Scientific Director at the Garba Rakshambigai Fertility Center, Chennai, Tamil Nadu. And Dr. Pratap Kumar, Professor and Head, Department of Reproductive Medicine and Surgery, and the Member of Task Force of Human Development and Disease Biology, Department of Biotechnology. Over to you, sir. Good evening, and um, it was indeed a, a very good academic session. And moving to the last talk, we it is a hot topic today. <laughs> There's a lot of hue and cry about the ART and surrogacy bill, particularly in terms of fertility preservation. We have been more concerned. We have given our representation, and uh, we have just informed the government about all our concerns and they have been taken care of and then they said they will just get back to us for the correction. So with that in mind, we have with us our eminent speaker, uh, uh, advocate Hitesh Bhatt. And he is practicing in Andheri, Mumbai. And he is a medical legal consultant since about 20 years at Wadia Maternity Hospital and Central Railway Hospital, Mumbai. He is also a partner in legal firm B and S Medical Legal Consultancies. He was a past chairman of the Ethical Medical Legal Committee of Foxy, and he has authored several books. A good friend of mine, and he has been associated with my center on medical legal auditing for the past, say, five years. And uh, he, he has got a very clear thinking, and he's going to explain everything. Probably all of you will have a lot of answers. Uh, questions to an, uh, ask him, please put it in the chat box and he'll be too happy to uh, share with it. Over to you, Hitesh. Uh, 
uh, apologies for the technical glitch. We are waiting for Dr. Hitesh to join. It will take a while, sir. We have uh, Dr. Pratap Kumar is there. Uh, I think I, I can see Dr. Pratap, sir, there. I, I had seen him. Pratap, uh, are you there? Yes, he's there. I'm there. Hi, how are you? Hi, hi, Pratap. How are you? Uh, all good. And uh, see, you have been, you have been, until we hear from Hitesh to uh, Hitesh, you have been with us in the, even from the formulation of this act for a long time. So, can you just give your comments on this current views until uh, Hitesh joins? Yes, sir. Dr. Hitesh has joined, sir. Uh, I think after Hitesh's talk, I'll give, yeah. Ah, good, good. good Hitesh, sir. welcome to you. Hi, Hitesh. Welcome. Hello, sir. So, uh, uh, just I will start my presentation, sir. Can you give me, uh, okay. I think I'm able to, can you give me rights to uh, share my screen? Okay. I think you already have, you can okay. do the screen. Okay. Okay. okay, okay, fine. So, uh, thank you for inviting me and allowing me to share my views on this topic. I hope my slides are visible and I'm audible, right? Yes, yes, yes. Go okay, ahead. Sir. Okay. So uh, the thing is, the on the if you see uh, the a there was no nothing, no act before the 20th December 2021 as regards the ART and surrogacy is concerned. So on 20th December, the uh, ART Act was enacted, it was gazetted. And following that, there was mention in the act that it will be enforced at a later date and it will be separately gazetted. And that happened on 25th of January. So on 25th of January, this ART Act came into force. Now, before that, we all were, and all the uh, doctors were happy like this, but since the act was enacted, they started looking like this. They started fearing it, right? Because there were punishments in it. So, but actually what happened, we had so many guidelines, we had so many bills uh, from 2010, 2014, 15, 17, 19, 20. So it was like the practice of ART was like a dark tunnel. But after this, actually we have seen some light at the end of the tunnel. And that is actually, in fact, a good thing. So ART Act 2021. Now, what is the impact of the ART Act on the fertility preservation in young cancer population? That is the topic given to me. So let us see. If you see the uh, preamble of the Act, it mentions that it is an act for the regulation and supervision of the assisted reproductive technology clinic banks, preservation of uh, prevention of misuse, safe and ethical practice. And it also says freezing of the gametes, embryos, embryonic tissue for future use due to infertility, disease or social and medical concerns. So they have included the social freezing into the preamble of the uh, ART Act. So we were thinking that the uh, social freezing or the freezing of the oocyte for fertility preservation is separate from ART, but they have now included into this uh, act. But they have not defined it anywhere. If you see the definition of ART, ART mentions that all the technique that attempts to obtain pregnancy by handling the sperm or oocyte outside the human body and transferring the gamete or the embryo into the reproductive system of a woman. That is ART procedure. Now, what about fertility preservation? Because the aim is not to transfer the gamete or embryo back into the reproductive system, at least at that point of time. ART bank they have defined, ART clinic they have defined, 
but who can give the treatment for fertility preservation that is not defined commissioning couple they have defined and also uh, they have said in the act that the ar uh, the art act did not define the fertility preservation but by general understanding uh, the definition of art preserve uh, fertility preservation we know the fertility preservation is the process of saving or protecting eggs or sperm or reproductive tissue so that a person can use them to have biological children in future now uh, that type of definition should have been there which is not there in the art act now person who can take the treatment they have said the who can take this fertility preservation or who requires fertility preservation those who are exposed to they we know all the indications right and we at present we are concerned about the treatment for the cancer but and there are options to fertility preservation we can go for gonadal shielding we can go for ovarian transposition or we can go for uh, sperm cryo preservation oocyte cryo preservation or embryo cryo preservation these are the options but uh, the if you see this uh, uh, art act section 2 uh, uh, 2021 section 21 it in the duties of the art bank and clinic it has mentioned that the clinic shall apply art services to a woman above the age of 21 years and below the age of 50 years to a man above the age of 21 years and below the age of 55 years now what should we presume does it include fertility preservation we can say that art act is not clearly separated from the fertility preservation however in the preamble they have included it so if somebody requires fertility preservation before the age of 21 what is the recourse there is a uh, defense in that case we can say that it is for the art service an art service is very well defined that the intention is to put back the gamete into the genital tract to achieve pregnancy so we can say that our aim is not that and that is why we have treated a patient who is less than 21 years of age but that is a defense there can be a case filed against you if the appropriate authority is not understanding this difference this is the argument before the court so it was very much necessary to define fertility preservation procedures and to add one line in this law that the fertility preservation procedures are the uh, all these sections will not be applied to fertility preservation that is not there we missed at that point so as we have seen the definition of fertility assisted reproductive technology it says to attempt the pregnancy by putting the gamete back into the uh, genital tract and that is not our immediate aim in fertility preservation if you see section 22 of this art act that says that the clinic shall not perform any treatment or procedure without the written informed consent of all the parties seeking art the clinic and bank shall not cry cryo preserve any human embryo or gamete without specific instruction and consent in writing from all the parties seeking assisted reproductive technology in case of death or incapacity of any parties this is what is the section now what about fertility preservation that they have not said whose consent whose consent will you take if the person is less than 18 years of age naturally guardian now if you take the consent of guardian mother is a guardian father is a guardian or both what if there is conflict between both the parents what if between uh, there is a conflict between the guardian and the person who is taking treatment can guardian refuse the fertility preservation treatment if the uh, boy of its 17 years want to preserve but the parents refuse what to do in that situation what if the child refuses and the parent agrees or vice versa so that things are not clear because they have not mentioned fertility preservation in this act if you read section 828 the gamete of a donor or embryo shall be stored for a period not more than 10 years now if fertility preservation is a part of this art act and if you want to preserve this embryo or gamete for more than 10 years what to do here also there is a catch it is mentioned gamete of the donor or embryo that means the self gamete 
can be stored for a longer time but that is again a defense it is not clearly mentioned in the law this is the inference as a lawyer which i have taken out that can be helpful as a as a argument in the court but will it prevent any litigation against you i am not sure because most of we have seen in pcp entity most of the appropriate authorities are inappropriate authorities they don't understand the concerns and they are selling the machines left right and center without understanding the purpose behind it and supreme court even supreme court has so many times and many high courts have noted that these cases are registered against the doctors without giving uh, due uh, thinking on the offenses now after sperm preservation if the person dies then if he or she is not married what to do with the gamete because fertility if fertility preservation is a part of art this point should be addressed by the art act what to do with that sample can he or her parent ask for it and they can use it in art to have their grandchildren because the right to reproduction is not a fundamental right nowhere it is mentioned if at all it is a fundamental right it is limited to the couple to have their own children and certainly not to have the grandchildren even if it is a fundamental right it doesn't extend to have a grandchildren right so usually we can say that after the sperm or oocyte donor preservation if the person dies if he is married then can the sperm or oocyte be retrieved posthumously if they are married and to be used uh, by surviving partner section 24 says that the collection of the gametes posthumously can be done only if prior consent of the commissioning couple is available in such manner as may be prescribed so that is now allowed but what about unmarried person taking the treatment for some disease this suggests that the intent of the law maker law maker is very clear that if the person is single and if he or she dies his or her right to reproduction will die and that is what happens all the rights of a person dies with his death so his right will die and that is why they have not put it in in the art very clearly that it can be used so if the semen or oocyte sample is frozen and if the person dies now it is clear that the uh, the uh, kin next of the kin or parents can take it if the person is not married they can take it but they can keep it only as a souvenir they cannot use it for any purpose not for having the children the uh, people so uh, that is it they cannot even donate it the chat right? box they, they cannot give it for donation as well if because so, the, uh, the, the it is said that the next of the kin can donate the organs of the so dead much. person thank you organizing special dr nita but they can't do the gametes of a person because there is a succession act attached if the gametes are given for donation the child is born the child will inherit all the rights of the of property and all so that is why it is i think they have kept it separate and you cannot because by giving the uh, genetic material in donation you are producing a new child while giving the organs for donation you are not creating any new person that person is already having his own, own rights so uh, that may be the intent but it is not very clear from the art act so what is the impact of the art act 2021 on the fertility preservation in young cancer population we initially thought that art act shall address the issue but it did not accept in the objectives now we still have to wait and wait for what wait for the art rules if this issue is addressed in the rules well and good and uh, we will see because there are many representation and i hope some good body uh, like foxy or uh, isar or whosoever they might have represented this issue as well and they will get some idea or some rules in the uh, art rules which have yet to come if not then we are back to square one i think we are not back to square one because previously we were only confused right before 2021 now they have added this into objective nothing put in the law but there is a punishment put in the law for doing any wrong thing so now we are having the sword hanging on our head by doing fertility preservation and attracting the 
punishment under the art act so we are not into back back, uh, back into square one we are into a worse position so with that i think i uh, stop my presentation thank you very much for patient hearing and these were the concerns with new law yeah hi uh, hitesh i would like to tell yesterday when we met uh, the deputy director of health services so yes. they have said that uh, because the fertility preservation has not been addressed in the act that is going to come in the rules and so whatever is meant for art will not apply for fertility preservation that is what that should have been in the main act and yes, definition but, also should be there in the act yes, but they have not put because but they have listened to us and they have said that it's going to be put in the rules that fertility preservation is an it, exception to this exactly so if that happens it is well and good madam and that is what was required no, no, when i said they have yeah. written all the points whatever were told by us ha ah, so that that i had given in writing to even uh, uh, this prakash trivedi sir on the first day when this act was enacted and yeah, i said yeah, we have to represent uh, this no dr nalini and myself represented fpsi okay. so through fpsi we have already given them and they have told us that they have incorporated what all we have told them okay perfect it they sure you know they are they are very you know keen on listening to us and asking us for our help so if you give the written stuff to prakash foxy is actually collating it together i think dr shanta kumari is collating it together so that we can give one set of uh, instructions to everybody right so i think it will work you know the fertility preservation society uh, and uh, you know all of us is i have fertilization program and is all together we we'll do all the things hmm. yeah right thank you very much uh, hitesh for the nice talk and uh, i think madhuri patil clarified the point that uh, we still have to wait for the rules and regulations to come out because it is not mentioned in the act but i think it makes sense because many of the young prebutal prebutal girls and boys are needing that cryo preservation so at the moment we can cryo preserve i suppose but not use them later because if the survival is very high in our days so i think when they when the rules come up we will be able to follow the instructions later but at the moment we can cryo preserve because it's for cancer management yeah the first set of rules they will release on end of this month Okay. that's what they said uh, yeah and therefore the input has to be given by tuesday that's what they have said so i think whoever has any input can either pass it on to foxy or is isar or ifs either of the three bodies and it would be coallocated together and then uh, given to them thank you sir you made this very interesting so thank all the um, speakers and the chair persons for the session so by this we come to the so by this we come to the end of this excellent cme i would like to thank all the distinguished speakers and chair persons who blessed us with the knowledge uh, i extend our deepest sense of gratitude to professor neeta singh ma'am what's not enough to thank your constant guidance and support to shape this cme this will be incomplete without mention of all the faculty the residents and entire staff of the art division who always stand by us and motivate us uh, my sincere thanks to the entire audio visual team and we are thankful to one and all who joined us both virtually and physically to make this a success thank you thank you everyone thank, thank you neeta for inviting us and all the best to everybody yeah thank uh, thank you all the chairpersons and speakers who joined us online and offline without which this uh, academic feast was not possible thank you very much for your cooperation thank uh, you neeta Dr. thank you for, uh, thank you for organizing it for on behalf of fpsi and it was a great event with both national and international faculty and i really appreciate and then congratulate you thank you sir thank you so much i especially want to thank madhuri ma'am and you and and, and nalini ma'am to uh, having uh, you know trust in my abilities and guiding me through this cme thank you very much so uh, we would be winding up so we would be switching off the audio visual thank you once again everyone I I would be requesting all those who are present uh, in the auditorium ne 
kindly stay on for 5 minutes more so one of our uh, so lovely pretty charming faculty dr nilanchali it is her birthday today